Thank you for coming to Then Radio. Please like, subscribe, or click the link below to join our Patreon. Thanks again. The hair-raising adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, Effie. Oh, Sam, I've been worried about you. Sid Weiss was just on the phone, and he says digging up a corpse without a permit is against the law. It's all right, Effie. I just dug him up to say hello and put him back again. Oh, Sam. I'll be down in a couple of minutes to dictate my report, sweetheart. If I get lost on the way, you'll find me in City Hospital, the psycho ward, third straight jacket from the left. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented each week by Wild Root Cream Oil, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that will put your hair back in place again, grooming it neatly, naturally, the way you want it. Fellows... If a girl can spend half an hour under a hot dryer in a beauty parlor to look her best for you, certainly you can spend half a minute sprucing up with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic to look your best for her. That's all it takes, and Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way girls like to see it. Besides, it relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil. It contains lanolin. So get the big economy-sized bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And now, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Date, August 2nd, 1946. To Mrs. Gregory Denov. Subject... Death of Dr. Denov. I was sitting in my office with nothing to think about except a horse named Corkscrew Jr. My secretary, Effie Perrine, came in and said there was someone outside. I didn't look up from the dope sheet, so she said it again. Someone outside, Sam. What's he look like? Um, blue double-breasted custom-made suit, Countess Mara tie, hand-tailored shirt, English shoes, hand-trimmed Van Dyke. Get me a blank check and send him in. Okay, Sam. Please come in. Mr. Spade will see you now, sir. Thank you. You are Mr. Spade, Sam Spade. What can I do for you? I'm Dr. Gregory Denov, a psychoanalyst. I I need your help. Lie down, doctor, and tell me all about it. <laughs> I, I see you might also be noted for your sense of humor as well as your discretion. Who told you I was discreet? A man named Nicolaitis. Well, you tell Nicolaitis, I think he's cute, too. What else does he say about me? That I can trust you with $10,000. Oh. Is this Mr. Nicolaitis one of your patients? No. No, he isn't. As a matter of fact, he... He's gotten possession of some private records of mine. Well, it, it's rather involved. Nicolaitis is shaking you down, and he picked me as the middleman. Is that it? This is not an ordinary case of blackmail. Blackmail is blackmail, even if you do it in technicolor. Well, as you may know, a psychoanalyst keeps a faithful transcript, a detailed record of everything a patient says during consultation, no matter how intimate or shocking... Yeah. This man, Nicolaitis, has managed to gain possession of a copy of one of these case histories. The patient is a very celebrated person, and should this material be divulged, it may have very serious consequences for both my patient and and for me. Doctor, your best bet's the San Francisco Police Department. No, no, that's out of the question. Then I'm afraid I can't help you. Why not? Nicolaitis said I'm that a you... private detective. When I take on a client, I take on his troubles. My job is to protect him, not to stand by and see him milked. You want to hire me on that basis, I'll listen. Oh, I'm, I'm so tired. I must trust somebody. It, what can you do for me, Mr. Spade? Write me out a check for $1,000. Got a pen? Yeah. All right. You see, Nicolaitis figures that if I'm getting a cut, I'll have to keep my mouth shut. I'll spend it all the same. Here you are. Thanks. Now, uh, what was the last thing Nicolaitis told you? That he would pick up the $10,000 here and deliver to you this file in question. Can you reach him? Yes. Call him. Tell him you've seen me. Tell him I won't do that kind of business in my office. 
Tell him to come to your house. I'll be there. What if he refuses? He won't. Tell him I have the whole 10000 What time? How about in an hour? No, no, I'm sorry. We'll have to make it around three or... Oh, goodness, I'm late now. I, I really... That's a beautiful watch, Mr. Denno. Yes. For him? Uh, yes. May I see it? My watch? Why, really, Mr. Spade, I'm very late. I have so many things to do, and I have to be at the Majestic Theater well before the matinee starts at 2.30. Oh, you're going to see me at 3 o'clock if you're going to the theater. Oh, I'm not going to stay for the performance. Well, Mr. Spade, till 3 o'clock then. Oh, my office is in my apartment. The address is here on my card. It's the penthouse. Penthouse, huh? Okay, doctor, I'll come formal. I'll wear the top to my bathing suit. I left my office around 2.30 and started walking up Knob Hill. The Versailles Apartments, where Denov's place was, took up the whole 300 block, so I didn't have any trouble finding it. I stopped across the street for a minute to get my breath after the uphill climb, mopped my face, and started across. Just as I got to the middle of the street... was packed in so close around I couldn't see who'd done the Brody, but I had a pretty good idea. The cops had the sidewalk roped off and guards posted at the building entrance. It took me maybe 20 minutes to elbow my way through and show my credentials. Sergeant Levine had the front door, so they let me in. Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide met me at the door of the penthouse. Hiya, Sam. What do you want? I want to see Dr. Denov. The doctor's dead. Dead? Yeah. He's my client. They can't do this to me. How? Did a Brody out the window? What do you have for? To see his wife. Okay with you? Why not? She's inside. Thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Danoff, please. With all due respect for your grief, I must have the keys to the cabinet where Gregory kept his confidential files. You realize that he wished me to take charge of his patients and that I am responsible. All this police and so on. We must get those files out of here as soon as possible. <clears throat> yes? My name is Spade. I am Dr. Zoya. I was poor Dr. Denov's oldest friend. If there's anything I'd like to I... see you, Mrs. Denov, alone. But you police have already asked her so many questions. You see, she's not in the... I'm not with the police. I'm a private detective. I was working for Dr. Denov. A private detective. He was in trouble, you see. You see, Dr. Sawyer, the police won't believe me. Mm. Mr. Spade, you'll tell them. You'll tell them he didn't commit suicide. Well, Mrs. Denov, I guess that takes care of everything here. It's clearly suicide. Oh, idiot, blind, stupid idiot. Suicide. Mm. My husband, oh. he treated suicides. He would never... No, please, it will be all right, my dear. I'm sorry. She's hysterical. Yeah. If I had the time, I would... Tell them, tell them. Please, Mrs. Dano. The undertaker has been arranged for a burial at 7 o'clock, Beth Israel Cemetery. Now, please, the key to Gregory's files. Here, take it and go. Go ahead, all of you. Okay, we'll, we'll call you later. Oh, I'm so sorry, gentlemen. This hysteria is simply traumatic condition. If I only had the time. Who oh, can I turn to? Who will help me? You think it's pleasant? You think my husband would rest if they said I committed suicide? What shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? Oh, oh you... Dr. Zoya didn't have the time, neither have I. You think it's murder? Who do you think killed your husband? To name someone. That's a very serious charge, Mr. Spade. Goodbye, Mrs. Denov. Constance Brent. You mean Constance Brent, the actress? Yes. Yes, she was his last patient this morning. She had threatened to kill him before. How do you know? My husband said so. To you? Well, he, he'd written it down on his notes on her case. Once before, she'd almost pushed him from that same window. How about your husband and Miss Brent? Oh, I knew she was falling in love with my husband. That always happens. They, they call it a transference. But in this case... Your husband told me Miss Brent was acting in a play this afternoon over at the Majestic. Yes, Midsummer Night's Dream. But she was here. I know she was here. Miss Ray, the receptionist, was coming back from lunch when she heard voices arguing inside. And she was sure it was Miss Brent's voice. Show me the doctor's case history on Miss Brent. I can't. It's missing. As soon as it happened, I went to the files. I meant to show it to the police. Who could have taken it? Constance Brent was the last one in that room before he died. Yeah. When did you see Nicolaitis last? 
Nick who? Skip it. Uh, where can I reach you in case... For the next couple of hours, I'll be at the Majestic Theater. I want to see how good an actress this Constance Brent is. Constance Brent's dressing room? What do you want? I want to talk to Miss Brent. Well, you can talk to me. I'm her husband. So you're Mr. Brent. I'm Jonathan Wallace. She's Mrs. Wallace. Now, what do you want with my wife? I've come to tell her that Dr. Denhoff is dead. D- uh, are you sure? You try falling from a 12th floor window sometime. Well, that's the best news I've heard this year. I'm afraid it would be a shock for Constance. Maybe, maybe not. She was the last person to see him alive, as far as anybody can make out. Uh, are you from the police? No, uh, I'm from the insurance company. Claims investigator. What do you want to see Constance for? The policy wasn't made out to her, was it? No, made out to his widow. But she can't collect. Police say it was suicide. Oh, that settles it. This is the last time I play Titania. Stand around while Puck talks his head off. Who is this person? Darling, I'm afraid this is going to be a shock. This man is from an insurance company. Dr. Denov is dead. Oh, what a pity. What happened? The police say he jumped. His wife says he was pushed. She also says that you, Miss Brent, might have been the pusher. Oh, now, really, it's too absurd. How like a wife. What time did your play start this afternoon, Miss Brent? Matinee at 2.30, always. Always. And the late lamented Dr. Denov jumped at 3 o'clock. I didn't say he did. Doesn't this news uh, shock you? But of course. Do you think good psychoanalysts are easy to find? Looks like your next doctor will have to start from scratch. Your case history seems to be missing from Dr. Denhoff's files. Missing? No. What is it? Has a man named Nicolaitis been in touch with you? I've never heard of him. Chances are you will. Does he have Dr. Denhoff's notes on my case? Could be. (gasps) This is frightful. Hot reading, huh? You seem to know this person, Nicolaitis. Get that file for me and I'll pay you well for it. Just a minute, my lovely Titania. We... We don't know who this man really is. He might even be Nicolaitis himself. Let me see your company credentials. Now, what do you know? Somebody picked my pocket. My wallet's gone. I thought so. All right, you tell me who you are. I'll call the police. Oh, no, no, Jonathan. No police. Let's get off the merry-go-round. My name is Spade. You'll find me in the phone book under S. My office is open until 6 o'clock. And if a man answers, don't hang up. It'll be me. You found a Nicolaitis yet? Not one. I even tried spelling it backwards. <sighs> Nobody ever heard of a man named Nicolaitis. I'm beginning to think there ain't no such person. Pardon me. Uh, do I hear my name mentioned? I'm Nicolaitis. Sam, I still think you're right. Come all the way in, Mr. Nicolaitis. Sit down. Uh, thank you. If you need me, Sam, just scream. What can I do for you? Oh, I've come for my money. What money? The $10,000. Do you remember the $10,000? Refresh my memory. Oh, Dr. Denhoff, the gentleman who visited you this morning. Oh, uh, that $10,000. Oh, you see, you see, you remember now. Yeah, yeah, it all comes back to me now. Uh, you were supposed to deliver something for the money. I think Dr. Denhoff is dead. That is no longer important. You will give me the money, please, and I will not disturb your afternoon any further. Suppose I refused. Oh, that would grieve me. In my grief, there's no telling what I might do. Dr. Denhoff's dead. There's nothing more you can do to hurt him. Oh, never would I attempt to hurt poor Dr. Denhoff. But in my sorrow, it would be so great if I should be forced to hurt the woman he lost. After all, as Titania says, these are the forgeries of jealousy. Sonia, huh? Ah, yes, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Act One, Scene 18. <laughs> I'm a little rusty on my Shakespeare. Oh, you are indeed, Mr. Spade. Titania doesn't appear until well into Act Two. She doesn't, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. I guess she isn't on for 40 minutes or so. Yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, but I didn't come here to discuss drama. 
What else have you got to discuss? When Dr. Dunhoff died, your market died with him. That is a very unprogressive view, Mr. Spade. There's always a gentleman named Jonathan Wallace. Why, you fiend. You don't mean you'd sell to both of us. Mr. Spade, how can you have such a low opinion of me? I will prove my integrity. I will give you the material. You give me the money. Hand it over. In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. He who goes too close to the bear soon loses his beard. I have left my beard at home. Okay, I'll meet you anywhere you say, anytime you say. Excellent. At seven in your apartment. Hmm? Won't that be walking into the bear's cave? In the Levant, Mr. Spade, we have a saying. Private dicks do not kill people in their own apartment. It was then 6 p.m., I called Effie for messages. She told me that you had been phoning frantically, Mrs. Denov. I still had maybe 30 minutes before Nicolaitis was due at my apartment, so I breezed on up to your place on the hill. We had a very interesting chat, uh, remember, Mrs. Denov? Looking back on it, that was probably the most interesting conversation we had. Funny, I can't remember much of anything you said, but it was so uh, cozy there in your place. And what with your clock being about 20 minutes slow, it must have been something like half past seven before I left you. I grabbed a cab and told the hacky to step on it. I hoped Nicolaitis was still waiting at my apartment. He was. <laughs> Mr. Nicolaitis, I'm sorry to be late. was lying on my bathroom floor. The little guy was looking just about as natty as when he'd been in my office, except that the beautiful silk scarf he'd been wearing was twisted into a tight noose around his neck. Mr. Nicolaitis was a very dead blackmailer. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the fourth in a new series of programs bringing to the air for the first time the adventures of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Men, at the racetrack, the man who has something better than a mere hunch is said to have it straight from the horse. Of course, that's a humorous expression. But it shows how to get facts, go straight to the real source of information. And that's why we went straight to hundreds of men in metropolitan New York to find out what men really want in a hair tonic. And their answers show that Wild Root Cream Oil has all five advantages chosen by this impartial consumer jury of men. One, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, never leaves it sticky or greasy. Two, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness. Three, it removes loose dandruff. Four, it's non-alcoholic. And five, it contains soothing lanolin. Remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all five of these important advantages. Is it any wonder that four out of five users in a nationwide test preferred Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics they'd tried? So next time you visit your barber, ask for Wild Root Cream Oil and get the big economy-sized bottle of Wild Root Cream Oil at your drug or toilet goods counter. Now, back to Sam and Psyche. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. His eyes were open, and he seemed to be looking right at me as I bent over him. The finger marks in his throat were too blotchy to be of any use. Pretty soon, Lieutenant Dundee and Sergeant Polehouse came in and walked over behind me. We all stood there for a second, and then Polehouse bent down and closed those eyes. You know him, Sam? His name is Nicolaitis. That's all I know about him. What did he come here to your place for? I don't know. You invited him? I wouldn't have been surprised to find him here, but not like this. You boys got a smear on him yet? Sure. He's an old customer of mine. Runs a photo lab. Photostats, microfilm. Microfilm. Nobody makes any sense. They're all screwballs, psychos, neurotics. What am I doing in the middle of this anyway? Sam, don't scream at us. We're just doing a job. Oh, I'm sorry, boys. There's 
Dr. Denhoff is my client. Mental and this... expert. That Denhoff probably had a screw loose somewhere and needed a psychoanalyst himself. Say, maybe he was... Yeah. Yeah. Hey, look, Dundee. Hmm? I'm going out of here now. Do I call Sid Weiss and we go through all that again, or are you going to let me walk? Why, Sam, you can go. I know where you sleep. I'll wake you when I'm ready for you. Well, Mr. Speed? I want some answers, Dr. Zoya, and you're the guy who can give them to me. I'm listening. Just let the questions flow into your mind and do not try to repress any of them. Speak instantly, whatever... Okay, question number one, without thinking. Do you think Dr. Denhoff was a suicide? Well, I had not seen Dr. Denhoff for many years. He had been my student in Vienna. I was his analyst, in fact. That's all very interesting, Doctor, but my question... Yes, yes, sir. Did poor Dr. Denhoff commit suicide? I have reviewed all the material, manifest and hypothetical, and I came to the conclusion, no, no, it was quite impossible. You see, these paranoid Okay, and question number two. Was uh, Dr. Denhoff in love with Constance Brent? I suppose I can now answer that question. When I arrived in San Francisco, I found him in great distress. He told me he feared he was losing his objectivity towards this patient. In other words, he was in love with her? Yes. You think she might have murdered him? All psychoanalytical subjects develop aggressive feelings toward the doctor. <laughs> Nearly all of my patients have threatened me at one time or another. You don't say. Uh, tell me, Dr. Zoe, you know anything about Jonathan Wallace, Miss Brent's husband? A violent type, almost psychotic. Yeah? How about you, uh... Dr. Zoya, could you have done it? That is a most interesting question, Mr. Spade. When I arrived here from Vienna without funds, dependent on the kindness of my former students, I must confess that I felt a certain antagonism. It disturbed me to realize that a man of my standing in the profession should have be dependent on the goodwill of a younger and, uh, I sincerely believe, less gifted man. However, I overcame this, and I didn't kill him. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Doctor, thanks a lot. Oh, people, people. Truly a life study. There is no accounting. <laughs> For instance, Dr. Denhoff. He came to me only this afternoon with the strangest request. Yeah? He gave me the gold watch. The gold watch which I had presented to him many years ago upon his graduation in Vienna. He had a patient waiting and so had not much time to explain. Where is this watch? I... Please, I'm coming to that. He asked me to promise that I would have the watch buried with him if something should happen. That has been done. But Dr. Denhoff just died at 3 o'clock. It is a mosaic law that the deceased be buried before sundown. Uh -huh. Thanks, Doctor. Thanks a lot. Hmm. I hope I've been of some help. Doctor, you'll never know how much you've helped me. Spade. Oh, what's happened? I think I got the answers, Mrs. Denhoff. That file on Constance Brent. Your husband knew that you'd been going through it. Oh, Mr. Spade. Shut up and listen to me. He took it out of the files, had it microfilmed for his own private records, and destroyed the original. Really? The man who did the microfilming was Nicolaitis. He delivered one print to your husband and kept another for himself. He was murdered in my apartment for the copy he used to shake down your husband. The killer now has that copy, if it hasn't already been destroyed. But we can still put our hands on the first strip of microfilm which you delivered to your husband. This is astonishing. How? It's in the gold watch which was buried with him. Uh, oh, the, the watch that Dr. Zoya... That's right. Denhoff made up his mind that whatever he knew about Constance Brent was going to go to the grave with him. What are you doing tonight? Uh, nothing. And we got a date, sweetheart, you and I. I'll be back toward the wee hours. All paths lead to the grave. 
Ophelia, Act 6. Gregory's grave? But shouldn't we get a court order and have it done properly? The courts don't open until 10 in the morning, sweetheart. And Lieutenant Dundee's going to start asking me some questions about that stuff in my apartment before then. You see, baby, I can't wait. We shouldn't be doing this. If I'm wrong this time, it won't be wasted effort. I'll crawl into the grave myself and pull it in after. Here. I struck it. Give me that crowbar, Mrs. Denhoff, quick. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Put that flashlight in, sweetheart. You look the other way. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. Look. What, Mr. Speed? What have you got? The watch. Here, put the flash on it while I open it. Uh, here's my nail file. Pry off the back. Thanks, that does it. Here's, here's, here's the film. All right, Mr. Spade. Give me that film. Who was not the second gravedigger from Hamlet, Mr. Constance Brent? Stop clowning and hand it up to me. You better do as he says, Mr. Spade. We've both got guns. I was expecting that. Took you a long time to get here, Mr. Wallace. How did dear Constance make out as Lady Macbeth? Just give me that film. Stop being an idiot, Wallace. The cemetery is crawling with cops. Put that gun away before you drop it and break your foot. Come up out of that grave, Spade, or you'll stay there forever. Okay, Dundee. Oh. Get those hands up, everybody. Go ahead, Dundee. Make the pinch. Okay. Sam Spade, I arrest you for body snatching violation of graves under the civil code number... No, two. you fool. You're supposed to arrest Mrs. Gregory huh? Denov and Jonathan Wallace for the murder of Gregory Denov and Pericles Nicolaitis. But I... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I... No, you don't. I... smart of you, Mrs. Denov, to make me late for my appointment with Nicolaitis. You did that so that Wallace could nail him in my apartment for the microfilm. You thought you could use that film to pin Denov's murder on Constance Brent. But after your late husband caught you tampering with his files, he added a few well-chosen words to it so that the film put the finger on you and your boyfriend, Mr. Wallace, in case anything happened to the doctor. So Wallace had to kill Nicolaitis. You weren't smart to push your husband out the window. That looked like suicide. You might have gotten away with it, Mrs. Denhoff, if you'd bashed your husband's head in with a bottle. Uh, that reminds me, Effie, pour me a drink. Is that all? Sign it, put a special delivery on it, and send it care of the matron to Hatchapi Prison. Go on, have one yourself. Oh, thank you. Here's how. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get used to it. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. Wild Root Cream Oil presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective produced and directed by William Spear. Men, on these warm August days, the sun beats down on your hair, may leave it looking dry and brittle. That's why, now especially, you need Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic has just what it takes for summer grooming. It contains lanolin, the soothing oil that's so much like the oil of your skin. Wild Root Cream Oil keeps your hair neatly in place, gives it the handsome, successful look that helps you get ahead on the job. And Wild Root Cream Oil removes loose, ugly dandruff and actually relieves annoying dryness. So tonight, take the famous FN test. Check your scalp. Signs of dryness or loose dandruff tell you, you need Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Fred Esler was Dr. Zoya. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Don't forget, next Friday, the three masters of the art of hair raising, Dashiell Hammett, William Spear, and Wild Root Cream Oil, join forces to bring you another hair-raising adventure with Sam Spade. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Dick Joy speaking. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. <laughs> Uh, 
Effie? Effie. Eff. Oh. I waited. Say what you have to say and I'll go. You've been through a tough time, sweetheart. Well, you didn't make it any easier. You think it was a cakewalk for me? You think my nerves are made of rubber? You have no nerves. You're just a cold, callous Shut old up. detective. You're going to listen to me. You're going to sit still, not talk, and listen. I when I've finished, you can say goodnight or goodbye. But first, you're going to listen to me. You remember how it started? Yesterday evening, when you told me it was your mother's birthday, you were giving a party, you said, and you wanted me to come? I tried to beg off, being no social butterfly, but Mom would be hurt, you said. And so the next thing I knew, there I was at your house, surrounded by two dozen strangers, ten gallons of lemonade, and your mother. I've been wanting to have a talk with you, Mr. Spade, about Effie. I can't think of a nicer subject, Mrs. Brain. <laughs> Effie is just so devoted to you, Mr. Spade. Yeah, well, uh, I, uh, Mother. I'm very devoted to Effie, too, Mother. Mrs. Brain. Uh, what I mean is Mother, that... I... I think something party dying on a feet. Oh, you want me to spike the lemonade, Effie? It just so happens that I have here in my pocket a bottle of... Uh... I have a wonderful idea. It makes a party one big, happy family. You just wait and see now. Quiet! Quiet, everybody! What's she up to? Some kind of game, probably. Mother's great on game. Oh, that's all I need. Your attention, please! Oh, oh, excuse me. There's Miss Brent going now. Miss Brent? Oh, Miss Brent? Yeah, Miss Brent. Won't you join the party? I'd love to, but I have an appointment. Oh, what a shame. Oh, you stay. Thank you. Some other time. Oh, Lola's so nice. She rents the sitting room upstairs. I wish she could have stayed. Well, but I I'll explain the game now. Oh, Mrs. Prina, I think I'll stay after all. Oh, how nice. Oh, you brought a gentleman friend. Yeah, yeah, he... This is Marty. Mikey? Oh, but Mikey, I'd like to... Lola have sat down and crossed her legs at me. In her left knee, where I would have preferred to see a dimple, I saw a tattoo mark. Her gentleman friend, Marty, was a small, stocky guy, all teeth and New York tie. He uh, shook hands all around, and it felt like the paw of a stale stiff. And this is Mr. Spade. He's a private detective that he works for. Lola's from Kansas City, Mr. Spade. Oh? She's waiting for her husband to return from service overseas. I'm glad he's coming home safely. Where's he stationed? Uh, he, Japan. Yeah, he's... Now, quiet, everybody, quiet. We're going to play charade. Oh, it's very simple. Now, you see, I'm the captain of Team A. Now, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Burson, oh, he's so clever. He can be captain of Team D. Now, dears, quiet, everybody. Now, we'll both select the members of our team, and then um, each of you will uh, write something on a slip of paper. Uh, we'll write a quotation or a phrase, you know, the title of a song, whatever you like. Doesn't matter. Just something interesting and clever. Then I think... Yes, yes, I think that's right. You act out what you've written all in pantomime. No words can be used, although sounds are permissible. Dears, you must listen to me or we can't play the game. Now, you can't play unless you know how. Oh. And then your team must guess what is written on the paper, and you act it out. Now, any questions? How many words can we play? Oh, any amount of words. Oh, that's no, not, not over ten, though. Ten. Too long, yes. Now, everybody... Teams ready? were chosen. I wound up on now, Mrs. Perrine's Team A. The slips of paper were handed out to the guests. I wrote down, quote, the raven nevermore. So I'd have to make like a raven. While everybody was getting settled, uh, Lola Brent came up to me. She pushed a slip of paper into my hand. This is your charade, Mr. Spade. Oh, but I got Isn't one. Isn't this fun? Please, don't lose the charade I gave you. And with that, she lost herself in the crowd. I pushed the paper she handed me into my pocket without looking at it. Her gentleman friend, Marty, the little character with a New York tie, was out in the center of the floor quack, acting quack, his charade. Quack, 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 he flapped his arms quack, up and down, quacked twice, and rolled over on his back. Nobody got it, so he did it again. Quack, 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 quack. Oh. Wait a minute, Dead duck! Dead duck! Dead duck! Dead duck. Dead duck. Oh, dead duck. oh, isn't that wonderful? Now, Team A scores a win there. Let's go on, please. Well, sir, uh, Mr. Dead Duck, we guessed you. So will you please get up now and we'll go on to the... <gasps> oh! Sam! Sam, he's dead! <laughs> And he certainly was. A deader duck I'd never seen. 
I bent to him and his lips were turning blue. Somebody had spiked his last drink with a jigger of poison. One hour later, Dundee and the homicide boys, including the medic, had taken a sip downtown. No one could identify him. Lola Brent had brought him to the party, but she'd taken a powder. You and Mom were kind of shaky, so I decided to spend the night on the sofa in the living room. I only used up about three hours of it when I heard the front door open. I figured it was Lola. I got to my feet, crossed to the hall, and found myself staring into the biggest 45 I ever saw. Where's the duck? Who? He wants to know who, Poby. Look. We don't want no trouble. You're protecting this duke. Okay. All we want is a duck. Try Walt Disney. Oh. I should have known they had no sense of humor. The butt of the gun caught me behind the left ear. That's where it usually catches me. I don't know how much more sleep I packed away until I felt you shaking me. Sam! Sam! Huh? What, Effie? Sam! They took Mom. Huh? Those gunmen, they took Mom. Well, what happened? They came into our bedroom. Yeah? They hit me. What? Right here. Yeah? And then they grabbed Mama. They wanted the duck. Huh? Say, what were they saying? And they took Mom out with them. I'll call the police. Effie, no, no. But they've got Mom. Oh, for heaven's sake, Sam. They took my mother with them. No, no, we can't call the police, Effie. Not yet. They, they want something. They want the duck. I think Mom has it. She's safe for a while, but if we call the police, Oh, Sam, Sam, what shall we do? What shall we do? Keep our fingers crossed and play the rest of the caper by ear. So you promised that you wouldn't call the police until I gave you the nod. I went out to buzz the town. I figured it was an out-of-state mob, probably New York. The Gunzels were after the duck. Well, that made no sense. They thought I was the muscle for the juke joint. I hustled over to Jenny the Juke. If she didn't know the score, nobody would. Her place was dark. But finally, she opened up and led me into the rear. When I mentioned the duck, she shut down tighter than a clam in December. It's blisters, Sam. Blisters, I tell you. This ain't only the local law. This is the feds. Go away, Sam. My joint ain't juking for the duration. Listen, Jenny, there's an out-of-state mob. They put the arm on my secretary's mother. She don't know the time of day. They pulled the wrong feather. I don't hear a word you say, Sam. They're mixed up in the juke joint, Griff. You, you know who they are. Where's the duck, Jenny? Sam, you're winging in the breeze, Now, Sam. give me a rundown, Jenny, or I'll tear your ears off. I want that old woman back safe. You can't muscle me, Sam. You know why? Because you'll tear my ears off, and that's where you'll stop. <laughs> that's where they begin. Okay, Jenny, okay. One thing. Can you get word to them? Uh, maybe. Well, you try. Maybe. Tell them I've got the duck. I'll deal for the old woman. I'll try. Go back to your office. If I can throw a little weight, you'll get a call. If I can't, you can come back for my ears. And when I got back to the office, I had you on my hands. And that was no rest cure. But I can't just sit here. Do something. We've got to sit and wait. Maybe they're killing her. Maybe... Oh, Sam, please, call the police. No, we got to sweat it out. I can't. I can't go on like this. Who sent you? Jenny the Duper. What's your name? I'm Dennis O'Rourke. I'm here to talk about the duck. Good enough. Come into my office. Effie, you wait out here. But Sam... Wait here, I said. Sit down. Thank you kindly. I'm a lawyer, Mr. Spade. I'm here to represent my client. What's his name? John Doe. Mm-hmm. Jane Doe's big brother, huh? My client has been led to believe that you are prepared to uh, produce the duck. Is that correct? More or less. What's it worth to your client? My client is willing to trade the old woman for the duck. <laughs> you go back and tell your client I'm a big boy now. But I uh, I don't understand, Mr. Spade. This town is loaded with old women. All I have to do is walk up and down Market Street, but there's only one duck. There must be a misunderstanding. And let me put you straight. I've got the duck. Where? I don't be cute. Your client wants the duck. Okay. For 50 G. $50,000, is it? Things are high all over. Yeah, but the old woman is uh, Mrs. Perrine. Aren't you interested? Now, listen, you can do whatever you like about the old woman. So you got an old woman. Get rid of her however you want. That's your source. What's important is that you want the duck. I want 50 grand. Do we play? Well, no, I... Wait. Effie. I thought we had an audience the other side of the door. What were you... Shut up. Save it, Effie. This is business. 
Easiest money of the season. Well, if you're ready to talk business, we'll go and talk to my client, Mr. Spade. Now. Then let's go. Hey, what I heard you say. You did... Oh, Sam! You've known me a long time, Effie. But maybe you don't know me. The United States Armed Forces Radio Service is presenting the weekly adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. The car that drove us down the peninsula was brand new. I could tell by the way the upholstery smelled and the careful way the driver handled it. O'Rourke, the lawyer, sat up front and I sat in the back, squeezed between two gunners. The gun muzzle stuck into my ribs told me all I needed to know about them. The rest of it I had to guess at. Time is hard to judge when you're blindfolded, but there's only one main road out of San Francisco by land. And I know the towns and stops along it fairly well. About 20 miles out of the city, the car turned off the main highway onto a gravel road. Five minutes later, the blindfold came off. The fog was so thick, I still couldn't see much. The gunners pushed me ahead of them into a shack that looked like a summer vacation cottage with a sign over the door that said, Buy the weed. A sallow, mean-looking little man with a heavily scarred face met us at the door. On his right arm, just above the wrist, was tattooed a small picture of a mallard duck. He glared at me and then at O'Rourke. How come? I told you, don't come back without her. Heaven be my witness, Ducky. I did my utmost. Huh? It seems, Ducky, that Mr. Spade is interested in money. What money? Did you tell him we got the old lady? I did, sir. I am afraid we've misjudged Mr. Spade. In short, Ducky, Mr. Spade is not in the least altruistic. What does he want? Uh, uh, you had better tell him, Mr. Spade. 50,000 now, another 50 G's when I deliver the duck. A hundred G's is a lot of cash. You can afford it. Bugsy, bring in the old lady. Okay. I do wish that you'd explain to Mr. Morton. Sam, well, it's high time. Do you know these men? This was a cute trick, Ducky, but it's going to cost you. The lady spoke to you, Spade. I told you it's going to cost you letting her see me here. The longer she stands here staring at me, the more it's going to cost you. Sam, what is it? If I've done anything, you make you angry. Get her out of here! But Mr. Morton said you were going to call for me, Sam. There, there, now, my Don't. Uh, come along now. Don't you worry about it. I want come. to go home. Well, of course. I really want to go home. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Spade. You've broken that old lady's heart. Stop drooling. What your talk, Sonny? I ain't any sweet old lady. I don't have to use words when I talk to you, Ducky. You won't do anything to me because I got something you need. Okay. A hundred G's paid the way you said. Price has gone up. Huh? Kidnapping's a federal rap. I'm not taking any part of it. She don't know she was snatched. We told her we are from the DA's office, keeping her on ice as a witness. You'll find out different. I don't plan on settling down here. Oh, that's fine, but I have to go on living in this town with that old hen alive and clucking. It won't be easy. You mean you want we should knock off that sweet old lady? You're a little slow, Ducky, but you'll get there. I've met some lousy low-down heels in my day, but you're the lousiest low... Oh. Go on. Go on. I can take more of it at these prices. We ain't doing your dirty laundry, see? And it's no dice. My price is a hundred grand. What if I say no? Then I turn over the duck to the federal boys. In that case, I don't care whether the old lady stays alive or not, because I'll be playing their game. Either you're in or you're out. Now get over, Morton. When you decide, you know where to reach me. Yeah. We'll know where to reach you. <laughs> They drove me back to town blindfolded, and when they let me out of the car, all I could see, even without the blindfold, was the corner of Post and Carney. When a streetcar came along, I tossed the coin with it to get on it. I lied down on the tracks and let it run over me. Came up head, so I uh, tossed it again, and I got on instead. I fished in my pocket for a slug and came up with a folded slip of paper. It was the one Lola had handed me at Mrs. Perrine's birthday party when they were passing out the parts for that screwy charades game. I unfolded it and glanced at it. Then I read it over very carefully. The writing was hard to make out, but what I could read of it said, Help me. That man Marty has followed me here to kill me. If I get out of here alive, Maxie's Arcade. I have a hundred dollars. I 
I got off at Columbus and walked up to the international settlement where Maxie's Arcade does business. It's what they used to call a penny arcade before inflation set in. I dropped a nickel in a fortune-telling machine. Worried? Perplexed? Know thyself and your problems will vanish. A card came out that said, you're of a naturally deceitful and secretive character. Disloyalty brings its own punishment. It's never too late to mend. I tore up the card, kicked the machine, and that's when I saw it. It was a narrow little booth muffled in drapes, and the sign over it said, Salty Hawkins, tattoo artist. The card pinned to the curtain showed some typical tattoo designs, anchors, mermaids, fancy initials, but one had a hand-drawn picture pasted over it. It was a mallard duck, the same as the tattoo mark I'd noticed on Ducky Morden's wrist. I pulled the curtain aside and went in. Yes, sir, what can I do for you, mate? What do you know about the duck? All in your jib, mate. There's no freshwater birds here about. How about the new one you just put up in your cart outside? Oh, that one, eh? Now, whereabouts? On the arm? Two, three colour jobs. On a leg. Whereabouts? Her left knee. Well, that's right, mate. It was on her knee. Did she have you remove it for her? All right, guess that time, mate. Know why? Look, mate. If I did, I wouldn't be telling strangers about the secret. All right, where is she? Take it easy, mate. I haven't got time to take it easy, mate. Talk. You're a bad temper, don't you? Come on, come on. I was going to tell you anyhow. She says to me, she says if a man comes All right, shut up. Where is she? Right in the back room, mate. Spade, open up. Hello, Lola. Finally worked out your charade. Come on in, quick. Were you followed here? I wouldn't have come if I had been. How much do you know? They want you a hundred thousand bucks worth. You tell me why. You've seen Ducky Mordant? Yeah. Didn't he tell you? I want to hear it from you. Don't believe anything he says. Morning and I didn't even give me the time of day. He says he wants me back that way. He's a liar. How does he want you back? With rigid mortis, he wants me back. I'm taking an awful chance opening up to you like this. Let him catch me. They'd only kill me. Humane. You was to let the DA people get at me. Ducky's mob would lay for me then if it took them years. And... Oh, gee, you don't know, Sam. They... They torture girls. What that mob would do to me if I had to testify against okay, him. Okay, I take your word for that. Who are these DA people you're talking about? You never heard of Ducky Morton before? I heard his name. I thought he was knocked over when they had the big racket busting show in New York years ago. Yeah, I guess a lot of people thought that. It wasn't healthy to mention Ducky's name. What was the racket? Juke joints. Giving Mickeys to servicemen, rolling them. That's why the feds are helping the DA's office. They arrested hundreds of girls and held them as material witnesses. Only they wanted me most of all. I'd work the joints, you see, and... And then I was Ducky's girlfriend during the duration. Well, I'd think you'd be only too happy to tell what you know about him in court. Oh, gee, I would if I did, but you don't know. The DA's office say they'll give a girl protection, but how can they? What are you doing in San Francisco? Running away. I had my ticket on a boat. I was going to Honolulu. They was watching the boats. So then I found this room out in Oakland. Mrs. Preen was real nice to me. I never thought they'd find me there. And then Marty showed up. Honest, it was just a Mickey I put in his drink. Just like we used in the joints, I never knew it'd kill him. You're a brave kid, Lola. Now, look, Ducky offered me a hundred grand to deliver you. Would you take a chance on me fighting it out with him for half of that? For fifty grand? Brother, where are we meeting him? O'Rourke's car was parked outside my apartment building where I had a hunch it would be. The two Ghanas picked us up at the door, unloaded my hardware, and marched us up the stairs. Ducky opened the door of my listen, apartment Ducky. and waved us inside. Listen, honey, you uh, keep go a wrong, plant see? outside, you two. Ducky, listen to me. Uh, sit down. You too, Lola. Ducky, I swear I never said a word. I'd never talk, Ducky, even if they chopped my head off. We'll take up your suggestion later. I got a conference on with Mr. Spade here. You bring the money? Don't crowd me. There's that other matter. The old lady. How about the old lady? I keep my word, Spade. You delivered the duck. Okay. The way Jenny gave it out to O'Rourke was the old lady for the duck. But you ain't got no ethics. You see, you figured me wrong. I don't kill old ladies. You're gonna kill the duck. I ain't no old lady. No, you ain't. And you ain't gonna get any older. And neither are you, Spade. He wasn't kidding. He really meant to knock me over. And the gun he was gonna do it with got ready to speak its piece. I'd made my play too strong. The way this type of gunsel thinks is simple, and I'd guessed it right. If you pressure them, they go the other way by instinct. But what I hadn't figured was that this killer had a heart of lettuce. He was going to cut me down to protect your mother from me. How do you like that? 
And I couldn't change my play now. The wheel was already spinning, and so was my head. I tried to brace myself and waited for the blast. Every little move matters. Oh! oh, dear, I dropped the tray. This is Perrine. What are you doing here? I was just making some coffee for the boys. Oh, dear, I've broken your cups. That's okay, Mother. We'll take care of it. Bugsy, pick it up. Pick it up, sure, sure. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bugsy. Well, I'm so glad you got my message, Sam. Didn't Effie come with you? Uh, yeah. I mean, no. I, I, oh, I, mean... I wanted to surprise you both together. I hope you don't mind my taking over the kitchen. It was so late and the boys were getting hungry, so I offered to make them coffee and hot cakes. Well, that was very nice of you. Uh, Mr. Morden, uh, put that pistol down for a moment and... And help me move this table up into the room. Huh? Oh, oh, sure, Mother. Thank you. Oh, we've had such a good time. I've never been up so late in my life. Mr. Bugsy and I played a game called Blackjack. And I won $50. <laughs> wait till Effie hears about that. Yeah, wait till she hears. I suppose Effie will come with Mr. Bundy. Bundy? Oh, yes. I remember that Effie said you and she are off and down at his office at police headquarters late at night. So I phoned there. Uh, and... Mother. Yes, Mr. Morton? Did you say you phoned police headquarters? Well, yes. That's where Mr. Bundy works. Mother, what did you tell Mr. Bundy? Well, just that you and the boys were here and that we were about to have some coffee. And he said he'd just love to come up and join us. And I said do. And he said he would. With some of his boys. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say something wrong? <laughs> no. No, Mom, not at all. <laughs> all right, boy. Crash it. Oh, I believe that's Mr. Bundy now. <laughs> when the smoke cleared away, Ducky Morton and his hoods were playing dead duck for keeps in my living room rug. And that rug just came back from the cleaners, too. Dundee and the boys from Homicide took Lola Brent away with them. After it was all cleaned up, I found your mother out in the kitchen. Well, Sam, I just made another pot of coffee. <laughs> oh, it's okay, Mom. It's okay. It's all over now. I know. I know. I, I've been holding this back. Oh, Sam, I, I've never been so frightened in all my life. How does Effie stand it? You played it good, Mom. You played it real good. Did I? Was I as brave as Effie? Braver. And not only that, you got more brains. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education.
Ahoy! It's me. Just came ashore. From what? A boat? A ship, Effie. A ship. Anything over 400 gross tons is a ship. Anybody knows that. Well, may I inquire what was your port of call? Calcutta. My, that was a quick trip. Well, Effie, I'll tell you. I got so homesick for you, I couldn't stand it, so I assembled my gear and jumped ship. Why, Sam, how sweet. A faster, gal. I'll be right down to dictate my report. <laughs> Bon voyage, Effie. I've been worried sick. Where have you been? On my way to Calcutta, sweetheart, where the dawn comes up like thunder. Sam, what are you talking about? Calcutta? And the flying fishes play. Ready, Effie? Sam, why did you want to go to Calcutta of all places? I didn't, Effie. I hate Calcutta. I was Shanghai. <sighs> to, uh, Mr. Philip J. Fogg, purser, S.S. Lurine. How do you spell that, Sam? L-U-R-E-N-E. Oh, that's pretty. Sam, how could you be shanghaied in this day and age? I mean, isn't it against the law? Stow it, Effie. You're pumping bilge water. Sam, I am not. From Samuel Spade, license have number 137596, when you have the time, regarding the Calcutta trunk caper. Dear Mr. Fogg, the following report will explain the enclosed voucher, which is a claim against your company for the amount of $500 and no cents. It will also answer any questions you might be asked concerning the recent unpleasantness on board your ship. It all started yesterday morning in San Francisco when my secretary announced briefly and caustically that there was a lady outside who wanted to talk to me. I judged that she was worth talking to. She was. Your secretary let me in. Well, I'm glad she did. What can I do for you? I'm Marsha Hopkins. I see. Mrs. Marsha Hopkins. I see. However, my husband is dead. I see. It's about my sister that I've come to you, Mr. Spade. I'm dreadfully worried about her. Uh, Who's your sister? Miss Constance Pendleton. And she's become involved with a a ne'er-do-well, a completely worthless scoundrel and a real foreign bluebeard. All three? It's one man, Mr. Spade, a Bulgarian, Major Andrea Rodnik. They're going to be married this afternoon, and I'm positive that his only interest is in her money. I'm convinced that he's going to kill her soon after the ceremony. He's done it to other wives in Europe. I've warned Constance and pleaded with her, done everything I could to stop it. But she's completely infatuated with him and refuses to listen to me. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Prevent the marriage, if you can. Get the truth about Rodnik's background and face Constance with it. Oh, Mr. Spade, in in some way, you've got to make her realize the seriousness of the situation. He's a ruthless character. Mm, Well, do what I can, Mrs. Hopkins. Oh, thank you, Mr. Spade. Oh, I've felt so alone and helpless uh, until now. Oh, really? But you will do everything you can, won't you? We've got to save her life. She daubed her eyes with a stamp-sized handkerchief, patted the red-gold hair of the temples nervously, smiled at me bravely, and swayed out. By telephone, I learned that the Vrodnik Pendleton marriage license had been issued four days before, and that on the same day, Constance Pendleton had withdrawn a savings account to the tune of $45,000. I'd always wanted to, so I did it. I uh, called at the Bulgarian consulate. What can I do on you? What do you know about Major Andrei Vrodnik? Ha! Huh? Andrei Vrodnik! On him we have hate, great sadness, with shame for the ground that walked under him. Oh? Ha! Huh? Andrei Vrodnik! Uh, why is he so popular? On the devil he is driven without horns. Six women he has killed. Six times he has insulted the police of Europe by refusing to confess. We have proof of the murders, but never can we prove the proof on him. Yeah, sometimes it goes that way. Ha! Never do we find the bodies of the six women. Only their money in the name of Andrea Vrodnik. <laughs> My pardon. Well, think nothing of it. You're, uh, you're just upset uh, on you. You're interested on him. Why? You go to Europe? No, uh, Vrodnik comes here. Ha! Here? Here on San Francisco? He marries again? So I'm told. Ha! 
Oh, by all the means, you must prevent it. Go to him, brave man. You do the world a service. Make violence on him. Even do you hang for it, your name will live. <laughs> With those valiant words goading me on, I left. The farther I got into the caper, the more it looked as if Marsh's fears for Constance Pendleton were very real and very well-founded. When uh, Constance opened the door of her hotel suite, I could see three trunks and a number of smaller pieces of luggage, all locked and ready to be taken out. Yes? Are you Constance Pendleton? Yes. Uh, I'm a detective. My name is Spade. Detective? What do you want? I uh, want to talk to you about that bluebeard you're going to marry. Get out of here. Uh, you listen, I'll talk, and then I'll get out of here. I just left the Bulgarian consulate. Vrodnik has been accused of the murders of six women in Europe. Each of them were wealthy. Each of them married him, and each time Vrodnik came into all their money. Are you trying to blackmail me because of the lies about my fiancé's past? If you are, you're wasting your time. Well, no matter what I'm doing, I'm wasting my time. But to put you straight, your sister hired me, and I am now resigning. She's worried about you, not me. Then you should spend more time investigating your clients, Mr. Spade. You could have saved both of us some time. I have no sister. This is my wedding day. Goodbye, Mr. Spade. As I left the room, I maintained the stern facial expression I reserved for moments of great shock. But once outside the door, I allowed myself to be carried on a wave of rage and embarrassment for just a minute. And I kicked over two potted palms. As I uh, limped down the corridor, I was overtaken by none other than Marcia Hopkins. Did you see her? Let's talk about you first. Did you stop the marriage? Why did you really want that marriage stopped? But I told you. You told me you were her sister. Oh. She said she didn't have any sister. All right, Sam, I did lie to you about that. But I'll tell you who I really am. I don't want to know who you are. I don't ever want to know. All I want from you is my honestly earned fee and a brief but permanent goodbye. Oh, no, Sam, please listen to me. We've got to save that girl. I have $500. That's all I have. Would it be enough? What's your real name? Marsha Brodnick. Yes, he's my husband. I've been married to him for ten years. We've traveled all over Europe, and I never knew where the money was coming from. He left me at times for two weeks or a month, and... Then when he'd come back, there'd be more money. I just realized that that's when he must have been killing those poor women. And I know that's what he's going to do this time. I just can't stand it. You've got to protect her. That should be easy. We'll let him get married and meet him at the door with a bigamy warrant. Then you will see me through this. I might. Oh. In my bag, there's $500. Take it. If we can't stop the marriage, then don't let him out of your sight. Not even for a minute. He's a beast, Sam. A beast. Marcia dropped me in front of the Beast's Hotel, and I climbed some fake marble steps to the second floor and knocked at his door. The man who opened it was heavy, handsome, in a swarthy, coarse sort of a way, and glowing conceit through two eyes. One monocled, one not. You are facing Major Andreev Rodnik, first Bulgarian horse. What want you? You are facing Saul Fox of the law firm of Fox, Smedley, Van Dusen, and Grip. You overwhelm yourself. I came here to warn you. If you go through with a marriage to Constance Pendleton, you're going to find yourself tangled with civil law. Warned. Andreev Rodnik, who has personally led more saber charges than you have teeth in your skull. Yes. Who has personally split, slashed, and impaled on his own blade. More men than you have fingers and toes. You warn me. What is this talk? You're going to have a bigamy charge slapped on you five minutes after you slip her the ring. The warrant signed by Mrs. Marsha Vrodnik. Bigamy? Ha! I laugh. This is not bigamy. Marsha's your wife, isn't she? That bigamy was committed when I married her. I had another wife then. You call yourself a lawyer, then you know that only the second marriage is bigamy. The ones following that are nothing, nothing but interludes. Okay, Major, go ahead and have your interlude. I'm just warning you. Oh, speaks. We are being married on Redwood City from a justice of the peace one hour previous. Then we are sailing through the SS Lurine at midnight with our honeymoon. Already a drushki awaits for the baggage and luggage. Go now before I'm losing my temper. If you're ever in Calcutta, look me up. Da!
I could see the direct approach was getting me nowhere, so I decided to proceed by stealth. I waited outside the building, and when he left, I tailed him. He made four stops at a second-hand store, a hardware store, a surgical supply house, and an undertaker supply house. At these places, he purchased the following items. An oversized steamer trunk, black with brass fittings, a large ball of rope twine, two large lead sash weights, a set of surgical instruments, and at the fourth and final stop, the undertaking supply, he bought two items, a 20-foot length of rubber tubing and a pump. He returned to the second-hand store with his other purchases, put them inside the trunk, and ordered it sent up to Constance's hotel immediately, and thereupon, it took himself to the same place. Marsha was waiting in the empty lobby when he went in. I crouched behind a pillar, turned up my hearing aid, and listened. Did you get the thing? Uh, Now listen, my darling, we must work fast. As soon as the trunk arrives, before she has a chance to get to the telephone... Yes, yes, Andre, but please, no cutting in the apartment. (laughs) As you wish, my darling. Now, you know, you know what you have to do. Yes, While I'm getting her into the trunk, you'll change her clothes, put on her traveling dress, the hat with the wet. What is it? What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. Come, we must make haste. They made haste to the elevators, and I made haste to the row of house telephone booths around the corner and called Constance's room. This is Rodney. Speaking. Listen, get out of that room right away. Don't take the elevator. Get down the stairs. Who is this? W- what are you talking about? I haven't got time to explain, and you haven't got time to listen. All those stories about your husband are true. He's going... Hello? Hello? Are you still on the line? My hand clawed out Hello? to the door handle, but I couldn't reach it. I felt as if the Andre. walls were closing in around me, and just Can before it got dark, I had the crazy notion that I was inside Brodnick's big Anybody black home? trunk with the brass fittings. I could still hear Constance's voice way off in the distance, somewhere in the direction of Calcutta. I tried to shout to her, to warn her, and then the lid closed over me. I shook my head, trying to get the bells out of it. Then I remembered where I was and what had happened. I was still wedged into the bottom of a phone booth where I'd slumped when Brodnick sat me. I got out of there somehow and grabbed the taxi for the Embarcadero. The time was 11.55. The SS Lorraine was scheduled to sail at midnight. I was no sooner across it than they hauled up the gangplank and the ship started moving out of the berth. I didn't know where she was bound for and I didn't much care. I checked the passenger list and found that Major and Mrs. Andrea Brodnick were in stateroom 12, A deck. One minute later, I was hammering on the door of stateroom 12. The woman in Brodnick's stateroom was Constance and she was not in a trunk. I thought I told you to stop interfering in our affairs. Yeah, your husband told me to, but I didn't like the way he did it. Get out from here. Get out. I see you got your trunk in here where it's handy. Doesn't it make the stateroom kind of crowded? Why don't you give up, Mr. Spade? Two times already, you are twice a fool. Marcia has no money to pay you, neither have I, even if she had the case. And believe me, she has not. Well, why do you even bother talking to him, Andre? Mr. Well, Spade, will you go now, or will I have to call the steward and make a complaint against you? I went. I still thought Marsha Hopkins was somewhere on that ship. I still didn't like the look of that trunk. I found the purses office and went in. You looked at me as if you thought I was a stowaway, Mr. Fogg, and you were right. Well, I'll have to make arrangements for you to ride back with a pilot, Mr. Spade. You realize, of course, that you're subject to a fine. Look, I don't want to do anything illegal. You know, it was uh, just an impulsive thing. Uh, couldn't I book a passage? Well, there's the matter of your passport. Could arrange your visa and so on in St. Pedro. We'll put it in there in the morning. Well, that's good enough. Uh, how much is the fare? Well, let me see. That's $483.97, exclusive of tax. Oh, uh, hey, now, wait, I wasn't thinking of taking quite such an extensive voyage, you know. I just wanted to get a little sea air. And, uh, how much to Pedro? Well, I'm afraid you don't understand, Mr. Spade. This is not a coastwise steamer. Our first official port of call is Calcutta. Yeah, I know, but Calcutta... That's in India. Well, uh, 
Uh, don't you have something a little less expensive, like uh, steerage or... Uh... There is only one stateroom available, number 14A deck. Take it or leave it. Okay, okay, Calcutta. After buying my passage to Calcutta, I had exactly 12 cents left. This I gave to the steward who showed me to my stateroom. He uh, thanked me, kicked me in the shins, and left. Out on deck, a tall, red-nosed old gentleman in knickerbockers and a yachting cap was taking a turn around the deck. With him was a face I'd seen in the morning lineup down at the Hall of Justice a dozen times. He was a hotel thief by profession, name of Norman Gorman. He knew me, too, but he didn't give me a tumble. I fell into step with him. Ah, see ya. Nothing like it, am I right? Yeah, I guess it's okay, but there's so much of it. Ah, uh, brisk, bracing, salt spray. Nothing like it. <laughs> uh, hey, Norman, my lad. I hate it. I hate boats. Suppose there was a fire on board. Fire? Oh, ridiculous. Uh, this your first voyage to the Orient? Yeah. Uh, the inscrutable East. You've made this trip before? Oh, yes, indeed. I've worked this line. I, I mean, uh, yes, indeed. I make this voyage very often. Business interest out in India. Tea, you know. Runs in my family. Sturgis's Golden Orient in the little yellow package. Ever tried it? Uh, no, I never indulge. Huh? Don't drink tea. That's ridiculous. Commodore, I need a drink. I ain't happy. Suppose there was a fire on board here. Ah. Well, let's all have a drink. Yeah, suppose there was Shall a fire. Shall we? Come on, I'll shut you to a drink, sir. Uh, not me, Commodore. I, uh, just remember this is Fire Prevention Week. The nearest fire alarm to Brodnick's stateroom was on the companionway leading to the A-deck corridor. It was a glass-enclosed box with a small hammer hanging on a chain. I broke the glass and turned the key. In three seconds flat, the entire population of A-deck were shoving each other up the companionway, grabbing for life preservers as they went. The steward hammered on the door of stateroom 12, opened it, shouted inside, and Brodnick and Constance reluctantly came out. I ducked inside, grabbed the handle of the trunk, and started dragging it. When I got it into my stateroom, I broke the lock and lifted the lid. It was Marsha, all right. There was just time to see that before the stateroom door flew open and the ship's officer stuck his head in. Why, uh, no, I didn't. What's wrong? Never mind, that. Here, take this life preserver. Get going Okay, now. okay, on. don't touch me. It makes me nervous. Twenty minutes later, the captain announced to the mob up on the deck that it was a false alarm, and the passengers drifted back to their cabins. I tried to look casual as I unlocked my stateroom door and walked in. Then I stopped trying. The trunk was still there, but the lid was standing open, and it was empty. I went down to B deck and found the cabin occupied by Norm and the Commodore. That door was locked, so I kicked it in. <laughs> you could still see the marks on her wrists and ankles with the cord. It was the girl I had seen in the trunk. It was Marsha Hopkins, and she was very much alive. I'm sorry, I thought it was... Oh, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You've got to help me, Sam. Why should I help you? He's crazy. They're both crazy. It all depends on who's in the trunk, doesn't it, Marsha? When it was Constance, you didn't think he was so crazy. Oh, don't you understand? I had to pretend that I'd help him. He was going to kill her right there in the hotel room. I told him it was too dangerous. If anybody looked in the trunk, it would be safer if she was in there alive. We finally agreed and said he'd wait until we got out to sea to kill her. And then he was Yeah, I know to... about that. Well, the idea was so awful, I, I couldn't stand it. I started to scream, and then he stuffed the gag in my mouth and tied me up. He must have used chloroform or something, because the next thing I knew, I, I was in the trunk. And that little dark man was leaning over me. He and that old man with the knickers, they brought me here. <laughs> well, they pulled a the switch on you. You were the fall gal all along. Oh, you've got to believe me. It was the only way I could save her life. You're the only one I can turn to, Sam. That little thief and the old man, they'd deliver me dead if there was an extra $25 in it. Oh, say you'll help me, Sam. Please say it. Well, when you ask me like that, what, what else can I say? Oh, you do believe me, darling. You do believe me. 
Come on, let's get out of here. I'm sorry, Mr. Spade. Please step back inside. <clears throat> I promised my associate, Mr. Gorman, that I would not allow this young lady to risk her life by leaving this cabin. You're getting into this cave at the wrong end, Commodore. It's wound up. They've bungled it. It's no good anymore. You may be right. But you understand my position, sir. I can't take any chances. You've uh, talked to Mr. Gorman? Norm? Yeah, I talked to him. He took you into his confidence? Stop making with the pistol, Commodore. You don't know how to use it anyway. Well, heavens, Norm, you... You're as white as a sheet. What is it? Oh, he, he's sick. Go go get a doctor. Yes, yes, indeed. Right away. Listen, Spade. Take her with you. Get out of here. I don't want no part of this. You got it bad, Norm. I'm sick, I tell you. The way I had it sized, this was a clean caper, a snatch. I figure the dame here's an heiress or something. Maybe they drop her off in L.A., correct some, connect some ransom and go on. I, I figure there was enough for all of us. Oh, but that creep, that Rodnick, he's crazy. He's a regular Jack the Ripper. Stop babbling, Norm. Tell me what happened, exactly what happened. I get a sinking feeling in my stomach every time I think about it. Well, I go in, see? He's very smooth, very businesslike. He offers me a drink. I accept it. He mixes a couple of highballs for me and the dame, and then he starts talking. I guess she don't know all about it before this, because she gets just sick as I do. First, I think he's kidding. Then he drags out this set of cutlery like a doctor uses to operate on people. Only he's got something else in mind. The porthole, you understand? Oh, please. I don't want to hear any more. Being as it's you he has in mind, I don't blame you. <laughs> my, my stomach... <laughs> hey, Norm. Norm. Oh. Here he is, the ship's surgeon. Huh? Oh, dear me. What? 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 Uh, uh, stand away from him, please. Help me get him into the bunk. Sure, Doctor. <sighs> Take the shade off that light, please. Ah, uh, yes, yes. He's dead, isn't he? Oh, yes, he's dead, of course. Who poisoned him? I didn't waste any time answering him. I grabbed him by the arm. Before he could object, I was pushing him up the companionway to A-deck. It was probably too late to save Constance's life if she'd drunk the same poison, and I was pretty sure she had, but if I was going to nail him for the murder of Constance, I had to get there before the evidence vanished. We got there just in time. <laughs> I don't need to tell you what we saw. And I'd rather not. Brodnick rose slowly to his feet, clicked his heels military fashion, and bowed very low. Ah, the ship's surgeon. How opportune. Perhaps you could advise me, Doctor. After all, I am, in all honesty, even still a mere amateur at this sort of thing. <laughs> After Vrodnik had been taken into custody, we took another turn around the deck. It was daylight, and the ship was lying to off San Pedro. This time, the fresh air really felt good, and so did Marcia. It's all over, Sam. Yes, sweetheart, it's all over. But not between us. Say it, Sam. Say it's not all over between us. How can it be? I knew it. I knew you felt the same way. All my life before, it's been like a terrible nightmare. It never really happened. But it did happen, sweetheart. Oh, but you can forget it, darling, can't you? Please forget it. I'd like to, Marcia. I really would. Hold me close, Sam. Never let me go. You're beautiful. Is that all, Sam? Nothing else? Yeah. Lots else. That's why I think we'd better say goodbye right now. Because when I feel like this, I get foolish. And if I get foolish with you, I'm likely to wake up in a trunk someplace. And that, Mr. Fogg, is the true account of the Calcutta trunk caper. As my voyage was interrupted through no fault of my own, I trust you will advise your company to refund my passage minus... The one-way trip to San Pedro. Uh, period, and a report. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duck. It is played by Howard Duck. It is played by Howard Duck. It is played... Listen now to The Adventures of Sam Spade, starring Howard Duff in The Convertible Caper. <laughs> Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Say, 
Dan! I knew you'd have the courage to come back and face it. Well, I'm back, Effie. What shall I face first? You didn't do something else, did you, Sam? Besides what? Besides running away with that woman in a stolen car. You're a little mixed up, Abby. The car was stolen from her. You mean it was her own car? Well, not exactly, Abby. You see, she stole it from somebody else, and then somebody stole it from her, and then I got it back for it. Well, it must have been quite a car to be worth all that trouble. Uh, it wasn't so much the car, Abby. It's... Body? Sam, I don't understand. Think it over, sweetheart. I'll be right down to dictate my report. <laughs> You. Can't you take no for an answer? And just what do you mean by that, Miss Perrine? Claw marks on your face. Wrong again, sweetheart. She said yes, I said no. Hence the scratches. I knew she was that type the minute she walked into this office. That ankle bracelet and green nail polish. Green nail polish. Well, cute colors. This one goes to homicide, Effie. Oh, not another murder, Sam. What else? <sighs> Two, Detective Lieutenant Dundee from Samuel Spade with uh, license number 127596. Subject, the convertible caper. Dear Dundee, it had been a dull morning, but just before lunchtime, things began to brighten up. Her clothes looked like money, unless they were wrapped around, looked even better. She eased herself into the chair I pushed up for her, rattled about a thousand bucks worth of charm bracelet at me, and... After she'd arranged her legs, mouth, and eyes to our mutual satisfaction, she allowed me to hear the sound of her beautiful voice. I do not know whether you'll be interested in my case or not, Mr. Spade. Put your mind at rest, Miss... Uh... Estrada. Mrs. Estrada. Who knows? Perhaps I am merely a waste of time. My time is your time as you stay in the States, Mrs. Estrada. Oh, you are very sympathetic, very kind. Yes. Entonces, my automobile has been stolen. When and from where? Last night, after midnight, while I was checking in at the Hotel San Rafael, where I am staying, I foolishly left it parked outside with the keys in it. Have you reported us to the police? No. I suggest you do not. No. No? No. Well, why not? Because I stole it from another. I see. No, but you do not yet know all. If the police find the car and notify the one from whom I stole it, then that one will know that I am in San Francisco. And that's bad. Ah, oh, he's not so bad. If he finds out I am in San Francisco, then he will come here and kill me. That is why I must recover the car rapidly and without the police. You will be glad to help me. Be very pleasant, Mrs. Strata, but hot cars are not exactly in my line. You wish that I... I don't think anybody would murder you just for stealing his car. Oh, not for the car, no. Already he tried to kill me once, twice, three times. So I take the car and drive away rapidly. Away from where? Mexico State of Chihuahua, where this pig resides who wishes to murder me. Why? Oh, he drinks. He becomes a beast. He accuses me of... Look, look here on my shoulder, this car. Well, already he cuts me with a knife. Hmm. Uh-huh. Now you have seen something that changes your mind about me, huh? You see that I am sincere. Why, Mrs. Strada, I never had any doubts. Oh, please. I am without friends. You will call me Nietzsche, I guess? Yes, indeed, Nietzsche. Bueno, now we are friends. In the car is sitting the pig. Hmm. Uh, what's this uh, pig's name? Pig is the only name I will honor him with. Pig. Pig. Mm-hmm. Now, what makes a car is this? Leonza, you know this kind of car? Yeah, it's a foreign car. I've seen a few around. This must have set the pig back several thousand bucks. Huh, he steals everything. Listen, my darling, please notice. Around here is pink with blue fenders. Uh Uh-uh, not anymore. That's the first thing a car thief changes, the paint job. Any other uh, distinguishing marks? Distinguishing marks? Yes. I think. It has a radio. You don't say. Uh Uh-huh, and it has... Two windshield wipers. Uh-huh. Well, uh, I'll buzz around, Mitya. If I find anything, I'll let you know. Uh, my fee is... Yes. Uh... Yes, uh, that, that is something else. I have no money. Oh, that's great. That's just great. But I am sincere. You said so. Look, my darling, take this. It is worth very much. See? This little charm alone. Platinum set with diamonds. Worth very much. You will keep it until I pay you, eh? Adios, Father. Hasta la vista. 
She thrust the charm bracelet into my hand, bit me on the ear, and departed. I put a Band-Aid on it, ran some cold water over my head, poured myself a stutz like a bourbon, and examined the bracelet. The dangle she pointed out was a white metal disc with a monogram in diamonds, two uh, vertical bars with a horizontal one on top. It was the Greek letter pi or the initials PT, depending on who had stolen it from whom. I knew it was at least worth my fee. I dropped it into my pocket and went out. My first stop was over on Mission. The sign on the building says, uh, Masterpiece Auto Painting, Joe Rembrandt, Proprietor. Sam, long time no see. Hello, Joe. Uh, got something you want painted? No, but I think you may have painted something I want. Sam, you know me. They drive them in the front. We spray the paint on them and push them out the back. No questions asked. That's quite a turnover, Joe. Yeah, we're going big time. Got the exclusive now for the syndicate work in the hill. Is that right? Yeah. What are you looking for, Sam? A murder car? Could be. It's a custom job. Foreign car. Uh, the answer? Hey, here's what it looks like. Yeah. Convertible. Sure, come in this morning. Two colors job. Which two colors? Canary yellow body, baby blue fenders. Yeah, quite a car, Sam. Quite a snazzy heap. Heap, huh? Yeah. Is that what you want to know? It was. Happy Herman Heap was one of the biggest used car thieves in the city. As I got off the streetcar in front of Happy Herman's lot, a flash of canary yellow paint caught my eye. I strolled down between the rows of cars and found it. Yes, sir, Heap's the name. Happy Herman Heap. <laughs> Every car on this lot is in perfect mechanical condition. Take your choice. Kind of hard to choose, Herman. There's so many here. Yes, yes sir. It takes a heap of heaps to make a heap of heap. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that yellow job uh, with the blue fenders there? Uh, oh, yes, sir, but the, uh, the, the motor in that car, it does need some work. Now, over here... Does it run? Uh, Oh, yes, it'll run, but over now, here... this is I... more what I want. Let me try it. Yeah. Sounds all right to me. Oh, idling, yes, but needs some work in the transmission of the differential. Mind if I drive it around the block? Well, the mechanics were just about to work on it. Besides, uh, I'm afraid this car is more than you care to invest. Well, let me try it out anyway. Here, I'll uh, leave it a pause. <laughs> I reached in my pocket for Meech's charm bracelet. He took one look at it, and his expression changed. Well, well why didn't you say so? No deposit is necessary. The car's yours. Drive it as far as you like. Thank you, Herman Heath. I took him at his word. I put the magic bracelet in my pocket, drove back to O'Farrell Street, parked in front of the San Rafael Hotel... Slipped the doorman a buck to wash it for me and went on into the lobby. The desk clerk said that Senorita Estrada had checked out 30 minutes before, leaving no address. I found the house stick in the bar and asked him for a rundown. Yeah, I remember her, Sam. Very nice dish. Any callers, Tiny? Yeah, two guys. Uh -huh. Went out when they came. They've been back since. Who were they? You won't believe it, Sam. One of them was Tom Tom Carey. What's he doing in San Francisco? He's wanted for murder. And I don't know, but there must be plenty in it if he brought him back across the border. He's staying here? Yeah. Room 613. Mm -hmm. Do me a favor, will you, Tiny? Anything at all, Sam. There's a car parked outside in the loading zone here. Store it in the hotel garage for me, will you? Upstairs, as far out of sight as you can get it. I went upstairs and rang the buzzer at room 613. The door was opened by a little dark-complected man with hard eyes and Indian features. There was a mean-looking knife in his hand, but he put it away at a nod from Tom Tom Carey. How'd you find out I was in town? Not from me, you. I don't know how much he told you, Sam, but if he told you this much, he was 11. It's a million-dollar caper. And you know some of the things I've done for less. What's in it for me? What'd she pay you? Nothing. She left this charm bracelet in hock. Now, boss, I caught him now. Shut up, Harkin. Give me that bracelet. Uh-uh. Uh Watch it, Tom. Don't crowd me. I got something bigger than this or you wouldn't be here. All right, Sam, what do you want? I want to hear you talk. Hmm, I guess you know I've been down Mexico, eh? I'm listening. I got a little business down here, garage business. Running hot cars across the border in the state? <laughs> we cool them off. Little body work in his serial number. Like plastic surgery. Sounds like a good business. You shouldn't be neglecting it. You met the dame. She says you want to kill her. Sir, I was off my trout. I scared her. I didn't mean anything. I thought I could scare her into sticking around. 
I'll let Parker own Nick a shoulder a little bit. Oh, just a little bit. Yeah. I figured her wrong. I know that now. If I could see her for five minutes just to talk to her, I know it'd be okay. I can't help you, Tom Tom. I want to talk to her myself. Listen, since she hasn't got a penny, only that car. She figures I'm peddling that. Not anymore. She already sold it? Some car thieves took it. She hired me to trace it. Listen, yeah. Maybe broke in a strange country. I'd look good to her again. Here's a thousand bucks, Ken. Oh, this is so no. sudden, Tom Tom. Nothing. When you see her again, give her that bracelet back, yeah? It was a present from me. And whatever you do, don't find that car. Okay, Tom Tom, that's a promise. Thanks, man. Only one thing I don't understand. You said it was a million dollar caper. I meant that. She's worth a million bucks to me, Sam. The girl, Tom Tom? Or the car? Oh, I wish you hadn't asked that question, Sam. I really do. <laughs> to the convertible caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. When Tom Tom Carey said a million dollar caper, he meant just that. He never risked a rap for less than a hundred grand, and no dame that ever lived was worth more to him than a hot mink coat. If Nietzsche wasn't the million dollar package, the car was. I didn't know what was in it, but Tom Tom, it might be diamonds, dope, smuggled Chinese, or just plain money. So I went back to the hotel garage. Number 1279. Down. I climbed the long, curving ramp to the second floor and found the Number canary yellow De Anza convertible crowded in behind four ranks of cars at the rear of the building. I started to work on it. Nothing in the luggage trunk, nothing under the seats, under the upholstery, and the door panels, nothing anywhere. Then I got Tiny Stover, and the two of us went over the second time. Ah, uh, it's a cold lead, Sam. It's not, I know it's not. Now, think, Tiny, what's different about this car? Well, solider built than most, good body of work. I don't know. Hey, here's something. What? There's a hole punched out of this fender over here. About the size of a quarter. Let me see that. Yeah, right here. It curves under, see? Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. What's that you got? Sound bracelet. Did you say this dangle on here was what was cut out of that fender? Let me see. It fits. Fits even the curve. Yeah. What does it mean, Sam? The dangle on the bracelet is solid platinum. Hey, Sam, are you trying to tell me the fender's on this heap of solid platinum? You got a pocket knife, Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Yeah, it shines. Sam, is this a hot car? <laughs> I didn't answer him. I didn't have to. He looked in the gray-white gleam of the bracelet shine with a square of paint I'd scraped off the fender and answered the question himself. Meech's convertible was convertible in more ways than one. It was about the hottest car in San Francisco as of that moment. After I'd left the garage, I tried to phone Tom Tom, but he wasn't in. I had an uncomfortable feeling he was out looking for me. He was. As I stepped out of the phone booth, there was a rush of air past my left ear. A knife stuck in the wood less than an inch west of him. Came out in the street in time to see him duck around the corner into an alley. I ran after him. I called him and stood him up against the wall. Let me go. Let me go. I cut you down. What do you know about that car? What do you know about that car? Come on, talk. You get more of this. I don't know nothing. They don't tell me nothing. Where's Meech? I don't know. Meech don't know nothing either. Only Tom Tom and... Tom Tom and who else? I don't talk no more. They cutting you in? I don't need no cut. The boss, he pays me good. Forty pesos. Sometimes more. Work for me and I'll cut you in. I cut you to pieces. The boss treats me good. Sure, you do all the dirty work. There's any trouble, you'll take the rap. What means rap? They put you in a little room and squirt gas in you. You fall dead. Gas? Tom Tom do this? He does indeed. Venga. Come. I take you to see the man. Su nombre es Felix. I think he will be very happy to see you. The place Paco took me to was about as high on Russian Hill as you can get. The house was old, faced in brownstone, and had a high iron fence around it. On the gate was a nameplate, H.H. H. Lovelace. When I opened it to go in, I noticed that Paco was no longer with me. Oh, Mr. Spade, come in, come in. The gray-haired gentleman who greeted me was wearing a wing collar, a carnation, and a very distinguished air. 
I can hardly believe it, but he was definitely, beyond the shadow of a doubt, none other than the one and only Happy Herman Heap. Well, Mr. Spade, I see that you're surprised. I'm overwhelmed, uh, Mr. Heap. That lovely. Lovelace, that is the correct name. For my uh, avocation, I selected my first and second names, the H.H., you know. My full name is Herman Heath Lovelace. About that car, Mr. Spade. Uh, yeah, about that. I must own that you outwitted me. I was rather proud of my little device, the disc on the charm bracelet, you know. When you showed it to me at the uh, my business establishment, I naturally thought you were authorized to fix the car. Yeah, naturally. However, I'm not averse to enterprise in a young man. And I'm prepared to pay for my blunder. You said a million I still couldn't accept, Mr. Lovelace. Oh, why not? I was hired to recover that car for my client. It's not mine to sell. Well, it's certainly not hers. I don't care whose it is. All I know is that my client's life is in danger, and it has uh, something to do with that car. Miss Estrada? Yeah. Excuse me one moment. Please arrive. Hello, Papa. That's all she said. And she stood there looking at me in that way that made you not care who she was double-crossing or why. And she turned to uh, Lovelace, alias Herman Heap. How much does he know? Alas, everything, I fear. He has agreed to our terms? Yes. Good. I must have my bracelet back now, Sam. Sure, it's right here in my... I reached in my coat pocket for the charm bracelet she'd given me to keep for. It wasn't there. It wasn't any of my pockets. I guessed that it was in one of Paco's pockets. Mitya watched me, fumbling, her eyes blazing with anger. Fool, you have lost it. We are helpless without that. I thought it was the car you wanted. Please, please, one thing at a time. I suggest that we first gain possession of the car. Yes, Lovelace, you are right. First, the car. Ah, yes. This is the car at last. A princess in vulgar raiment, but still a princess. No royal coach carrying a king to a coronation ever held such riches. I just talk too much. Oh, I do. Well, take your place at the wheel, Mitchell. We shall drive out of here into a splendid future. Uh, after you, Mr. Spade. No, no, Mr. Heath. After you. Uh, yeah. uh, ironic, isn't it, that with all my varied interests, I've never learned to drive a car. That are too buckle, Viejo. You uh, seem kind of shaky, Mitchell. You sure you can handle a car down the ramp? I'm a very good driver, Waffle. Misha, stop! Put on your brakes. There's a man coming up the ramp. He was dead before I got to him. As I leaned over him, I saw the bracelet lying beside his hand. I picked it up and walked back to the car. Nietzsche and Herman Heap Lovelace were sitting in stony silence, glaring at each other. Is he dead? Yeah. Was the bracelet on him? I didn't look. Lovelace, go and frisk him. Oh, must I? It's, it's very distasteful to me. Uh, come, Mr. Spade. You fool. We trust this detective. Go on. Very well. Get in, Sam. Get in. We leave him here. What's the matter? Is something wrong? Oh, uh, nothing at all. Come back here. This is an outbreak. I didn't make... Come back here, I say. <laughs> Papa, a cigarette. Sure, sure. Here you are. Gracias. De nada. <laughs> I, um, I saw you pick up the bracelet. I meant that you should share with me. That is why I gave you the bracelet in the first place. I liked you. Couldn't have been because you were safe as long as Tom Tom didn't know where the bracelet was, and if you had to kill somebody for it, it would be me. Please, Carita, what does it matter now? We are together, we have the car, we have the bracelet, and the pig is dead. That's what worries me. Oh, surely you do not think I meant to kill him. Of course not. Your foot just slipped, you stepped in the gas by accident. Yes, yes, that was you. It won't stick, sweetheart. Not with me. But with the police? My story won't help you. I don't know enough. Oh? Then I tell you everything. I was with Tom Tom for a year. I hated him 365 days. I tried to run away. Always that Paco came out and brought me back. Then, Senor Lovelace came with the car. Senor Lovelace had much money, but he could not take it from the country. So he bought... 
sold platinum. Some he received from refugees who had sent their fortunes abroad in that form. But there was no safe way to get it across the border. So for a cut time, Tom had the platinum made into fenders and welded onto the car. Why was the bracelet so important? It was too dangerous for Lovelace to bargain directly. Tom Tom was to get the money for the platinum and give the little piece of the fender as a token. Yeah. Lovelace would know who to give the car to when they showed it to him. That's why he let me drive the car off a lot, huh? <laughs> I don't care, darling, even if you tried to steal it. Now we understand each other, no? You are tough, too. Tougher than Tom Tom, I think. Well, uh... Now we have everything for ourselves, you and me. What do we care for the others, huh? You make a good pitch, sweetheart. You look beautiful while you're making it. But I don't like you driving. What do you mean? Pull over. I'm driving this heat back to the city. No. I said pull over. I won't let you do it. I don't care what happens. Take it easy. You want to kill us both? Sure, I will kill us both. We die together or we live together. Yes or no? You're not. Answer me. The answer is no. Well, no, you will see I mean what I say. <laughs> fog thinned out just as we rounded a bend in the road. There was a point ahead with a sheer 300-foot drop to the sea. She jerked the car away from the pavement and steered straight at it. I grabbed the wheel and twisted it. The car skidded on gravel and slid sideways toward the cliff. I got the door open and tried to yank her out with me. She held on and kicked me until I rolled free. It didn't look very beautiful when I saw her for the last time. And the flashy convertible was a pile of junk. Very expensive junk, but junk all the same. I understand the federal men have confiscated the platinum and are holding Lovelace for questioning. I doubt if he'll crack. Nobody can embarrass a used car salesman. Period. End of report. Sam, do you really like this racket we're in? I hate it. So do I. But don't let ever go into any other racket. It's a promise, sweetheart. Why, I'll never know. I'll meet you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, was written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Tonight's program was directed by Elliot Lewis. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, I got it. Got what, my pet? A bank book, Sam. Well, you must advertise in the lost and found right away, Effie, and find the owner. There might be sickness in the family. Oh, but it's your bank book, Sam. What? Uh Uh-huh, it has your name on it. Samuel Spade, account number four. It's a forgery. Somebody's trying to pin something on me. Lock it up and don't touch it until I get there. Oh, all right. Did you make a lot of money on this one, too? Got the check right in my pocket, 500 bucks. Oh, Sam, we're making more money than a movie star. Well, almost. And all honestly, too. (laughs) 600 last week and 500 this week. Yeah, how about that? And life gives a three-page spread to I Spy Molten. But uh, we mustn't let it turn our heads, Effie. No. We gotta stay in there pitching. I'll be right down to pitch my report on the Adam Fig caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You've heard the saying, you never know until you try. Well, you'll never know how handsome your hair can look until you try Wild Root Cream Oil. See for yourself how neatly and naturally Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair. 
Note how effectively it relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. You can get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic in either the big economy-sized bottle or the handy tube. Or you can ask your barber to use it on your hair. But by all means, try it. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Love it. Well, we got to watch these expenses, Effie. You know, there's always something. Yes, but this will be saving. It saves confusion and saves fretting. Mm-hmm. Now, this gadget here, what is it? It's a mineral robot. <laughs> a what about? It's for busy men like yourself, Sam, so you don't have to burden your mind with petty details. You see, it has this dial on it, right here. And you drop these little cards in this slot. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about that. That's for me to take care of. Oh, good. Then, when you come into the office, and supposing you have an appointment with Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock, and you forgot about it, you just dial 2 o'clock, and the little card pops out. And it says, Mr. Jones on it. How do I remember to dial 2 o'clock? Oh. Well, maybe it's in the instruction book. But anyway, now go ahead, Sam, please. The card's right in there. Now, dial 2 o'clock. Go on, Sam. Let's see, uh... Just like a telephone, Sam. Mm-hmm. Now what do I do? Well, give it time, Sam. It's thinking. Must have forgotten. Uh, Jones. Mr. Jones. Mm-hmm. Effie, do you think it's dead? Sam, I don't understand it. It was working perfectly. Well, I'll take it straight back first thing in the morning. You'll have to. It'll never find the way itself. You got your book, sweetheart? Yes, Sam. I, I don't understand. It was working perfectly. Well, that's all right, ago. honey. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Date October 5, 1947, to Hillary Exxon Esquire from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Oh, oh, honey, it's only a memo robot. <laughs> Subject the Adam Fig Caper. Dear Mr. Exxon. October 2nd in San Francisco was one of those days that you see blown off the calendar by a gust of wind in the movies to denote the time is passing. It was a day for scraping off the minutes with a fingernail file and wondering whether the display ad I'd paid for in the classified section of the phone book wasn't just a waste of money. It certainly wasn't the day I'd expect a leprechaun to walk into my office. He uh, said his name was Adam Fake. He said he was the butler at Exxon Manor in Los Nidos. The limousine, Mr. Spade, is waiting to take you away. We mustn't keep them waiting, must we? Of course we mustn't. Uh, who mustn't we? Why, Mr. Hillary, of course, sir. Oh, Mr. Hillary. And old Mr. Exxon. Mm. The old gentleman is very ill. Uh, Dr. Feige's office is down the hall. Turn to your right, second door. Well, I assure you, sir, that Mr. Exxon is the best of medical care. Your duty will be simple, to prevent his death. Uh, do I donate blood or just frighten away the evil spirits? Oh, it isn't quite that, sir. Someone is trying to kill Mr. Exxon. He's a very sick man, and I'm sure he'd prefer dying from natural causes. Uh-huh. I get $25 a day in expenses. Uh, here is an ample amount in advance, sir. But you should know, sir, that the old man is a nasty, cantankerous, villainous, crooked, insidious... $500? Please, Fig, you're talking about the man I love. (laughs) Los Nidos was at least an overnight caper, so on my way out, my lovely and charming secretary, Miss Perrine, handed me a brown paper bag which contained A, one pair of socks, darned, B, one shirt, ironed, and C the apple which she always polishes for me the night before. We arrived at your large southern-style mansion two hours later. Fig! Oh, Fig, where the devil have you been? To the city, sir. I can't find the keys to the liquor closet. Where are all the maids? What happened to that cook we hired yesterday? Who is this man, and why is he wearing that necktie? This is Mr. Spade, sir, the detective. Oh, oh, uh, I'm Hillary Exxon. Come in, come in, please. Go on upstairs, Fig. See what that girl is doing to my father. I don't believe she's a nurse at all. Very good, sir. In here, Mr. Spade. Pardon the condition of the house. The old man has been firing the servants again. Your father, you mean? Yes, yes. Every time he gets shot at, he fires all the servants. He gets shot at pretty often? About once a year. In the fall. Mm -hmm. You always hire a detective? Uh, No. 
Oh, dear. I'm not keeping you up, am I? No, no, excuse me, please. It's, it's much worse this time. I can't get any sleep. Guns going off in the middle of the night. The whole household disturbed. When and where was he last shot at? Yesterday morning at about half past one. I dug the bullet out of the woodwork myself, a thirty-eight caliber, embedded in the door frame that leads to Miss Kaywood's room. Oh, oh that, uh, that's his nurse. Was she with him at the time? No. No, Dad sleeps like a baby, full of sedatives, she sees to that. Shot come from outside? Yes, yes, but we found nobody on the grounds, no traces of anybody. I don't know whether Dad knows who shot at him or not. He's such a closed mouth old devil. You don't uh, care very much for your father, do you? To be frank, Mr. Spade, if hating weren't such an effort, I would despise him. He is without a doubt... Well, listen, listen. There, there, that's just a sample. Well, come on, come on, let's see what's eating him now. Mr. Rexall, I can't stand it another minute. Yelling, screaming, throwing things at you. You must have done something to set him off. But I didn't, I tell you, oh. I didn't. This is Mr. Spade, Miss Kaywood. Oh, a detective. Oh. Will it make you happier to know that I'm a private detective, uh, Miss Kaywood? Well, Mr. Spade, I only hope you can prevent a murder. If there's any way at all that I can help, I... Thanks, I... I'll uh, see you downstairs after I've talked to the old man. You'd better go in alone, Spade. Oh, Miss Kaywood, <clears throat> do you have a throat spray downstairs? I seem to be congested. Wasting ammunition. Well, who are you? If you're a total stranger, come on in. Well, don't be afraid, son. Come on over where I can look at you. Uh, it's uh, hard to keep my eyes open. Oh, oh, I mustn't do that. Mustn't do that. Oh, so you're the detective, eh? That's right, Pop. If you want to take a little nap or something, I'll come back later. Uh, oh, 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 what did I say just now? Come back later? No, 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 no. There's no reason for you to come back later. I'll say everything I have to say right now. The shot woke me. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. I've got a million enemies. I can't remember the names of any of them. Why don't you try to remember? I could have them checked. You're oh, wasting your time, Sonny. In my day, I've wiped out a hundred men, and I'll outlive anybody who's gunning for me now. You must be proud of your past, huh? Proud? Uh, Sonny... A past like mine is the finest thing an old man can have. I've swindled my partners and betrayed my friends. I've turned state's evidence just <coughs> to see my associate get sent up for 20 years. And they say my wife died under peculiar circumstances and I got rich off her insurance. Now I'm done talking. <coughs> uh, oh, do me a favor, son, please. I've got to get a half hour, 20 minutes sleep alone. You'll keep them out, everybody. Please, will you? Please. Sure, sure, Pop. Uh, go ahead, go on, sleep. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's it. He closed his eyes, rolled over, and fell into a heavy sleep. I stood there a moment, looking down at the frail, wasted old body. Then I cased the room. In digging the bullet out of the door, Hillary had done a good job of ruining any chance there might have been of proving the direction it had come from. I strolled out on the balcony. It was a pretty night. I lit a cigarette and took it in. Then I heard the door open and close softly behind me. Nurse Kaywood was at your father's bedside. She was filling a hypodermic from a small vial of bluish liquid. He didn't awaken when she jabbed it into his arm. Then she saw me standing in the doorway. She hastily dropped the medicine vial into her uniform pocket and came around the bed to meet me. Oh, oh Mr. Spade, oh, thank heaven, I... Why, when I saw you standing there in the half-night, I thought you might be... Thought the... I was who? Why, the, the man who fired the shot. It was a man? I, well, I don't know. I, I didn't see it happened. I just oh, assumed that... Me... You shouldn't have done it. I warned you, of, uh, Eleanor. Oh, uh, we're, di we're disturbing him. Let's you talk outside. Okay. Oh, it's good to breathe something besides sick room air. I thought you got used to things like that in your profession. Why are you so unfriendly, Mr. Spade? Nurses are human, aren't detectives? Try me, sweetheart. Oh, I know what you're thinking of me. But after a week in this horrible house, that, that poor old man, he's frightened. He's really frightened. What of? By, by the shots. Thirty-eight caliber or hypodermic? Surely you don't think that I... He's supposed to be under sedatives. The, the doctor's orders... Sorry, but... sweetheart. It's my job to suspect everybody. Can't you forget your job? 
even for a moment. Sure. Sure, if you don't mind the fact that I know you're a liar, that I'd make book you didn't come here primarily as a nurse, and what's worse, your act's not even convincing. Oh. Is it that bad, Sam? Yeah. Almost bad enough to be good. Come here. Oh, I hate you. It was a very satisfactory love scene for both of us. For reasons of her own, Barbara wanted to keep me out of that sick room for a while, and she did. For reasons of my own, I wanted to get that medicine file out of her uniform pocket, and I did. Then, as suddenly as we had fallen into love, we fell out again. After she'd gone to her room, I went back to my sentry duty around the house. Under a light on the front veranda, I examined the bottle from which Barbara had taken the injection for your father. It was labeled sodium thanatol and had been dispensed by a firm called Ibis Chemicals Limited in Cairo, Egypt. The screen filled the house, high and frenzied. I started running toward Barbara Kaywood's room. I slammed the terrace door open and found the light switch. Barbara was sitting upright in the center of a bed. Her face jerked up so abruptly that it seemed her neck had snapped. She clutched both hands to her chest and fell face down among the bedclothes, staining them with her blood. I don't know whether I went through, over, or around the screen that stood between her room and the old man's. I circled Exxon's bed. He lay on the floor on his side facing the window. I went outside. A 38 automatic lay on the ground a few yards away from the building. I put that into my pocket and listened. No shadows moving. Nothing. Then he was on me before I could be sure he wasn't a medium-sized tree. Oh, uh, break your back. Be the light. The warm stuff on my cheek might have been the thing's blood or mine. It gathered me up and bent me back and tore at my throat. <laughs> then I remembered that hands are stronger than fingers. I started with his thumbs. <laughs> he lay there for a moment. Then his huge body began to twitch. He was holding his fingers and sobbing like a baby. I pulled him up to his feet and poked him in the back with the flat of my hand. I followed him through an opening in the hedges and down a long, pitch-dark lane toward the lights of a squat brick house set on the top of a slight rise. As we approached it, a door opened and light streamed out onto the porch. The tall man framed in the doorway was the last person in the world I expected to see. Ah, oh, Marcus, you brought him. Oh, master, very delightful service, but have much pain in fingers. Always <laughs> complaining, Marcus. Welcome, Mr. Spade. Come in, my dear fellow. Come in. I've been expecting you. Tell me, fortune. By, 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 uh, 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 blackmailing me. <laughs> and if you don't uh, remit, Exxon could have you booked for forgery, uh, blackmail, definition of character. Oh, my, uh... my, my dear fellow, please. This, this, this is most painful. But if I had but the, the original letter, I could destroy it and go back to the felt. Ah, oh, the felt. What happened to it? Well, that fig, that, 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 that stinker stole it. He burgled my home. Are you uh, taking pot shots at old Exxon? Well, don't be a fool, man. I want Exxon to stay alive. I must find out some part of his life which will have an exchange value that will cancel out what he has on me. Oh, by the way, old thing, uh, you met Miss Kaywood. Mm-hmm. At the present moment, she's milking me for $150 a day. Oh? She's supposed to go to the old man, by whatever means necessary, into talking about his past. And that information she is to bring to me. Well, that ought to be easy. Exxon brags about his past. Now, so far, I have learned that Hillary Exxon stole two heifers of the livestock show in Abilene in 1906. <laughs> I feel for you, Captain. I wouldn't get much on the uh, current market, would it? My dear fellow, I have a, I have a proposition to make to you. Should you ferret out anything that would be of value to me, I'll reward you handsomely. Well, maybe something can be arranged, Captain. Good, excellent. May I have your word on that? Well, there isn't much time, Captain. I'd uh, better trot on back. I'll show you to the door, sir. And let me warn you, Mr. Spade, for your own good, should you ever hear the thrum of Ibis wings, run, flee. <laughs> I assured him that I would heed his warning, bade him good night, and started back down the lane in the direction of Axon Manor. Business was going on as usual. There were no shots this time, only the screen. When I got to Barbara's room, you and Adam were standing at a bedside trying to quiet her down. Well, Mr. Spade, is this the way you guard the house against intruders? 
Where have you been? Ask Adam. What does he mean by that thing? I'm sure I don't know, sir. I've not left the house. What happened here? Oh, she woke up screaming. She said someone had come into the room and torn off her bandages. A nightmare, of course. Please, I want to talk to Mr. Spade alone. Oh, please, please go. Adam, you go, too. Please, Hillary, you go, too. Good. Some questions I want to ask you, sweetheart, alone. Herbert, look here, Spade, look here. She just had a terrific shock. She shouldn't be qu- uh, questioned. Well, the, the code of detective transcends that of the medical, Mr. Hillary. Huh? Perhaps he should have a few minutes alone with Miss Kaywood. Oh, very well, very well. I, I suppose he's no best. Uh, remember what the doctor said, Miss Barbara. Not too much exertion. What happened, Barbara? Well, it, it could have been a dream. Somebody was standing over me in the darkness and peering down at me. And then he started to rip off my bandages and I screamed. And when Fig came into the room and, and he turned on the lights, he was gone. It, it could have been a dream, Sam, and I, I could have been clawing at the bandages myself in, in my sleep. But you weren't. It wasn't a dream. I've been talking to Captain Sherry. And then I thought... Oh, oh well, how much do you know? That you've been feeding the old man truth serum to get him to talk in his sleep. Oh. How much talking has he done? Well, plenty. How much have you told Sherry? Well, just as little as possible. Why? Because, Sam, if, if we can keep that old man alive and out of jail long enough to sell what we know to Sherry for what it's really worth, we'd be fools not to do it. What makes you so sure you'll stay alive long enough to collect, sweetheart? Well, because you're going to help me, aren't you, Sam? <laughs> So I helped her, but not for the reason she thought. I made a lot of noise leaving her room and going to mine. Going back, I didn't wear any shoes. I slipped into a clothes press in her room so quietly that even she didn't hear me. I left the door slightly ajar and waited. Time passed, and I was stiff from standing still. It happened at about 3 a.m. The feverish glare of his eyes told me that the threat of the gun in my hands meant nothing to him. I jumped to his side, twisted the knife away from him, picked him up in my arms, and carried him, kicking, clawing, and swearing, back to his bed. He lay there, breathing hard. Then he smiled. You're a smart one, Sonny. You had me figured out the first time you came in here, didn't you? Not quite, Mr. Rexon. The gun under your window was the clincher. <laughs> that gun? Sure. I had it under my pillow all the time. I got tired of shooting into door frames. Look, you're dying, Mr. Rexon. There's no use trying to make up stories now. <laughs> you're right, son. I knew that nurse would sit up in bed after I fired tonight. And then I let her have it right through the screen. Why? You know why well enough. She was doping me up and sneaking in here at night. Listening to what I was babbling about. Maybe you weren't saying anything important, Mr. Rexon. I might have, Sonny. I might have. Fourteen years ago, I killed my wife. I wanted to carry the secret to my grave. <laughs> you nearly made it at that. The spade! What's happened? Is he dead? He's dead. Did he say anything, sir? Did he confess anything? You must tell me if he said anything. I didn't hear him say a word. Ah, well. Hmm. Yeah, Mr. Spade. Charged with a certain texture, a significant quality. There's a certain smell, yes. Ah, an omen. You can inhale it, sir. Journey thou to Nairobi on the felt. Tarry seven days, and you will collect the fabulous golden skull of Wizami, king of the Bojamas. Aha! Marcus! Yes, Master. Unhook the hooker! Pack the marmalade! We are off to the felt! <laughs> Just then, a flock of birds broke across the horizon, screaming. There must have been thousands of them, but not ibis, Mr. Exxon. Vultures. I suppose if you're going to pay any attention to omens, it's a good thing to know your birds. Period. End of report. Right now, I have something to say to every man who doesn't use a hair tonic, to every man who says, I don't believe in it or I don't need it. That all depends on what you mean when you say hair tonic. 
If you mean the old-fashioned greasy kind that leaves your hair smelling like a perfume factory, you're absolutely right. But remember, Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic is nothing like that. Wild Root Cream Oil is an entirely new kind of hair grooming preparation. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin that's like the oil of your skin. Most important, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally, never leaves your hair sticky or greasy. Get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube that's economical, easy to pack when you travel, and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay, get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, I see we... Uh, Sam! The memo robot worked after all. I told you it would. Yeah, it just takes a little time, sweetheart. Oh, read the card, Sam. Now, you see? You'd know you were supposed to see Mr. Jones at 2 o'clock. Isn't it wonderful? Well, this card doesn't even mention Jones. Huh? What does it say, Sam? Well, it says, uh, Journey Vow to Friskin's Drugstore, wager $5 on Ira W. in the third at Belmont Park. Oh, Sam, it's psychic. Tarry but a moment. Yes? Thou wilt lose five bucks. Oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Hello, sweetheart. It's only me. Oh, why so modest? Women, Effie. Age cannot weather nor custom stale their infinite variety. Huh? Against their incalculable wiles, mere man is a leaf in the wind. Oh, Sam, do you really... Oh. Who was she and how windy was it? Cyclonic, Effie. We had to close every window in the house. But I... If you will just contain your natural feminine curiosity for a few moments, I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bow window caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. To every man who says, I don't use a hair tonic, or I don't believe in a hair tonic, I say this. Decide for yourself, but don't decide until you've tried Wild Root Cream Oil, the entirely different hair tonic. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root Cream Oil, and it contains soothing lanolin. What's more, it grooms your hair the right way, neatly and naturally. So get the big economy size bottle and the handy new tube at your drug or toilet goods counter. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. What's the 
bow window. Hmm? A bow window. A uh, bow window is a bay window that you look into instead of out of. Look into instead of out? Oh. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Get your book, Panther Girl, and slink on in. She's trying to see through the, the, the bow window. Hmm? I mean, whose house was it? Her own. But if it was her own house, then why would she... Well, it just at... goes to show you, darling, what some women will stoop to. It does? Mm-hmm. There was a low window. Oh. Well, whenever you're ready, Sam. <sighs> uh, date, November 10th. Ninth. Ninth. Uh, correct. 1947. To Dr. Helmut Reese. I was right for once. Yeah. <laughs> From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bow window caper. Dear Dr. Reese, I know that this report will not make pleasant reading for you, but you paid for it, so here it is. As far as I was concerned, it all started on Thursday morning when you called at my office. From your story, I gathered it had been going on for some time. You... You will say these are merely the actions of a jealous woman, Mr. Spade. But I assure you there's more to it than that. It is, it, it, it must be a carefully thought out plan to ruin my career, my, my whole life. In uh, what way, Dr. Reese? She spies on my private consultations. Insults my women patients. I can no longer even keep a nurse for more than a week at a time. Scenes, hysterics, she outbursts of violence. I cannot continue my work under such conditions. Well, why don't you give her a divorce? Why, no, 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 no. This is not her desire. If it were, it would, be, it would be simple. No, she wants to bring me to ruin. She wants to see me on my knees in front of the pocket. Why? That is what I want to find out. Why? Doctor, I think you ought to take this case to a head doctor. I have consulted a psychiatrist. The examiner. She's perfectly competent mentally. So you see, there is here already some mystery. For which one comes to a detective. Uh, how long has this been going on, Dr. Reed? Since three months only. But in this time, she has reduced me to utter desolation. Dr. Reese was a very good divorce lawyer right down the hall from my office. No, no, no. I discussed the matter of a divorce with her a few days back. This was her answer. Uh, you see, a receipt for the purchase of a gun and this note in her handwriting. I hope you will not force me to use this. Esther. Yes. Well, what do you think she has in mind? Murder or suicide? She refused to discuss it. But one thing I have noticed. Since she has bought this gun, a new development, a strange man watches my house. Several times I have caught him following me. Well, she might have hired a detective to check on whether you visit a lawyer. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps it is very simple, but it is all too strange to be harmless. <laughs> I uh, half-heartedly agreed that it might be, Dr. Reese, and when your check for 100 bucks didn't bounce, I went to work wholeheartedly. I reached your house on Pacific Avenue just as the street lights were going on. It's a quiet neighborhood, so I could hear it before I got close enough to read the number on the door. Get out! Get out of this house! Get out! You have no... They seemed to be slugging their way toward the back of the house, so I decided to risk an entrance. I found the doorbell, and I was about to punch it when I caught sight of your mystery man. He was crouched in a clump of shrubbery that grew under the bow window at the corner of the house. He was still there with his eyes glued to the window when I walked up behind him. Hey, let go of me. Let go. Come on, come on. You're going inside. Listen, I'm not just a snooper. I'm I only... didn't say you were. I'm just inviting you inside for a better look. Now, I'm warning you, if you don't let go of me, I'm... Stop squirming, will you? Let go! Oh! The kick he landed on me wasn't according to the wrestling association's rules, but I let him get away with it, mainly because I couldn't move for three or four minutes, and by that time, he disappeared down the street. When I recovered my faculties and staggered back to the door, I didn't bother ringing the bell. I just walked in. The hen fight was still going on somewhere in the upper reaches of the house. Then a door burst open on the upper landing, and a girl in a nurse's uniform ran down the stairs toward me... Pursued by a pale little woman with a pinched face who was brandishing a pair of brass fire tongs. You brushed past me, Dr. Reese, and headed off the pursuer. Esther, stop it! Stop it at once! Have you gone crazy? Give me those fire tongs! Give them to me! What's the matter, Helmut? Afraid I'll mar your light of love's beauty? What started this? I caught her creeping about the kitchen. kitchen. She was going to poison my food. Explain to you, Mrs. Reese. The doctor... Oh, don't, don't, don't bother explaining, Miss Robbins. 
Miss Morbid fancies of hers. Don't think I don't know what goes on in that office. That office where I'm not allowed anymore. That's only because you make the patient so nervous, Esther. I know what goes on. You and those women. That will do, Esther. Go to your room. Very well. But I won't have that woman in this house another day, Helmut. Is that understood? Go to your room, Esther. I'm going. I'm going. But remember what I said. I warned you both. I can't. There, there, Miss Swabbins. Now don't. There. I can't stand anymore, Doctor. I tell you, it's making me a nervous <clears throat> wreck. I just... Uh, Dr. Reese, I... huh? Oh, Mr. Spade. You saw, you heard? Yeah. Uh, uh, come into my office. We'll talk. I think we'd better. Uh, doctor, there's still one more patient waiting to see you, Doctor. Well, just uh, have her wait a little longer. Uh, uh, this, this way, Mr. Spade. Oh, the doctor way. will see you just as soon as he possibly can. Have you been feeling any better, Mrs. Turnbull? Uh, sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks, but I can say what I have to say standing. Your wife's a very tragic woman, Doctor. Uh, I wish I could help her. I wish I could help you, too. But I can't. You heard her threat against Miss Robbins. Was that a joke? There's nothing funny about jealousy. Uh, but there is this man who watches the house... The gun she bought. I collared him outside just now. Oh, well, did you get him to talk? No, but I wouldn't worry about him if I were you. And about that gun, the Constitution says every citizen shall have the right to bear arms. Even Parnell Thomas can't do uh, that. Mr. Spade, I have not yet told you all. If I... Oh, Doctor, I'm, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but this patient, she's been waiting for more than an hour. Well, who, who is she? Mrs. Cavanaugh. Cavanaugh? Cavanaugh, who? Well, has she been here before? Of course, last week. Here, here's her card. Oh, oh yes, yes. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd better get it over. Uh, send her in. Yes, Doctor. And, and Doctor, I'm resigning. I'll finish the day, of course, and, and then I'm through. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, yes, well. Very well, Miss Robbins. I, I, I can't say that I blame you. Good luck. Goodbye, Doctor. Well, I'll be going along myself now, Doctor. Uh, no, 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 no. You must hear me out, Mrs. Spade. I have not yet told all. If now, if you'll just wait until I have seen this patient, uh, please, Mr. Spade, please. Okay, I'll wait outside. Oh, I beg your pardon. I beg yes. your... Uh, c come on in, Mrs. Spade. So, uh, you're leaving the doctor's employ, uh, nurse? I am, I am. Well, Mr. Spade, how does it look from the grandstand? Messy? Mm-hmm. You don't mind if I finish cleaning out his desk? Go right ahead. Thank you. What's the matter with Esther, anyway? Oh, I could sum the whole thing up in a single five-letter word, shall I? You have. Are you going to walk out on him? Aren't you? Yes. Yes, I am. Oh, but Esther isn't jealous of your type, if you don't mind my mentioning it. I feel heartened to think that you noticed I was different. Oh, I did, Mr. Spade. I really did. You don't seem uh, particularly nursey to me, either. I'm not. My, you have a fast pulse, Mr. Spade. Uh, yes, I've uh, been feeling very weak the last few minutes. I uh, need care. Oh, you know, you don't eat enough apples, Mr. Spade. Well, I guess I've finished up. There's that old contact. I wonder... Mr. Spade, will you tell the doctor I've left and thank him for me again? Aren't you going to see him before you go? No, no, I'm not. He'd only beg me to stay, and it's... Well, it's simply out of the question. Oh, the poor guy. I just don't know what I'd do if I were in his place. For you, Mr. Spade. <laughs> I did, and I told her. She told me I was a victim of hypertension and left me with my mouth open and no thermometer in it. Five minutes after she'd gone out to the front entrance, your wife came down the stairs looking knowingly at me in the door to the doctor's office and left by the same route. Ten minutes after that, I was halfway through a 1937 National Geographic that was the latest edition on the waiting room table, and it reached the third paragraph on the natural beauties of Winona County, Minnesota. But I never finished it. I will be back in First thing I saw when I entered the room was Mrs. Cavanaugh, your patient patient. Why? Why did she do it? You, doctor, were standing over her, nervously twitching off the rubber glove from your right hand. 
It tested her throat for pulse, then listened through a stethoscope. It was purely a formality. One of the 38 caliber slugs had entered the right temple. The other had torn through the base of the skull. How did it happen? I, I don't know. I had completed the examination and walked over there to put my instruments away. When I turned... When I turned back, she had a gun in her hand. Before I could stop her, she pulled the trigger. Suicide, of course. Why? Well, I just told her the truth, that there was nothing I or any other doctor could do for her. That she had perhaps a month, perhaps less. She had suffered great pain, of course, for some time. Uh -huh. You saw her shoot herself, you say? Yes, yes. The gun, she took it out of my desk drawer. I'd removed it from my wife's room earlier today. I see. Well, doctor, this is the neatest suicide I ever saw. No powder burns, and from the way she's lying, she must have shot herself in the direction of that window, at least ten feet away. She screamed before the shots were fired and had time to fire a second bullet into her head and throw the gun across the room before she fell. Well, Helma, at last it's happened, hasn't it? Esther, leave this room. I told Helma one of the husbands would catch up with him. Pretty, wasn't she? I don't remember this one. The expression on your face might have been horror or fear or both, Dr. Reese. But your wife was smiling. When my eyes left her face, I noticed a leaf clinging to the hem of her coat. It might have come from the shrub that grew up against the house. And her shoes were splashed with mud that could have and probably did come from the cultivated flower bed just outside the bow window. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder, it gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. <laughs> Now, back to the bow window caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Obviously, there were two equally good suspects in the Kavanaugh murder. Either your wife had killed her in a jealous rage, or you'd killed her with your wife's gun to frame her for the murder. I decided to let the police worry it out and went home to bed. The morning headlines were a bit of a surprise. Nurse sought in shooting a mystery woman. Item. The cops had found Celeste Robbins' fingerprints all over the murder gun. And item. Mrs. Cavanaugh, the murdered woman, had given a vacant lot as her address, and her body was lying unclaimed at the morgue. I decided to pay her a visit. Maxie, hey, Maxie. Hey, my boy. Hey, it's good to look on you. How are you, Maxwell? Oh, fine, fine. What brings you here, Sam? The Kavanaugh woman. The Kavanaugh? Oh, Kavanaugh, huh? Well, uh, let's see who's with us today. Uh, Stiftel, Milton, Schwartz, Kelly. I knew him. Nice guy. Feige. Aha. Uh -huh. Kavanaugh. Rose. Hello, Rose. Hey, Sam, don't you want to look at Rose? No, I've seen her. Ah. Uh. Yeah, just checked her back in. Autopsy. Say, you do collect queer ones, Sam. Mm. Now, you take her. Why would anybody in the world knock her off? 
In her condition, all he needed to do was wait. A month, a couple of weeks. Bad as that, huh? Worse. Anybody claim her yet? Well, they... Hello. Something we can do for you? My name is Kavanaugh. I've come for my wife. He was standing with his back to me, and I didn't get a good look at his face until he walked over to the desk with Master. The voice tipped me even before I saw the face. It was the man I'd caught outside your office window less than half an hour before the murder. If he recognized me, he didn't let it show. I waited while he went in with Maxie. When he came out, there were tears streaming down his face. I'd been waiting for two reasons. I had had some questions to ask him, and I had wanted to pay back that jolt he'd given me the night before. I left without doing either. Oh, sweetheart, any calls? Lieutenant Dundee of Homicide, yeah. uh, Dr. Reese, mm-hmm. and there's a girl waiting inside. Wouldn't give any names. So you let her wait in my private office. Well, I don't think you'll mind when you've seen her. She's by way of being a knockout. Well, uh, thank you, Effie. That was uh, very thoughtful of you, huh? You're welcome, Sam. Sam, please, please don't be angry with me for coming here. I had to talk to somebody. What you need is a good criminal lawyer, Nurse Rodden. Oh, no. Oh, no. Do you think I killed that woman? How did your prince get on that gun? Now, don't tell me she threatened you with it and you grabbed it out of her hand. No, no, I didn't. I did nothing oh, oh, take at Take it easy, nurse. Take it easy. Would you like a drink or something? No, no. Thank you anyway. I'll, I'll be all right. Well, she came in from shopping three days ago. Just as nice as pie. And she came creeping around. You know how she is. And she said, I bought something today. It's lovely. And with that, she hauled this gun out of her handbag. And so, to humor her... I took it, and I looked at it. That was foolish. It certainly was foolish. Well, Nico played it. I deal with the fingerprints. And I remember she was wearing gloves. Struck me as peculiar at the time, but I'm, I'm so stupid. I didn't think of it until just now. Everything's a little peculiar about this caper. A woman who was dying anyway gets shot. Nobody even seems to know who she was. Doesn't make sense. No. No, it doesn't make much sense. But what should I do, Sam? Give myself up? I think you should. Yes, I thought you'd say that. All right, phone the police. You got a lot of courage. Sure you don't want to drink? No. No, thank you. I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Uh, homicide. Dundee. Uh, Dundee, Sam Spade. I got the Robbins girl here in my office. She wants to check in. Oh? Uh, well, tell her to forget it, Sam. Reese's wife just made a full confession. <laughs> That tore it. In my anxiety to see how you were bearing up under the shock, Doctor, I blew a buck and a half of your money on a taxi all the way out to your address on Pacific Avenue. To my astonishment, you were wearing a look of real distress. I I don't understand it, Mr. Spade. This confessing, it's it's not like her. It's all too strange to be harmless. Dr. Reeves, I'd like to talk to you alone. Do you mind, Mr. Spade? Go right ahead. I strained my ears outside your consulting room, but all I could hear was a few vague murmurs. Then, for no good reason, I decided to have a look at your wife's bedroom upstairs. The cops had been there before me, so I didn't expect to find much, and I didn't. I was tapping the woodwork for secret panels or something when I heard a heavy tread on the, on the stairway. I wheeled around, my hands inside my coat. A jolly-looking character in coveralls was standing in the doorway. Home electronics. I beg your pardon? You're hanging. Home electronics. <laughs> I come to take the equipment. What equipment? A dictograph. She don't need it no more. <laughs> hey, ask me, she hurt too much. Mrs. Reese had a dictograph installed? Yeah, her metal type installation. Yeah, this here's a speaker. <laughs> yeah, my own design. Looks like a portable radio, don't it? Yeah, where's the other end? Where's the uh, microphone? It's in the doc's private office. Uh, you interested, eh? Yeah, turn it on, will you? Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah, we'll get it tuned in a minute there. Uh... Oh, feedback. Wait a minute, I'll fix it. I don't know, but it's uncanny the way she knew nice, huh? things. Every word we spoke together. <laughs> That's because of the dictograph. They rig, huh? Shut up. We cannot allow this terrible tragedy to come between us. We love each other. Nothing can change that. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's as nice, ain't it? Quiet, quiet. I just know, please, please don't. Now, no, stop it, Helen. I don't want you to. Please, don't. What is it, Celeste? What has happened to Jane? What has happened? You ask that. When I've been attacked by a madwoman. 
woman and accused of murder all in the space of 12 hours. But it's all over now. Just so, Hilton. Yes, it's all over. Would you turn it up a little more? Sure, oh, sure, sure, sure. Oh, hold it, hold it. It's over. It's over. And I'm very, very ashamed. I suppose it was my usual thing. I always get sorry for a poor, weak man and, and get involved. But this time, I'm sorry for her. Celeste, so, yes, please. When I was a kid, I liked it. It used to make me feel powerful and, oh, to watch them squirm. But it's no fun anymore watching another woman in the agonies of jealousy. And you, I thought you were just weak. You're a brutal, unscrupulous murderer. Murder? What are you saying, sir? You killed Mrs. Cavanaugh. Why, that's, that's impossible. You stood deliberately in that window and you fired two shots right at Hey, what gives you? Why weren't my fingerprints on that gun? Because you were wearing your rubber gloves. Doctor. Celeste, don't say any more. No, no. Here, help me. Help me get his shirt off, Mr. Spain. You've been shot. Who shot him, you? Through the window, the same man, the one who watched the house. Hold, hold this tourniquet tight, please. Uh, it's nothing. A flesh wound. His aim was bad. Yeah. Too bad. Cavanaugh, you still out there? You got nothing to worry about. He's still alive. I missed him. Give me a hand. Come on. That's it. I missed him. That was lucky. You're taking the rap for your wife's murder, too, if you're a better shot. He did it. He killed my wife. I was at the window. I saw him. What I don't understand is why his wife confessed. She loves him, Mr. Cavanaugh. You should understand that. I guess that's what happens to love when it gets crossed up. Why didn't you tell the police what you saw? They'd have hung it on me. She... She was a stranger to everyone else. I'd been quarreling with her, suspicious, acting like a maniac. She never told me. She must have been going to one doctor after another, trying to find one that would give her one ray of hope. In pain all the time, too, and never letting on. Never. Even after that first visit she made to Reese's office, I didn't tumble. I, I thought she was meeting him on the sly. And I followed her both times. That last time I carried a gun. I might have killed her if what I suspected had been true. Uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Cavanaugh. I, I didn't realize. You're pretty late with your regrets, Doctor. I don't quite figure you either. Maybe the prison psychiatrist can. Dundee homicide. Uh, Dundee, tear up Mrs. Reese's confession. Come on over and get the doctor. Dr. Reese? Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, by the way, he accidentally shot himself in the arm. Isn't that right, Doctor? What? So. Oh. Yes, yes. Accident. Why didn't she tell me? Why didn't she tell me? I don't know, Kavanaugh. Women. Sometimes they make too much sense, or we don't make enough, or maybe we're all crazy. <laughs> And that, Dr. Reese, is the crop. At the risk of laboring a point, there's also the mystery of why a nice girl like Celeste Robbins ever fell for a guy like you. You'll have plenty of free time to think it over between now and the trial. If you find the answer, drop me a line. Period, and a report. You know, Sam, that, that Celeste, I like her. I wish we could do something for her. Well, I've already thought of that, Abby. Oh? What are you going to do, Sam? Write that up, sweetheart, and I'll write you a happy ending. Here's how you can find out whether the hair tonic you're using today is giving you what you ought to get in good grooming. Ask yourself, does my present hair tonic groom my hair neatly and naturally, or does it leave my hair sticky or greasy? And does it relieve dryness and remove loose dandruff, too, or does it do just a halfway job? Unless you can honestly say that your present hair tonic does all that for your hair, you owe it to yourself to try Wild Root Cream Oil right away. Try Wild Root Cream Oil and see for yourself how it improves your appearance. Grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. It's non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Get the big economy-sized bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and grand for the bathroom cabinet. Don't delay. Get it today. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here's the report, Sam. Do you want to read it over? I do not. File it under F. But forget. About that poor Celeste, Sam. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I made a date with Celeste to take her dancing tomorrow night. She uh, needs cheering up, you know. Well, what for? Well, you said she needed help. Well, that isn't exactly the kind of help I had in mind. Oh. I don't see why it's necessary Effie, to take... Effie, we must each of us give what particular kind of help each of us is particularly equipped to give. Very well. She wished to... She used to make over men just to get the other women jealous. That she did. 
Aren't other women silly to allow themselves to get jealous when they know just what she's up to? Idiotic. Just idiotic. Sure thing. And go home, Effie. I'm a lousy dancer. Oh, very well. Have fun, Sam. <laughs> Good night, Sam. <laughs> Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. This is Dick Joy, reminding you that next Sunday, author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanents. Mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Okay, okay, shall we? Some 
synchronize our watches. I skipped the elevator and walked downstairs to save time. It was 11 minutes after 4, last beer time, when I reached the entrance of the happy hour oyster and beverage bar. I turned and looked across the street. Hank Page was just stepping off the curb. He was jaywalking, but that didn't explain what happened. and jumped back out of the way. It saw him, too. The wheels cut sharply towards him, and the front buffer caught him just behind the knee. All right, all right. Keep moving there. Keep moving. Come on, come on. Back on the sidewalk. Come on, now. We'll take care of him. We'll take care of him. Damn. Damn, yeah, Hank. Yeah. Leave him be, Mr. Spade. Leave him be. I've got to get his safe. Come on, get these people back. This man's hurt bad. Give him some air. Better not try to talk, Hank. Oh, no. Thanks for close. 
Burroughs, but it only cost me two nickels and a pay telephone to find out where to take it. It was a small but solid-looking establishment on Montgomery. The gold lettering on the plate glass window said Van Pelton Meisner, commercial agent, Amsterdam, New York, San Francisco, Macassar, and Curacao. Gentlemen, here. I uh, want to see Mr. Meisner. There is no Mr. Meisner. There's only Van Pelt, and I'm Hendrik Van Pelt. I'm so sorry. Oh, don't say it like that. Maybe you can help me. What can I do with you? Well, uh, somebody paid me off for a job in Dutch money. I want to know how much it's worth. Oh, this better than Meisner, I know. The value of money. Show me, please. Ah. Maybe you'd like a cigarette, too. That's Dutch. Please. My brand, Sumatra Queen, thank you. No, the money. One hundred florins. I under the light look. Uh -huh. Here all number. Here is M. Quadrate clear is. Seal should color is. Paper. Paper excellent. Give it a change. What's it worth? Well, I look. Latest quotation is. Florin against the dollar. Uh huh. Yes. Fifty-three dollars, thirty-four cents. That's what the exchange fee taking out is. Uh, you like ten-dollar notes? I love them. You mean that money's real money? Who knows better than I should? Yeah. My brother was engraver to the Royal Dutch Treasury. <laughs> I myself in the manufactory was until the occupation coming was. <coughs> Pardon me. Would you mind saying that again, please? Uh, so in the manufactory from all kinds of money, including already currencies from the Indies, East and West, Java. Tel Aviv, Borneo, and Homeland, Netherlands. Yeah? Also, six months in Bulilong, Bali, where I'm English learning. <laughs> oh, you well, learned English? Several foreign languages. Uh, 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 well, I'll take it in ten. Uh, uh, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, one, two, three, and Nine cents and twenty cents. The right thing, yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, eventually... I spoke a little Dutch. Yes, uh, eventually you have lived in San Francisco for how long? Oh, uh, eventually quite some time. Oh, uh, I'm Hendrik Van Pell. How are you? How do you do? Yes, I, I, I know this on the cigarette case. You have the same initial, H.P. <laughs> uh, who your name is, please? Uh, uh Paul House, uh, Herman Paul House. Oh. In a pole house, you know, I, I like that cigarette case. <laughs> With the coincidence, you sell me your Dutch money. <laughs> Maybe also sell me the cigarette case with the Dutch cigarette. You like those cigarettes? Oh, I love that Sumatra Queen. You can have them for nothing. No, no, such a pity to remove them from the beautiful case. They go together, cigarettes and the case. How, how much? What would you say it's worth? Well, that's good gold. Five hundred dollars? What do you pay? Eh? Nothing. I took it out of a dead body. Get out! Get out of the grave, Robert! Help! Police! Stop me! Okay, Help. okay, Mr. Van Pelt, I'm going! Help! Police! Help! Help. Help. I ran to that walk to the only exit. The squad of bank cops trying to pass me, followed by half a dozen city dicks and some burns men who confused Van Pelt's burglar alarm with that of the bank next door. Nobody paid me any mind until I reached Church Street. I was just crossing when I saw it the second time. It was the same car that had run down Hank Page. I strained my eyes against the headlights. I couldn't make out the man behind the wheel, but I got the license plate before it happened. I felt it before I heard it. It hit my chest like a sledgehammer. The last thing I heard was the footsteps of a heavy man pounding toward me. The clock on the church of business of peace was chiming the half hour. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I started the caper with two clues, a cigarette case and a black eye and a dead man. When I woke up in the alley, I didn't have a cigarette case. Instead, I had two black eyes. One of them was on me. Strangely enough, I was alive. I reached inside my shirt to examine the bullet hole over my heart. There was nothing there but a bruise. 
I wanted what had been in that gold cigarette case besides gold and such cigarettes. The slug had come at me hard enough to knock me down and out, but the case in my inside pocket had stopped it. I limped to the nearest phone booth and phoned Tuttle in the traffic division. The plates on the hit-and-run car were registered to one Hendrick Van Pelt. Oh, Mr. Ray, what is it? It's 
my report on the gold tea caper. Now, with Howard Duff starring in space, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. January 25, 1948. Two homicide details, San Francisco Police. Attention to Second Lieutenant Sunday from Samuel Spade. License on the one set by Bank Six. Subject, the gold key cable. Dear Dundee, it started as these things usually do in my office when Heavy Farine, a style of my other draw, and eased in, closed the door behind her, and leaned against her. Is it girl outside? A client or a client? Maybe one to five. Did she uh, come a long way to see me? I don't think she's sitting here. I know, sweetheart, you never did. Sure is. Okay. Will you please come in, Miss Farmer? <coughs> uh, right here, Miss Farmer. You're so kind, Miss Farmer. I can see I've come to the right place. You're so kind. Uh, that, uh, that'll be all, Miss Farmer. Uh, now then, uh, what can I do for you, Miss Farmer? Well, I, I haven't a great deal of money. I've brought a little cash with me, and... Would 300 be enough for you? I uh, won't haggle with you, Miss Farr. Come back. Now, uh, what's the story that goes with it? How much do you know about a man named Johnny? It's about as much as the police know. You know more? I'm afraid I don't even know that much. I didn't even know what he was until one evening three years ago. That was the last time I saw him. The police came and arrested him. I was deeply shocked. But I thought I should stand by him. As I remember, the rap was three to five years breaking it out. Yes, I, I promised to wait for him. He couldn't quite make it. Well, in a way, you're perfectly right. When I heard he was coming out of prison, well, I just can't think. Have you uh, thought of leaving town? Oh, it wouldn't make any difference. He'd find me wherever I went. You can't say that I blame him. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> you're afraid of me, not dangerous. Not yet. Are you always saying so? Never. That depends. Oh. Yeah. On how many other staff you handle, like this county for police, and how many other staff will help you get out from under. Really? There must be some other type of detective. Okay. Here's your money. Hello, Rose. Go. You can't turn me away like this. Of all those things I told you. Something. You don't have any right to. But I put my trust in you. That's a lousy action. What do you want me to do? Well, he's arriving in San Francisco this afternoon. He'll come to my office and he's ready. I haven't been seen him or even answered him. That by itself is enough to make him kill him, man. Oh, you knew Johnny. Johnny would be Well, I don't. You said you did. Well, I didn't until the cops came in. But I didn't. I didn't know he was in the box. Well, I didn't know he was in the box. I just thought he was a gambler, like anybody. Well, I'm not going to do that. I'm 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 going to do that. I want to see him. You always want to set him up, I was afraid. Then I was going to write and have him tell him in prison. But then I was afraid he'd break out and make things worse for himself. But now... Now you've really got a face. Yeah, but I can't. I'm afraid. Uh-huh, and you want me to hold a gun on him while you give him the air. Oh, you say it like that. You make him feel safe. But I just can't go back to him. I can't. I just knew that you would go by and talk to him. And I... I'll be there a quarter up, budget four times, long, short, long, short. No, no, don't use the gun. I don't want to make any mistakes. Here, take this. Set yourself in. Go see Johnny. Forever. Now, okay. uh, don't worry, Angel, don't worry. You can put a new name on there. This one's not engraved very deep. <laughs> Drawn, a heavy fragrance clung to everything she touched. The chair she sat in, my glass with her lipstick on it for 300 bucks, even the gold tea. I rubbed it up against my coat plate. The 
name didn't come off. It only shone brighter. I saw it across the room just to see if it was found. It did. And when I walked over to pick it up, there were two keys, or at least one and a half. The gold shank had been hollowed out, and the key that fitted inside it was wrong again, Dundee. Not a glass key, a brass key with a number on it, 322, nothing else. I wondered if Johnny Batiste had been living a double life, or at least one and a half. I was still wondering when I put the brass key back into its hiding place and used the gold one to unlock the door of Wanda's apartment. The room was full of her perfume, but she wasn't there. Johnny Batiste was. He was cleaning the prison dirt out of his fingernails with a shiny new spring blade knife. Get a key. What for? You're in. Where's Wanda? She changed her mind. She don't want to see you. Who changed it for? I did. I told her she shouldn't ought to marry into the wrong set. So give me that key and blow. Where is she in here? I told her get a blow. She don't want to see you. Oh, oh. miss you yourself. You're stir happy. Ah. Oh, stop that. Listen, 
If I don't have that key back by midnight, I'll just... Well, I'm not... He's come back to kill me. Get out of sight. Get out of sight. I'll take care of you. There were two of them. Neither one was Johnny Batiste. They brushed past me and entered the room without a word and stood there with their faces hanging out. But we were giving each other the silent treatment. I sized them up. The larger size, I recognized some newspaper pictures. He was a big sand and gravel man, and rumor had it that a stretch of paving outside the town contained the bodies of 18 other sand and gravel men who had bid against him for the contract and stumbled into a rock crusher. Name? Mike Malloy. The uh, musician with him put his viola case down on the sofa and opened it up. No, 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 no. This isn't a man, Nathan. Why, Jeff, what he's doing here? Well, let's sit down and finish that comic book I bought for you. Okay, wrong question. Miss Bates, I told Miss Farr to hire you. Had me, Bill? No, yes, good. I brought along my bodyguard here just in case, where is he? I sent her to the movies. Why, of course. You see Johnny with me? Yeah, he dropped in. And he didn't, he didn't make any trouble? No. Is he supposed to? Uh, there's no point in our talking in certain ways. Johnny with me used to work for me. Maybe was here with one of his men, wasn't he? Why, bring him? Things have changed. Johnny isn't the man he used to be. But I've always taken care of those certainly loyalists. I uh, thought we weren't uh, talking to you. Believe me, Mr. Craig, I only want to save Johnny from himself. Is he threatening to jump into one of your rock records? <laughs> What's that, boy? He's got a sense of humor. I'm sorry, I may have been. I was misinformed about you, Mr. Craig. I was led to believe that you were the man to help my fiance and myself out of this embarrassing situation. Your fiance? Uh, uh, Wanda? Miss Fox? Yes? Yes, it's fiance. I'll be absolutely frank with you, Spade. I had hoped by bringing you and Johnny Batiste together in this circumstance that you might be forced to kill him in self-defense, of course. My apologies, Mr. It would have been the merciful way out for Johnny, and it would have saved many lives. I know Johnny Batiste. He will try to get back on top. He'll stop at nothing. <laughs> I believed them, and it was no mistake. That's why I almost hoped they didn't know where Johnny was, but they did. After they left one at the apartment, they crossed the street and went into the neon-lighted bar and grill. By the time I got downstairs, they were on their way out again with Johnny in the middle. They didn't look like they wanted to go, but they dragged him into Malloy's limousine, and he went. I did, too. The trail ended on the Embarcadero at the Harbor View Hotel. By the time I got into the lobby, Johnny and his two guards had disappeared up a ratty-looking flight of stairs. I started up after them, but then I stopped cold. When I got to the top of the stairs, I saw where the number one burst had gone. It had raked the ceiling and taken every light bulb in the corridor. I could see the flashes from the Tommy gun, and somebody backed into the hall from one of the rooms, still pumping lead. Let you die! Back later. You're not leaving, and I'm not coming back later. Get back in the room. Now, <laughs> oh, 
bullets in the airspace. I hired you as a bodyguard for my fiancée, Miss Parr. What do you come off pushing your way in here with a gun like this? I can have your license revoked so fast to make your head sway off yourself. I'm a little sick of this business. Dane, I warn you, stay out of this. What's that? You know, Johnny the Geek. I think that I am the man for the job and will be as 
long as she thinks I have the 500 grand. And if I do have it, Lieutenant, watch out for your bag. Period. And it will go. Oh. Oh. Well, yes, sir. Well, how have you? Have I what, Eddie? The $500,000? Oh, Eddie, how can you be so calm about it? Pipe that up, sweetheart. Search every nook and cranny for Treasury Hawkshaws, and I'll give you a full account. Private, of course. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. It's me, sweetheart. Risen from not one, but two deathbeds. Oh, Sam, I bet not. You wouldn't take that line down. Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Well, you did first, Sam. I did not. Oh, you mean you actually Oh, don't pin me down. Anyway, I was present at two dying declarations. Would you believe, Effie, that a man could say something that wasn't true at a time like that? Oh, no. You mean a man would be lying? On his deathbed? Oh, Effie, you made a joke. Oh, Sam, now stop it. I don't know what you mean. It's all right, Effie. I forgive you. You can atone by telling me how wonderful you think I am. I think you're... That you may do when I arrive in a trice to dictate my report on the deathbed caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Tell me, mister, how many times a day do you have to comb your hair? Not many, I'll bet, if you groom it right first thing every morning with Wild Root Cream Oil. For this famous hair tonic grooms your hair neatly and naturally and helps it to stay that way throughout the day. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. With Wild Root Cream Oil, you don't have to keep combing your hair every two minutes. (laughs) That is, unless your gal can't resist running her hands through it. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Many brave hearts are asleep in the deep. Oh, Sam, you're asleep. Captain Sam, or is the brig for you? You got your logbook handy, gal? Oh, yes, Captain. So beware. You make it that's awful deep. Be. Oh. Uh, 
date, June 20th, 1948. Where? Oh, <laughs> I have no shame. To uh, Marin County Sheriff's Office, San Rafael, California. Attention, Deputy Woodington from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, deathbed caper. Dear Bill, the uh, dawn came up like thunder out of Chinatown across the bay. In San Francisco, all we could see was fog. But on your side, it must have lifted briefly because somebody named Dan Starbuck managed to find his way to a phone booth, call me, and ask me to meet him at the 3rd Street Pier in Sausalito. I didn't see him when I first got there. I didn't even see the pier. It was too foggy. But in the glow of the neon lights in front of the Viking saloon, I saw a man who seemed to be waiting for somebody. He was a big guy with a good face, but plenty of worry on it. Mr. Spade? Yeah, Mr. Starbuck? Dan Starbuck. Come on down to the end of the pier. I'll explain as we go along. We've got to hurry. You act hot. You wanted for something? Well, I'm... not yet. What's the caper? Well, it... my brother's out there on his yacht, the Marguerite. He's dying. When he's dead, they may call it murder. I want to be there with a the witness. That's you. In case he has anything to say about it. who did it. Who did? They think I did. Did you? Well, honestly, I don't know. It happened the night before last. I went out there to see him. We've hated each other for years. We've both been drinking, and we drank some more. Then there was a fight. I drew a blank somewhere. Next thing I knew was around midnight. I pulled myself together, went into his cabin. Gordon was lying there with his head all kicked. I realized I was covered with blood, and I was holding something in my hand, big glass paperweight. I dropped it. I got out of there fast and swam ashore. I planned to tell you a different story, but that's it. You want the job or not? You think you'll make a deathbed statement that'll clear you, and you want me for a witness? Yeah, that's it. You got a lot of guts. I'm hired. Good. Uh, Alverson? Get down there? Alverson! Who's Halverson? Uh, he's a boatman. He'll row us out. Halverson? Hey, Nils? Donnie? Yeah. Is that you, Casino? Sure. Can I do you some favor? Uh, I want to go out to the Marguerite. I can't find Halverson anywhere. Well, I guess I can take you. Are you sure that yeah, you... I'm sure. Uh, uh, Sam Spade, Del Casino. He's the boss of the Marguerite. Glad to meet you. Sam. Any friend of Danny's. Hey, listen, Danny, you sure you want to go out there? Any reason why you shouldn't? Well, it's up to him. In his place, I would be on a freighter for China, way out there where the fog is more thicker. No, it's all right, Casino. I know what I'm doing. Well, uh, your friend, you, you excuse me, your name? Spade. You, pardon me, I better ask. The police don't want you for nothing? Not yet, but don't make book on it. Uh, push us clear, Danny. All right. <laughs> this fog is closing in, but I can still see the lights from the Marguerite. I wish we don't find her. But we did. She was wearing clam diggers, an off-the-shoulder T-shirt, and was leaning against the rail as the dinghy pulled past a police launch and nestled in under the ladder of the yacht. Dell? Dell, is that you? Yes, Mr. Starbuck. Who is that with you? Keep quiet. Dell. Dell, what are they saying ashore about... Oh, I, I thought you... You're Mrs. Starbuck? Yes. I'm Sam Spade. I'm from San Francisco. I'm a detective. Your brother-in-law's in the boat. You captured him? He wants to come aboard. He wants to... Why? He's hoping your husband will say something to clear him before he dies. Is there any reason why he shouldn't come aboard? Oh, there's every reason in the world why he shouldn't. The police are in there with my husband right now. Yeah? The doctor says there's a possibility that he may regain consciousness long enough to make a dying declaration. Mm -hmm. if, if he's face to face with Dan, there's no telling what he'll say. I wish Dan wouldn't. My, my husband is dying. Dan? Yeah, what'd she say? I don't know, but I think you'd better come aboard. <laughs> He seemed almost delighted as he swung his weight up out of the dinghy and climbed the ladder. Del Casino, the bosun, followed, wearing a puzzled expression that turned to fear as we entered the cabin. The yellow glare from the lamp swinging overhead was almost blinding to walk into out of the foggy night. 
The first thing I focused on was the bunk that held the dying man. His head was heavily bandaged, his skin was chalk white, and his lips were beginning to turn blue. The room was tense with waiting. Ranged around him in a semicircle were the supporting players. Two doctors, one family type with a nurse, one police medic without, one sheriff with cigar, one police stenographer, female with pencil and notebook poised, nine-tenths of a widow, and us. At 18 minutes past seven, somebody moved. It was a dying man. The two doctors rushed forward, took his pulse and blood pressure. Miss Scott, adrenaline 3 cc, chlamine 1, saline solution. Oh. All right, Sheriff, he's conscious now, but uh, you'd better hurry. My good. Ah, uh, Mr. Starbuck, you can hear me all right? Mm-hmm. Take that down. Can you hear me? Affirmative answer. Now, Mr. Starbuck, we have to ask these questions. One, what is your name? Please try to answer. What is your name? Gordon M. Starr. You got that? What is your name? Gordon M. Starr. That's close enough. Fill it in later. Now, Mr. Starbuck, where do you live? Uh, where do you live? I'm dead. You got that? 77 Marymount, Pasadena. Hey. Now, Mr. Starbuck, let's try a little harder. Hmm? This is a long one. Uh-huh. Have you been injured? And what was the cause of your injury? Uh, yes. Hurts, man. You got that? Affirmative. Now, the second part. What was the cause of your injury? Uh, head. Uh, head on head. Uh, do you believe that you're about to die as a result of your injuries and have you no hope of recovery? <laughs> I know. No hope. Ah, ah, now let's get to the point. Who inflicted said injuries? My. Hey, Mr. Starbuck, my. please, you haven't much time, you know. Go away. Doc, is there anything you can do? I'm afraid not. Oh. Oh, this is ghastly. Oh. Can't you leave him alone? Can't you let him die in peace? What are you afraid of, Maggie? Uh. What are you afraid he'll say? All right. All right, tell them, Gordon. It was Dan that struck you, wasn't it? He was jealous. He always hated you for marrying me. It was Dan. Now, 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 Mrs. Starbuck, I know how you feel, but we can't allow this sort of thing. Please step aside so we can finish up here. Uh, Mr. Starbuck. Uh, Doctor? Uh, very low pulse. I'm not sure. Dan. But... Dan. Is Dan here? Here I am, Gordon. Tell him. Tell him the truth. Do you identify this man, Mr. Starbuck? Yes. He's my brother. Dan. Yeah. You got that? Brother Dan, he's... He's the one. He's lying. Gordon, you know who did it. Why don't you tell the truth? What do you got to lose now? Nothing. Nothing. I'm finished. You got that? You finished me. Gordon! Uh, Gordon, not yet. Uh, I'll come back. Uh, Doctor, can't you? Can't... He's dead. Well, okay, Doc. Dennis Starbuck, it is my duty as sheriff of this county to take you into custody on suspicion of murder. And I must tell you that anything you say may be held against you. You'd better come along too, Spade. Routine questioning, you know. Okay, Sheriff. And I don't think we'll need the handcuffs, will we, son? No, I'll go with you. Yes, indeed, son. It's always smart to come along quietly. Yeah. Well, this is as far as I'm going. Hey, Dan, come back here. Hey, boy, Use your head. He only had one friend. He was the best friend in the world for a man on the land, the fog. The searchlights on the police launch spun frantically as the craft heeled around in a half circle to head him off. Instead of cutting the fog, the beams from the powerful lights bounced back from it and blinded the men behind them. After ten minutes of that, they gave up. The sheriff had a theory. Ah, uh, don't worry. Between the fog and the currents, I doubt if we'll make it. We'll probably recover the body in the morning. And they did. But it wasn't Dan Starbuck's body. It was the bosun, Del Casino. And he was found in Richardson Bay, adrift in the dinghy from the Marguerite. Somebody had creased his skull with the same type blunt instrument that had been used on Gordon Starbuck. But Dell hadn't lived long enough to make a dying declaration. The 
makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin that's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to Caper with Two Deathbeds. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. The police theory of the Del Casino killing went something like this. Casino had shoved off in the dinghy to join in the search for Dan Starbuck, had rescued him, and been maced for his pains. Also found in the dinghy, but not as yet worked into the police theory, were two items. One... A waterproof wallet containing the seaman's papers of one Nils Halverson. Two, a tattoo mark on the right bicep of the deceased. A small heart with a name in it, Maggie. The brand new widow of the same name was waiting in my office when I got there the following afternoon. Hello. Hello to you, Mrs. Starbuck. What can I do for you? Mr. Spade, I, I know very little about the ethics of your profession and... Well, are are you still working for Danny? If you mean, do I know where he is, the answer's no. Oh. I hoped you'd say that. Why? Because I want you to work for me. Need a new bosun? You needn't have put it quite so crudely. No, I needn't. Since your work is confidential, I'll admit I've... I've done a few things that... Well, it's all too true. My first mistake was marrying Gordon Starbuck when I didn't love him. And I should never have let myself fall in... Love with Dan. I certainly should have known better than to let Dell fall in love with me. What about Nils Halverson? And me? Well, hardly. No. Nils Halverson was employed by my husband for various odd jobs whenever we put in at Sausalito. Mostly he'd row the guests out to the ship. He rowed Danny out the night my husband was killed. At least I think he did. I didn't actually see him. Where's Halverson now? I don't know. He, he goes off on drunks for days at a time, but, but... But I have a feeling that someone has paid him to disappear. He he might have overheard something. Hold on a minute. He... You're going too fast. Are you uh, working up to a confession? Oh, no. It's, it's just that I'm afraid a great injustice may have been done to Danny. A after all, Mr. Spade, a man who's dying, I, I don't see how he could be altogether in his right mind. Do you? The law says he is if he knows his name and address. A deathbed accusation is the strongest evidence a lawyer can shove at a jury. You can't cross-examine a dead man, and most people have the quaint idea that a man on his deathbed is a lot more truthful than he was when he was hale and hearty. Then you think Gordon may have been lying? Could be, or wool gathering, or picking up some of the lines you were feeding him. Oh, I, I was just afraid he might die before he... You, you see, I thought I might shock him into saying yes or no. He, he could have said no, couldn't he? Well, make up your mind. Oh, all I know is it's on my conscience now. If we could find old Halverson and force him to tell what he knows. He's a very strange man. He's devoted to me. If, if the police find him before I do, he, he might refuse to talk out of a mistaken loyalty. To you? Well, I, I meant if he thought I had anything to do with the... Well, he's very strange. I told you that. What makes you so sure he's alive? Oh, why wouldn't he be? If I'd been the killer and he'd rode me to and from the scene of my crime, I'd see him secured in Davy Jones' locker. Fish feed, lobster bait, asleep in the deep. Will you work for me? I'll let you know.
I didn't have time to get tattooed, but the rest of me was marinated enough. On my head, I was wearing a dirtied-up yachting cap. And the rest of me, I was wearing a pea jacket, dungarees, and sea boots. I was also wearing clamshell number five as I rolled up to the Viking saloon. Well, what did it be, mate? Uh, Akavit and Vakta. Uh, have you seen my cousin? Your cousin? Who's your cousin, Prince Valiant? Uh, no, my cousin, Niels Halverson. Niels Halverson. Oh, no. You're Niels' cousin, mm, are you? Yeah. Well, uh, coming from the old country? Yeah, uh, Minnesota. Uh, by you, Minnie. Well, no, he'll be right glad to see you there. Uh, where uh, fair is he? I'll, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say this too loud. Yeah. Bend over there. Yeah. Close. He's in trouble, you know. Oh? Yes. I got him holed up down below. Oh. Yeah, come on, come on. Well, by golly, I sure been glad to be going to see my cousin Niels. <laughs> Niels Halverson. Drop the act and get down there. Hey! Okay, Joe, I'll take over from here. Easy, easy. Okay, Danny, me boy. I got his gun. Well, watch him now, watch him. He's full of smorgasbord. Well, Spade, you're the one person I didn't expect to see. But I'm very glad to. Yeah, I wish I hadn't found you. I wanted to find somebody else first. Halverson? Yeah. He's here. Want to see him? That's what I came for. And under here. Watch your head, low bridge. Yeah. Hey, here we are. Where? The boathouse under the pier. Halverson used to hole in here to sleep off his schnapps. Where's he now? Over here. Uh-huh. Yeah, he's going to be a long time sleeping this one off. He'd been missing since that night. Nobody knew he was here till last night. I headed for the saloon when I swam ashore. Joe hid me out here. He could still talk then. What did he say? I wrote it down here. But it's no help. Let's see it. It's just a jumble of words. Uh, Marguerite. Marguerite. Merry Christmas drink. My beautiful Helga. Row, row your boat. Now throw me back. Row me back. Twenty dollars, good and drunk. Mm. Fog rolling in, good and drunk. Gonna be five days, no business. Oh, my head. Paint the boat. Oh, crazy stuff. Twenty dollars. Uh, did you give him twenty bucks to row you I out? I didn't even see him. I swam out. My loving brother wouldn't have let me on board if he'd heard me arriving like a gentleman. Twenty bucks. Did you frisk him? No. I'll have a look. Oh, I don't... Hey, Wait. Huh. Real soggy, but a 20. I don't care. I'm sticking to my story. I swam out there. I didn't give him that 20. <sighs> Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't. Well, you gotta believe me. I didn't even have 20 bucks. That's why I Shut got... Shut up. What's the matter with you? What are you gonna do? Come over here, Dan. Why? Hey! I don't believe a word of your story, and even if I did, it wouldn't make any difference. Well, what are you... Shut up. You're going to stop talking and listen for a while. I stuffed a gag into his mouth and muscled him over to a piling and handcuffed him to it. He didn't even look surprised. He just stood there staring at me as if he'd lost his last friend in the world. But I wasn't looking at him as much as I was listening to those footsteps in the boards overhead. I waited for them to come back. They did. I walked across the soggy planks to where Nils Halverson lay in the shadows. Nils, I want you to answer these questions again. Now, this time, I'm going to take them down. You get lots of $20 and lots of drink. Now then, I know you don't feel so good. You don't have to talk if you don't feel like it. Just nod your head for yes and shake it for no. Okay, Nils? That counts in a court of law as long as there's a witness. Okay. Now, your name is Nils Halverson. Your address is 213 Bayview Sausalito. That's correct, is it? Nod your head. Good. Good. That proves you're in your right mind. You know you were injured. Yeah. You know the cause of your injury. Hit on the head and thrown over the side of your boat. What? Huh? Not from... Oh, dinghy. Well, it's the same thing. All right. Now, you know you're dying. You have no hope of recovery. That's obvious, but nod your head. That's the boy. Now, uh, Nils, on the night of the 18th, around 10 o'clock, after your usual working hours, you rowed somebody out to the yacht Marguerite in return for which this person gave you a $20 bill. This person is also the person who killed, who, in, who inflicted your fatal injuries. It is. 
Now, uh, the name of that person, if you can possibly speak even in a whisper, so there can be no mistake. Can you hear me? Just say it close to my ear. Yeah? Yes. Yes, I got it. That's all. Now, I know you don't write, Nils, but make your mark here. Come on, I'll guide your hand. There. Now we're going to take... Nils. Nils. Well, anyway. All right, Maggie. Come on in and join the party. Uh, don't try anything. The light's on you. I'm a better shot than you, and if there's a ruckus, the whole saloon will be down on us. They're all friends of Danny's, too. Stop there. Toss the gun. Okay. What's the matter, Angel? You look kind of scared. No. Just disappointed, that's all. Don't give up so easy, sweetheart. I always wanted to take a trip around the world. We might go on the Marguerite together. Yeah. Yeah, sailing into the sunset, sleeping with our deathbed statements under each other's pillows. Yeah, I see what you mean. I guess it wouldn't work. How much for yours, and what do we do about him? Dan? I'll take care of that. Throw it in with a deal. Okay. But I want it in writing. A little statement to the effect that I can keep under my pillow. Fair enough. Now, all I want from you is a little statement from you to this effect. That you, Marguerite Starbuck, employed Nils Halverson to row you out to the yacht on the night of the 18th, that you there overheard a quarrel between your husband and brother-in-law, and that taking advantage of said brother-in-law's inebriated condition, you sneaked up behind your husband, hit him with a paperweight, and decamped, leaving the murder weapon in Dan's hand. You then started back for shore in the dinghy, and realizing that the only witness who could testify you were aboard that All right, night... all right. All right, I'll sign it. Okay. We'll have plenty of time to put in all the legal decorations later. I'm afraid we won't, baby. You're going to be spending all your available time at the Hatchapi and points west. What are you talking you about? You just made a full confession in front of a witness. You heard it, didn't you, Dan? Every word. Oh, we're fight. Honest. An honest man. Well, I did tell a fib. Now, this is really going to hurt, I'm afraid, Maggie. You see, we didn't actually have any deathbed statement to match yours. No? No. Nils Halverson was a good deal too dead to have made a deathbed statement just now. He's been stiff for 12 hours. A uh, period and a report. Well, Sam, I'll type this right up because then I'm leaving. Wait a minute, Effie. I had to do it that way. Don't you understand? Of course, Sam. I quite understand. But you object, huh? A cruel, ruthless, murdering, though beautiful woman, foiled by a clever ruse, a great acting performance by the greatest private detective of them all. Is that all? You're still leaving. Yes, Sam, I bagged the pack. Well, pardon me for having feet. There's a reason, men. In fact, there are five big reasons why more men every day are turning to wild root cream oil for well-groomed hair. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil relieves dryness and removes loose dandruff. Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. Five big reasons why you, too, should join the millions with handsome, well-groomed hair. Why you should step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel and just right for the office or plant. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, Effie. You can't leave like this. Not without... Oh, all right. I'll talk to you while I'm putting my hat on. Well, can't you at least look at me? After all, you should give me a chance to justify... Sam, apparently you're laboring under an apprehension. Of course I am. Oh, boy, am I glad I picked the last in June and the first in July. What are you talking about? Vacation. Vacation? You just had a vacation a few months back. Twelve, Sam. That's a year. Well, if you want to take advantage of a legal technicality... Now, Sam, don't say goodbye, Mad. Well, it... Well, it's customary, I suppose. It's... it's lucky that some of us keep our nose to the grindstone, our ear to the ground, an eye to the future. Huh? Television's just around the corner, you know. Oh, Sam. <laughs> Come here, sweetheart. You look lovely in it. Come here. Have a wonderful time. Oh, Sam. Oh, Sam. Come here. Now go on. You missed your train. Uh, where are you going? 
The Los Sierras. Well, just so you don't go to Kanab, Utah. All right, Sam. You know best. Good, good night. Good night, Sierra Sue. Now, who can we get for that part next week? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right Away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Office of Samuel Spade, Private Investments. I mean, Investigations. Good morning. Uh, evening. Effie? Miss Perrine is on a vacation. Perhaps I may be of assistance, no doubt. I don't know. To whom am I speaking to? I am sorry. I cannot devolve that information to an entire stranger. May I take a message? Look, uh, Miss Whoever you are, I don't want to discommode you, but I... I am sorry, but I will have to ask you in no certain terms to resist from this line you are handing me. I am not the type secretary. Forget it. I'll just call Miss Perrine long distance and dictate my report over the phone. <gasps> oh, my stars and garter. How utterly gouge of me, Mr. Spade. Oh, I'm Bernadine, Effie's relief. I, I mean yours. I could use some. Oh, shall I send out for some medicine? Yeah. The phone number's on the wall behind the water cooler. Tell them the hundred proof bonded and hang the expense. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the bail bond caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Only three days left, gals, and June, the month of weddings, will be over. But don't worry, there are still 187 days left in leap year, Still time to snag the man of your dreams. You know, the one who uses Wild Root Cream Oil on his hair. He and millions of other men use Wild Root Cream Oil daily because Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair so neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. Any smart man who wants to look smart always insists on Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Oh, Mr. Spade! You are Mr. Spade. You just gotta be. Yes, but why? It was faith. I knew it was going to be like this. I have my qualms, too, Bernadine. Oh, that's good. I, I sent the other back. The other what? I called that number, but it was euphonious. They sent whiskey. Is something the matter? Uh, no. No, nothing at all. I'm perfectly qualm. Well, I'm glad. My previous employer was very nervous. 
which is why I just happened to be tentatively at large when Effie reproached me about being a relief to her. Figures. Uh, Bernadine, now I'm not being fresh. Honestly, I'm not, but do you take shorthand? Yeah, but I don't speak it. What is that you speak? Don't answer. Uh, ready? Rodney. I, I mean, Roger. Yeah, uh, date. I'll have to ask my mother. Down, Bernadine. Uh, date, June 27, 1948, to Miss Effie Perrine, care of Perry's Lodge, Canab, the Pearl of the West, Utah. What? Oh, uh, wrong letter. I'll get to that later. Uh, date, uh, June 27, 1948, to Leo M. Scarlett, care of Leaf Branch, Root, Knox, and Wood, attorneys at law, 333 Pine Street, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the bail bond caper. Dear Leo... I'm sorry things turned out the way they did, Leo, and I'd like you to know how I got into it. It wasn't for the reward. I don't take rewards. I'm not in love with your wife, no matter what she says, and I wasn't sore at you about anything. I was just sitting in my office, minding my own business when the door opened, and Vivian walked in. She looked every bit as beautiful as she did when she lived under me in Ma Tuttle's boarding house in 41. In fact, I didn't recognize her until she slithered out of her mink. Hello, Sam. Surprised to see me? Uh, yeah, but I'm trying not to show it. What's on your mind? Is that all you've got to say to me, Sam? Well, you're here on business, aren't you? All right, I don't blame you. It all happened pretty sudden, Leo and me. I should have written or phoned you, I suppose, but somehow... Forget was... it, Vivian. Now, uh, what do you need a detective for? Are you uh, thinking of divorce already? Oh, please don't, Sam. If it was a mistake, I'm the one who has to live with it. And I made up my mind when I married Leo this time, it's for keeps. No matter what. Mm-hmm. What's the what? He's in trouble, Sam. Well, that's nothing new. Well, this time I don't think it's his fault. When Leo went legit, he meant it. What's he say he's doing now? He's a bail bond broker. Judging from your new look, I'd say he's a success. Sam, a man called him on the phone today. I answered. He said his name was Holiday, but I recognized his voice. It was an old friend of Leo's, Charlie Rosenfoy. Charlie, huh? When did he get out? A couple weeks back. He was paroled. I don't know what he said over the phone, but Leo looked scared and sick. I don't wonder. The word around town was that Charlie took the rap for Leo. Well, I don't know anything about that. All I know is Leo's on the level now, and Charlie never will be. He did plenty on his own during that time he served. Well, I won't argue that, but from where I sit, it looks like Leo better start wearing a gun again. He has. That's what I'm so frantic about, Sam. Do you hear any of the conversation from Leo, Sam? He didn't say much. But I did hear him say, All right, ten tonight. I'll meet you there. That wasn't very smart of him. I know, but that's the way he is. It might be only for a payoff. I thought of that, too. But Leo hasn't got that kind of money. He's been dropping a lot at the racetracks lately. And even if he had it, he's not the type to pay blackmail. I don't like it. Why should I stick my neck out? Why did you have to come to me, anyway? Because I trust you, Sam. I know you were jealous of Leo. I was? Sam, if we ever meant anything... To... If you meant half the things you said to me when we were... Stop it. That's blackmail. Oh, I feel so lost and alone. I don't know where to turn. Okay, okay. I'll see what I can do. Oh, Sam. I'll make it up to you somehow. You see if I don't. Sure you will. And tell Leo to stop dropping his money at Tan Ferran. This is going to cost them plenty. <laughs> Vivian had said that your rendezvous with Charlie was scheduled for 10 in the p.m. and that you were too upset to go to work that day, so you'd be at home, 1246 Dunbar. I took a plan in your apartment building from a sleepy lagoon-type cocktail bar across the street called, you guessed it, the Sweet Leilani. Your wife joined me, and after a while, we got around to talking. At least she did. <laughs> I bet you can't guess what I'm thinking about. Huh? Listen, Sam. You remember that night we drove to the Half, half Moon? Bay. Oh, you do remember. Oh, we used to do the craziest things. I should have married you, Sam. <laughs> Please, not while I'm drinking. You know what? The trouble with crooks... <sighs> They have to work day and night. Yeah. Hey, you're not listening. No, but everybody else in the place is. Let's talk about you, Sam. Did I ever tell you how I met Leo? No, and please don't. And then he opened a bucket shop. You know what a bucket shop is? Yeah. It's stock bro 
Uh, a brokerage. Broker. Yeah, that's right. Only it's crooked. That was the first business Leo started when he went legit. Mm-hmm. He had to shut it down on account of those securities <laughs> somebody was always stealing out of the safe. Were they insured? Yeah, but they wouldn't renew his policy. So after the second nightclub burned down and he couldn't get any insurance at all, even on his own life. That's why I'm so frantic, Sam. Hey, give me a nickel. I want to play sweet little Annie. Fifty nickels and two hours later, sweet Leilani broke under the strain, so we had Princess Papuli to leave a night gave out, and we were starting on the Hawaiian war chant when she disappeared through a door marked Wahini's, Hawaiian for powder room, and never came back. Around 9.45, I mumbled something to the bartender about the lady will pay, put on my smoked glasses, and strolled out and across the street. You came out of the building a couple of minutes later. You led me a zigzag course up Merchant Street to Salon, across Salon to Commercial, down Commercial to Drum, and made a lateral pass over Drum back to Dunbar. Your destination, I'd never have guessed it, was the Sweet Leilani. Happily, they were not playing Sweet Leilani. It was very, very quiet. The regular customers had taken a powder, and I didn't blame them. In the new crop at the bar, I counted ten broken noses, at least five broken paroles, assorted knife scars, and four pairs of cauliflower ears, and one maverick. You slid into a booth at the end of the bar, took the gun out of your shoulder holster, and laid it down on the table in front of you. I walked over, turned it around so it was pointing at the jukebox instead of me, and sat down. Some other time, Spade. Some other time I drink with you. I'm waiting for a friend. Why the gun? You selling it to him? Maybe I give it to him. Go on, you drink at the bar. Ah, it's kind of crowded. Looks like uh, Charlie Rosenfoy's old mob. Who are they gunning for? You or Charlie? Why don't you ask them? What are you drinking, Leo? I was with that bottle all day. Got a bad taste. Do me a favor, Spade. There's a bar two doors down the street. Go drink there. There's my friend coming in the door. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine, Leo. Look, Spade. Hello, Leo. What's the matter? You bring a bodyguard to meet your old friend, Charlie? This shamus threw his weight in here. I didn't ask him. I don't need him. Huh. That sounds like the old Leo Scarlatti I used to The know. name is Scarlet. Oh, pardon me. I've been on the rock for so long, it's hard to catch up on all the changes. There's been a war, Charlie. Anyone tipped you to it yet? You got a smart bodyguard, Leo. Let's talk. Let's go somewhere else and talk. Uh-uh, I like it here. Okay, we start. How come you tipped the mob we were coming here? You promised you wouldn't. Like the shamas, they got a drink somewhere. All right, say what's in your mind and I'll go. Yeah, and if you don't mind, I think I'll uh, do my drinking at the bar. Both of your guns were on the table. It didn't look as though you were going to use them on one another, and I figured that neither of you was going to do much talking in front of me anyway, so I strolled back to the end of the bar to look at the television. The 10 o'clock news roundup was on, and the ticker tape that was moving across the screen said dot, dot, dot in Atlantic City today, period. I ordered a highball, and then the ticker tape started again. This time it said San Francisco, million-dollar bail bond robbery. One million dollars in negotiable bonds is tonight in the hands of a group of daring hold-up men who commandeered an armored truck at the very portals of the police department and the Hall of Justice. And it said this concludes the 10 o'clock edition of the television news roundup. I had a slight hunch that if the television boys had had their cameras on the big bail bond robbery, that at least some of the characters would have been played by at least some of the bad actors that were foregathered in the sweet Leilani. In fact, what you and Charlie were saying and doing when I walked back to your booth was almost too much to the point. You let me see the bulky portfolio Charlie shoved across the table at you. It looked like a carrying case for bonds, bank messenger type. But it was sealed with wax blobs bearing the imprint of the great seal of the state of California. I was impressed. Where'd you get this? You can read about it in the papers, and if I was you, I'd get this out of sight before them papers hit the street. One thing more, don't try to clip none of them coupons. And one thing more in addition, don't open it at all. Sure. Spade? Yeah, Leon? I think I hire you after all. I took the job and you handed me the portfolio. 
Outside, we flagged the taxi, and you gave the driver an address on Portsmouth Square. Your office, I hate to remind you, was behind one of a bunch of neon-lighted storefronts across from the Hall of Justice. The sign on the door said, press the button and let freedom ring any hour, day or night. The only bell in sight was a stop press type burglar alarm. You unlocked the door and we went in. You paused in front of a big green safe with a combination lock and started twirling the knob. The tumblers clicked into place. I picked up an inkwell and waited for the safe to open. All right, Spade, give me it. I did, with both hands. With my left, I handed you the portfolio, and with my right, I pitched the inkwell at a well-wired slab of plate glass window. When the burglar alarm went into action, so did you. You dropped everything and were out of the door and out of sight before you could say, let freedom ring. While I was waiting for the cops to arrive, I helped myself to a $500 bearer bond I found lying loose in your safe. I had a feeling I might be needing some bail myself. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. It gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. That's like the oil of your skin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Now, back to the Bail Bond Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I had hoped, Leo, when I made my spectacular move in your Bail Bond office and set the bells to ringing, that I'd get the caper off my neck and onto the capable shoulders of the police where it now belonged. Then I told myself I could go home and get some sleep. I had never been that fond of Vivian anyway. I was holding the million-dollar portfolio, complete with its big official seal still unbroken, ready to hand it over with a flourish to the first boy in blue that rushed in. But then I saw something that dashed my hopes. There was a strip of scotch tape across the bottom of it. It wasn't up to me to tamper with important evidence, but I didn't have to. It was only a question of what magazine had been cut up to replace the million dollars in bearer bonds. That question was answered at headquarters 20 minutes later. It turned out to be the last 52 issues of Radio Life, which even Captain Walsh of the robbery detail admitted was no help. Neither was Captain Walsh. Now, Spade, in your statement here, you state, uh, so-and-so-and-so-and-so-and-so, sweet Leilani, and that Rosenfoy didn't hand portfolio exhibit in question to Leo M. Scarlett, alias Scarlatti, at approximately 10.20 p.m. this day. That's it, Captain. Now, uh, you sure you want to stick with this? You don't want to change any part of the statement? No, I just want to go home and go to bed. I'm afraid you're going to stay with us for a while. Who, me? Um, statement of Jordan Joyce, M.D., statements of Hilda Sackwriter, R.N., and Mildred DeVille, Biss, R.N., day and night, nurses, respectfully. Who's sick? Rosenfoy. He's been quarantined in his home in Daly City since his release from Alcatraz four days ago. Chicken pox. Sorry, Sam, I'll have to book you. You sure you don't want to add anything to that statement? <sighs> Only this. Kelsey Walsh, if you continue to do such brilliant police work, you will be waving a stop sign at a school crossing in time for the fall semester. 
You are a hangnail on the finger of justice. I thought I had been courteous and cooperative, but even so, it was the middle of the afternoon by the time they set my bail. Fifteen hundred bucks. That made it light. But I hadn't had time to hang the curtains in my cell when I got even worse news. My bail had been posted by who? Vivian, a banana peel, and the steps of progress. She met me outside. Well, aren't you going to thank me? What for? Getting me in jail or getting me out? Getting you out, of course. It was all the money I had in all the world. Leo's money was impounded, you know. But, Sam, when I thought of what you and I once meant to each other, and maybe we still could Yeah, yeah, well, uh, you'll get your money back. I'm not really guilty. Oh, I know that. What else do you know? I guess it's safe to talk. Leo phoned me today. Where is he? He wouldn't say. Some pay station. He kept putting in nickels. Sam, you've got to talk to him. You've got to convince him it's best to give himself up. Now you're beginning to make sense, sweetheart. But how can I get to talk to him? I've arranged it. He's to meet us at the Club Leilani. You know, where we had our reunion yesterday. That place on Dunbar? Yeah. Oh, that's great. A crowded saloon less than a block from the police department. Besides, the place has lousy memories for me. By the way, did you ever get out of the ladies' room? If you don't mind, I'd rather talk about something else. Okay, let's talk about how do we bring this big secret meeting off in a crowded cafe. Is Leo coming in a false beard? You really think I'm stupid, don't you? I didn't say so. Well, it so happens that the place is closed on Tuesday. See that sign in the window? Closed Tuesday? Mm Mm-hmm. Now, how do we break in? I was counting on you. You're a detective. Can't you use a glass key or something? Did you say that bail bond you bought for me was all the money you had in the world? That's the truth. Then get ready to forfeit it. It's a risk I've got to take. You've got to take. Sam, please, if we ever meant anything Yeah, I know. Half Moon Bay. But sometimes I wish we hadn't been childhood sweethearts. Wait here, I'll case the alley. The alley wasn't much better. There were two windows, washroom type, all glass brick, except the two small ventilators big enough to put your hand through. The only hope was the kitchen skylight. I didn't have any trouble getting up to it, but once I was there, things didn't look so good. The view from the roof was a garage door with two green lights flanking it. Then it struck me where I was and why I was there. The Club Leilani backed directly on the Hall of Justice where the big bail bond robbery had taken place at 5 p.m. the night before. Without further ado, I put my foot through a pane of the skylight, reached in, unlatched it, and dropped. Hurry up, come in, Sam. Sam! Up at the front of the building, I could hear Vivian clamoring for admittance. I decided to let her clamor for another minute or two. It isn't a thing I often do, but I walked resolutely into the ladies' powder room. It was very well equipped. It had furniture, a telephone, and more clues than I needed. The magazines were there, the razor blades were there, the scotch tape was there. There was even a scraping of red sealing wax on the steel frame of the window slot. But best of all was what I found in the paper towel dispenser. I lifted it out and moved it next door to the men's washroom. Then I let her in. I kept you so long. You'll spoil everything. I was afraid you'd... Here comes your husband. <gasps> oh. Come on, let me in. What happened, Leo? You're early. Any objections? I just got itchy, that's all. How are you, baby? Please don't, Leo. I'm so nervous. Strange. What are we going to do, baby? What's Spade going to do for us? Tell him, Sam. I'll leave you two alone to talk it out. I'll freshen up a little. I haven't had my face on all day. Poor kid. Well, Spade, let's have it. Yeah, she's right, Leo. I can do a lot for you. But you've got to do something for me. Spade, this is level. I never saw those bonds. I know that. Then what are you after? The truth. It's the only thing that can save you, and if you take this rap, I take it too. I'm in clear up to my neck. Okay. Charlie Rosenfoy came around to Vivian and made her this proposition. He was going to pull this bail bond job and plant the goods on me to get even for the rap he thought he'd taken for me. Mm -hmm. Vivian pretended to play along with him, only she got hold of the package long enough to take the bonds out and put the old magazines in instead. The idea was the mob would think Charlie had double-crossed them, taken the goods for himself, and delivered a phony packet to their banker, which was supposed to be me. Only you had to get smart and set off that burglar alarm. Now I'm getting the squeeze on all sides. The mob, the law... Charlie are all gunning for me at once. Don't worry about the mob and the law, and don't worry too much about Charlie. What are you driving at? That'll be him now. 
Who tipped him I was here? Get back in the corner. It's dark in here. He'll never see you. I'll take care of him. All right. Hello, Charlie. Oh. Come on in. Oh! Good boy, Spade. Get his gun. You're my friend. Sure, I'm your friend. Come here. Yeah, sure, Spade. Hey! Pleasant dreams, fellas. Now I act. Hey, Charlie! No, Leo! <laughs> Vivian? Sam? Is that you? Yeah. The last of your boyfriends. You mean Leo? Charlie? Yeah. They just knocked each other off. Oh, Sam. I can't see. It's dark. Where are you? Right here in front of the jukebox. You sure? Hope to die. <gasps> Drop it, Vivian. It's empty. Sam, I... <laughs> Vivian, how could you? After Half Moon Bay. I'm sorry I had to knock you boys out, Leo, but uh, better lumps than bullet holes, eh? After she started wrapping up the caper, it wasn't too hard to figure what she was up to, providing you could keep her smoke out of your eyes. She told Charlie how to operate on you and told you how to operate on Charlie. A million dollars for her and two dead gangsters lying on the floor of an empty joint where they'd shot it out. The secret of the missing bonds would have to be written off by the police as having died with either one of whichever of you ever had them. Period. End of something. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. I, I know you're tired, and if you're too brushed, please feel free to elude the whole matter. But... Yes, okay, let's do that. Thank you. Effie said that you were always glad to qualify any little points that she didn't understand. Mm -hmm. She said that, did she? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But she also said that quite accidentally that you sometimes leave things out that should be left in. Bernadine, times are very bad. They're cutting salaries everywhere. But where were they during the whole nefarious affair, if you'll pardon the expression? The bonds? In the paper towel dispenser, didn't I say so? Oh, that's what you moved to the men's. Mm -hmm. But how did they get there? In the Walrenies, if you'll pardon the expression. Simple. When the thieves whizzed through the alley after the heist, Vivian had her well-manicured little lunch hook thrust through the window slot to receive them. Oh, that's how the red sailing wax got there. Bernadine, you're spectacular. Now go and type this up. You're making me nervous. You know what they say about people who like mysteries? Once a mystery fan, always a mystery fan. And that goes for hair tonics, too. Once a Wild Root Cream Oil fan, always a Wild Root Cream Oil fan. Just try it and you'll see what I mean. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Mr. Spade. I hope it's not too erroneous. Oh, I'm sure it's quite offensive. Don't you mean inoffensive, Mr. Spade? Have it your way. I don't want to sound imprudent, Mr. Spade, but I must say that your conduct through the whole thing was very brave and outrageous. Don't you mean courageous? <laughs> oh, now I've got you doing it. You're going to be just like Mr. Cummel. Your uh, previous employer, no doubt. Yeah, poor man. You know, he finally became completely erasable. They had to take him away. Mm -hmm. What were his symptoms? Well, when he ordered the puppy biscuits, I thought he was just being concentric. But after a while, he wouldn't answer to anything but Rover. I had to sprinkle his flea powder in the morning, you know? And then he had his little tricks. He always wanted to show off, you know, sitting up and rolling over. He could shake hands, too. What's so great about that? Any dog can shake hands. Yeah, but can you scratch your ear with your foot? If I uh, set my mind to it. Now go home, Bernadine, or I'll report you to the SPCA. <laughs> you can't frighten me. Effie told me that your bark is worse than your bite. Good night, Mr. Spade. 
Effie in far-off Kanab come home, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency, good evening. That sounds funny in dialect. Good evening to you and happy 4th of July, Bernadine Hemp. Oh, Mr. Spade, what was the caper? Don't you mean caper? No, the caper. The high point of the caper. The climax, the crescendo, the pinafore. Now, well, that's better. For a minute, I was afraid you were uh, learning English. Oh, no. I'm studying Spanish. Soy infeliz que inicia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mucho interesting. <laughs> Gracias. Shall I go home now? No, uh, mal suerte. There's a little matter of murder in two languages, neither of which is Spanish, so stay where you are. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the Rushlight Diamond Caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Listen, men, to this holiday tip on good grooming. To help spark up your whole appearance, first be sure that your hair is well-groomed. Be sure it's groomed with popular Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, the way you like it, the way she likes it. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So look your best all the time by sprucing up right with Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, July 4, 1948, to Mrs. May Rushlight, 21A, Granite Court, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the uh, Rushlight Diamond. Dear Mrs. Rushlight, it was the kind of nice, relaxing assignment that comes my way just often enough to remind me that gum chewing can be respectable. There was an air of quiet elegance about 21A, Granite Court, and about the butler who answered the door. He uh, took in my rented gray topper and doeskin gloves, nodded approvingly at my wing collar, watered silk ascot, pearl gray waistcoat, morning coat, pinstripe trousers, and my spats with the mother of pearl buttons, and asked me if I were a florist. I set him to rights, and he led me up a flight of stairs to the early a.m. annex of your morning room. Mr. Samuel Spade. 
You're just on time, Mr. Spade. Mrs. Rushlight would be pleased. I'm Nancy Ward, Mrs. Rushlight's social secretary. And if you don't think that's tough to say, try it. Uh, Mrs. Rushlight's socials? Oh, what's tough about that? Uh, you'll do. Definitely, you'll do. Shall we dance? I will dance at her wedding. But don't get me wrong, I'm not secretly in love with Ralph Rushlight, and the bride is lovely. Just hate to see all that money going down the drain. Is there anything else you think I should know? You know what your job is. You're supposed to guard the wedding presents. That's simple because it's nothing but a lot of cheap silver. And stay away from the champagne. It's non-vintage. The food will be foul. The guests are the most dismal aggregation ever assembled. Sounds like a lovely party. I arranged the whole thing. I told you she's a lovely bride. What's she ever do to you? I'd rather not stay. I don't want to sound bitter. This way, Mr. Spade. The old hat. Mrs. Rushlight will see you now. Thank you, Florence Nightingale. Nancy? Oh. Now this is it, darling. Mr. Spade. You come over here, young man, so I can get a better look at you. How's this? Hmm, it's good. Turn around. Yes, you'll do. Uh, that'll be all, Nancy. Oh, couldn't I be finishing up these place cards while you talk? Take them with you. Do them outside. Very well. <laughs> Nosy girl. But nice. Nice nose. Oh, you too, eh? Well, I agree. That's why I'm marrying off my nephew to that wretched girl, Lotta Van Eyck. Have you ever seen Bugs Bunny, Mr. Spade? You don't mean the... They protrude. The ears? No, the teeth. Oh. As my late husband used to say of her mother, she could eat a tomato through a tennis racket. Oh. There's only one thing that'll prevent this wedding from being an utter disaster. She doesn't understand much English. Uh -huh. uh, what's the matter with your nephew? A great deal, but it doesn't show. Suffice it to say, he has criminal tendencies and the mentality of a snail. Mrs. Rushlight, I don't like to seem forward, but why are you telling me all this? Oh, you're, you're supposed to mingle with the guests. You'll need some conversation. Now, as to your assignment. The bride, being what she is, the wedding presents are hardly worth guarding except <coughs> for one. Ironically enough, it's from me. What is it, a machine gun? Oh, 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 oh that's good. Oh, oh, excuse me, I must write that down. And then tear it up immediately. <laughs> oh, dear. No, no, Mr. Spade. But it's bad luck, the Rushlight Diamond. You've heard of it? Uh, something about it in the American Weekly a while back, wasn't there? Yes, yes. It's not as large as the Hope Diamond, but there's not a flaw in it. My late husband, Roy Rushlight, bought it for his first wife. She sank with the SS General Slocum in Hellgate, the East River, 1904, over a thousand lives lost. Luckily, she was wearing a paste copy at the time. I was only a young girl when I married Mr. Rushlight, and... A oh, fool that I was. I signed anything his lawyers asked me to sign. After his death, I discovered that the diamond was to be mine only until the marriage of my husband's male heir, at which time it must go to his bride. Well, that's too bad. Uh, you say, though, that the Rushlight diamond is bad luck. Oh. Oh, there's that, of course. <laughs> I wonder if it's too much to hope. Hmm. Well... I must go and help dress the bride. Go along downstairs, Miss Spade. Take this jewel case with you. Put it on the table with the other presents and guard it well. So I took the old velvet-covered case you held out to me and checked the contents. It was an old-fashioned lavalier with a clear stone pendant only slightly smaller than an eight ball. Didn't look like a diamond, but smooth-cut diamonds hardly ever do. It didn't look like bad luck either, but... A mirror broke in the hall as I passed it, then I fell all the way down the stairs, and as I entered the ballroom, I knocked over a punch bowl. Nothing uh, really terrible happened until just before dark when the guests began to arrive. In theory, a detective guarding wedding presents is supposed to make himself indistinguishable from the other guests. In practice, it never works out that way. He has to spend most of his time within sight of the booty, so he is very easily spotted. I don't Looking. Oh, but he must be. He's not anybody we know. Well, ask him. It's leap year. Oh, here comes Colonel Bixby. He'll know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Beauty gathered round the booty, eh? <laughs> and much more beauty than booty, though. <laughs> yeah. Say, when are they going to hang the diamond on that drip? No, no, there's no way to talk about the blushing bride. I is that it in the crummy old case there? That case is heirloom, young lady. The stone that reposes in it is worth a king's ransom. Now take your grubby hands elsewhere. Oh. Be off with you. Go on. <laughs> well, just because he's going to give the bride away, he thinks he can order everyone around. Uh, Mr. Spade, allow me to congratulate you, sir. For these affairs, one all too often sees the detective on guard duty at the punch bowl. <laughs> I was forewarned. Oh, yes, very bad champagne, flat. <laughs> 
I'll be glad when these ill-starred nuptials are consummated. And by the way, Bixby's my name, Colonel Lysander Bixby. Colonel? It is my melancholy and thankless duty to give the bride away to the hapless groom, Ralph Rushlight. However, it's much better to give than to receive. <laughs> you tell that to May Rushlight, eh? Yeah. Quite a trinket. Uh, 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 uh. Mustn't touch grubby hands, remember? Oh, <laughs> sense of humor as well as sense of duty, eh? Candidly, if I knew a place to fence it, I'd be the... Colonel Bixby. Oh, Miss Warren. Ah, how lovely you look. Poor Ralph. Mrs. Rushlight asked me to warn you to get ready. The bride will be down any moment. Oh, good grief. Well, I suppose I must steal myself. Where did I leave my glass? Keep your eye on that old goat, Mr. Spade. I don't trust him. Who is he? He's the only one here who knows why this wedding's happening. He's the bride's foster father. You mean he's got something on the family? You'll never know how much until you kiss the bride. Look, Nancy, it's none of my business, but I... Oh, Starting. I'll have to go in now. Oh, wait. What? Uh, how does it go? Uh, speak now or forever hold your peace? No, I, I can't do that. Thank you for understanding. I didn't witness the ceremony, but judging from the mood of those who had, it was just as well I didn't. They shuffled back into the ballroom looking as if they'd witnessed an execution. Nobody seemed to be in a hurry to join the receiving line. After a few half-hearted handshakes, the groom left the bride standing alone, looking kind of bewildered, and came over to take inventory of the presents. Look at that junk. I'm Ralph Rushlight. Who are you? Spade. I was hired to guard this junk, as you call it. Sorry I'm wasting my time. The Rushlight dime. It's bad luck. Look at what it did to me. Look at her. Did you ever see anything? Give it to yourself. Why should I? Because I'm liable to slap you clear across this room. Haven't I been punished enough? Go on, go on, scram. Keep your hooks off that necklace. That's mine. I heard it's your wife's. Come along, well, you right heard wrong. Come along over here. Oh, Mr. Spade, you haven't met the bride yet, have you? Uh, no. Thank you. I, uh, uh I wish you a lot of luck, Mrs. Rushlight. You're gonna need it. Thank you. Well, I suppose now as well as any time, Colonel. Oh, oh very well, my dear. Mm. Uh, quiet, please. Mm. Quiet, everyone. Uh, uh, Mrs. Rushlight, the old, uh, the elder Mrs. Rushlight, that is, has something to say to you. Mr. Spain. Yes? And the necklace, will you please hand it to me? With pleasure. I'm tired of looking at it. Oh, you're not done yet. <laughs> Stay close by my side. <coughs> dear friends, at this solemn moment, I want, first of all... To welcome this dear little girl into the Rushlight family. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and now, dear Lotta, I will place around your neck the gem which was my heritage when I became a Rushlight and which is now yours. Thank you. Oh, what's wrong? Yes. Lotta, ah. come back here. Lotta! I'll go out to the carport and head her off. Oh, you leave her alone. I'll take care. Whose wife is she, anyhow? Lotta, come back here. Lotta, bring it back. I was almost ashamed of joining the chase, but I had to because I'd been hired to guard the Rushlight Diamond, and for my money, the best way to do that was to help her get away. Well, somebody got to her before I did. A strip of wedding gown satin marked the spot. The body lay crumpled under a hedge, but it wasn't the bride's body. It was the groom. He'd been stabbed to death with a pair of garden shears, which made sense. But what didn't make sense was that the necklace she'd been wearing was still clutched in his hand. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. 
What's more, non-alcoholic wild root cream oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use wild root cream oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now back to the Rushlight Diamond Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Number 21A Granite Court was teeming with motives and suspects. But the police were primarily interested in locating Lotta, the missing bride and widow of Ralph Rushlight. So was I. She looked like less work than the rest of you because if she had killed him, it was self-defense if she knew enough English. By 10 in the a.m., when I checked in at my office, she was still successfully eluding the police dragnet. That was because nobody, including me, had thought of looking in my office. Wow. Good morning. Thank you. Is that all the English you know? Thank you, no. I want my necklace. The police have it. You go with me. Tell them who I am. Okay, but first, I have to know who you are. Where you came from, what your connection with Colonel Bixby is. I am in Macassar being born. In Macassar? Dutch colony. Uh-huh. My father there seven years ago dying is. When I, 13 years old, have arrived. I see. Colonel Bixby in San Francisco, the financial representative from my father us. I am adopted to him, not for a father, but so he takes care of my monies, which coming of age am I a rich Dutch woman. Uh-huh. But legally, he's your foster father. Yeah, also, legally, I'm not a wife of Rushlight. I want my necklace. You married him for the necklace? Yeah. Why did he marry you? For one half of necklace when we sell. But all, everything to take he wishes. You and Ralph were going to divvy the take from the Rushlight diamond, you thought. Yeah, yeah. And what was the colonel going to get? Money's for Mrs. Rushlight. Oh, now, wait, that doesn't make sense. Mrs. Rushlight stood to lose a small fortune by that marriage. Why should she pay the colonel to promote it? You the detective, are. You said that. Where my necklace are. That I say. Yeah, well, look, I'm not as sure as I was. Uh, wait just a minute. I'll uh, check on it. <clears throat> Homicide, Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, Spade, Dundee. Uh, yes, Sam. What's new on the rushlight caper? Oh, you know I can't talk about the case, Sam. Oh? I got a line on that girl. Oh? Huh? Where is she? You know I can't talk about that, Dundee. Oh, you can't, can't you? Well, let's see if this doesn't change your mind. The necklace we found on Rushlight's body was a phony, a base copy. Uh-huh. Does that make her guiltier than she was before? Well, now she's got a motive. Throws all our previous theories into a cocked hat. Now, where's the girl? She's in my office, Lieutenant, dear. Come and get her. Thank you. Oh, it's you, Sam. Back again? Yeah, do you mind? Well, that depends on who you came to see. You, you sweetheart. Oh. But uh, first, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Rushlight. Well, she can't see anyone. She's in a state of nervous collapse over the... over Ralph's death. Oh, that's too bad. Mm-hmm. You uh, seem to be holding up pretty well. Well, I'm relieved. He's better off dead than married to that... Yeah. Rushlight Diamond's still unlucky, you know. What do you mean by that? I was just trying it on for size. And? Uh-huh. Does it fit? Yeah, but uh, you and Mrs. Rushlight are about the same size. Her uh, nerves getting any better? You're the doctor. If you want to see her, go ahead. She's up there. Thank you. Mrs. Rushlight. Go away, I need I'm sorry to break in on you like this, but I haven't got much time. How dare you? Nancy, Nancy. Try this, that girl. Mr. Spade, please leave me alone with my grief. Funny thing, yesterday Nancy was carrying a torch for Ralph and you were holding the torch to him. Today it's different. Oh, good heavens, you you, you don't think I'm grief-stricken over Ralph. Good, that's one less mystery. M- Mr. Spade, what do you want? Your nephew's killer. Oh, does it matter? It does to me. Somebody getting knocked off right under my nose is bad for private detectives everywhere. Oh. 
For a moment, I thought that... Say, wouldn't you rather make some more money? I refuse to marry Lotta. Oh, no, nothing like that. It's the necklace, Mr. Spade, the genuine. What is? I don't know. All I know is the other one isn't. Who told you that? Well, well the p- police know. It's, it's, it's in the papers, isn't it? Not yet. Well, how else would I learn? The murderer is the only one who could have told you, unless you're the murderer. I see. Very well, Mr. Spade. I'll tell you what I know. I'm not as wealthy as you might think. In, in, in fact, I have for four years lived from pillar to post, from hand to mouth, ragtag and bobtail, struggling to make ends meet. Yeah, what you mean is you're eking out a meager existence, keeping your head above water, one jump ahead of the sheriff, stalked by the grim specter of poverty. Is that right? Oh, how well you put it. In fact, Mr. Spade, I'm something of a crook. I've borrowed large sums of money from Colonel Bixby, putting up as collateral something that was not mine to forfeit. Uh Uh-uh, don't tell me. Let me guess. Uh, it was the Rushlight Diamond? Well, you seem to know everything. All but one thing. Why did you think you could palm off a paste copy on an operator like Bixby? He sent you here. I I won't tell you another single thing. Well, then I'll tell you a few things. The only way the Rushlight Diamond could be transferred legally into the hands of Colonel Bixby was by tricking Ralph into marriage with Lotta, since Ralph's wife automatically became the legal owner. With Ralph dead, Bixby would be in line to inherit the diamond from her. Inherit? California state law. Foster parent may inherit from a foster child in absence of any direct heir. Well, why, then he planned. He... He, he'd kill her, too. M- Mr. Spade, we must stop him. She's safe for the time being. I had her thrown into the pokey. They can hold her 48 hours for questioning, but they can hold you longer. They can even hold you as an accessory before the fact. Why? Why, I, I didn't know he was going to kill anyone. Lotta was just going to hand over a million-buck diamond to Bixby out of the kindness of her heart? Oh, no. Lotta wanted to become an American citizen. Marriage is the quickest way. For her, Ralph was the only way. Okay, I'll buy that. Now, tell me honestly, Mrs. Rushlight, what happened to the genuine stone? I honestly didn't know. I wasn't sure. But now there can be only one answer. Nancy with the laughing face? She went with me when I went to the bank vault to get the Rushlight diamond to present to Lotta after the ceremony. Uh She looked after all my jewels, including the paste copy that I habitually wore. Homicide, Lieutenant Dundee. Uh, Spade again, Dundee. I, uh... I think I got the rushlight caper all wrapped up. I'm heading for your office now, so wait for me. And whatever you do, don't let that lot of dame out of your sight. Thank you. Goodbye. Wait a minute, Sam. Wait a minute. Yeah? The lot of dame. She's already gone. Escaped? Bailed out. Custody of her foster father. Wait a minute. I got the name here, sir. Bixby. He's a colonel, and no wonder you're only a lieutenant. Uh, M- Mr. Spade, can't you stay for tea? Not thirsty. Nancy? Nancy, where are you? Oh, here I am, Sam. I-, I was waiting for you. You got the keys to that car out in front? Why, yes. Do you want to borrow it? Yes, with you in it. Why, Sam, where did I put my face on? Let it go. It's as good as lost anyway. Come on. What is this place? are you taking me? Never mind. Just hang on. I'll fly you up to the second floor. <laughs> Sam, that was the shot that sounded like Lotta. You stay here. Don't come in until I call you. Speed, what are Get you doing? Get back in there. Okay. Drop it. No. Drop it or I'll crack your elbow. No. That's better. Now sit down. I want to look this over. Hmm. Looks real cute. Uh Uh-huh, powder burns, gun beside the chair, and what's this? Well, 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 a note in Dutch. It's a suicide note. She killed herself. I can almost believe that. You've handled this very well, considering the bad breaks you've had. Only one thing wrong. Do I scent a bargain? I don't have to bargain. I've got the diamond. All you've got is two murders wrapping on your thick noggin. Don't be absurd. I know who has the real necklace. Then you better talk to her directly. You can come in now. Sam, was that... (gasps) Oh, that poor, homely little dame. What did she ever Stop, do? Stop, you're breaking my heart. She committed suicide. You know better than that. She committed suicide. If the colonel's price is right. Oh. 
Oh, I see. I'll put it to you directly. It's not easy to fence. It'll have to be cut. That'll decrease the value considerably. Say, uh, $10,000, no questions asked. Pardon me, that suicide shot. It's ringing in my ears. I can't hear you. Uh, 20000 50 All right, 100000 Sam, don't be a fool. Take it. I'll give you a real break, uh, Colonel. That's the cops coming after you. No, anything, Spade. What do you want me to do? I want you to try and get out of here. What, what are you going to do? There's the door. Go ahead. All right. I... Thank you, Colonel. Oh. Desperate. Big speed. We're giving you a chance. Come down or we're coming up after you. Come on. Come on. Get up, Colonel. Here he comes. Kevin, it may be a trick. Watch it, Dundee. Here he comes. And that, Mrs. Rushlight, is the crop. A man that went down fighting, Colonel Bixby, didn't need much persuading once they got him under the lights down at headquarters. He confessed to everything, and the murders weren't the worst of it, the way I figure. The worst of it was the cruel way he victimized the poor little ugly duckling, Lotta Van Eyck. It's tough enough to be whipped before you start. Period, and a report. My goodness, that was Mooey Trist Day. I mean, I'm beginning to see why Effie gets so repressed sometimes. Effie? Depressed? That little doll told you that? Only between she and I and the lamppost. She's so sensitive, you know. Not like I, of course. I invariably cry at weddings. You don't say, Bernadine. Uh, you attend uh, weddings often? Hmm? With high frequency, Mr. Spade. You mean frequently? No, no. The last time it was FM. You know, frequency moderation. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> moderation in all things, I always say. You mean you attend radio weddings? Oh, yeah. I've been married six times. My next date is television. You've been married six times? Well, to each his own, Mr. Spade. You mean six men have... Oh, no. No, I only marry my husband. Repetition is the spice of variety, I always say. Is that legal? If it's not after six weddings, what isn't? <laughs> to uh, each his own, as you say. Well, we don't presume to make a career out of it. As soon as we get the mangler and the deep freeze, we're gone on our honeymoon. Well, congratulations, and uh, type this up when you have the time. Mrs. Uh, Bernadine Hemp. <laughs> Every day, more and more men are turning to Wild Root Cream Oil for truly handsome hair. And that's not surprising, for what other leading hair tonic gives you these big advantages? It grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. What's more, Wild Root Cream Oil is non-alcoholic and contains soothing lanolin. No wonder Wild Root Cream Oil is the favorite with so many millions of smart, particular men. Get Wild Root Cream Oil again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Mr. Spade. I'm sorry it took so long, but I kept relapsing into Spanish. Yes, I know how it is. And Effie's typewriter doesn't have any upside-down question marks. Upside down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Take a memo. Call typewriter man. I already have. Oh, um, I almost forgot. You received a telegramic commutation. A telegramic what? A wire. Oh, a wire. Well, open it and read it. In English, for favor. Uh, it says, uh, Dear Sam. Figures. In the haste of my departure, I neglected to warn you about Bur... Well, when I do that one another favor, she'll have silver threads. Who? That ball of fire whom I'm taking the place of in order to be double-crossed of by... Effie? Is she uh, still in far-off Canab? And good rubbish, if you'll pardon the expression. Now, oh, Bernadine, let me see that. Hmm. I, uh, <clears throat> I neglected to warn you about Bernadine. I'm sending the tales airmail special, but in the meantime, whatever you do, don't go to any radio broadcast with her, and if she comes to work in a wedding gown, take the day off. Love, Effie... 
and I had two tickets for honeymoon payoff, and now she went and spoiled everything. Oh, now there, Bernadine, you just have to marry your husband again, that's all. I wouldn't have had the time anyway. I know, it's just the principle. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, uh, buenas noches, hasta la vista. Effie, why did you ever leave me? The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Are you still there? I believe that interpolation is hardly rhetorical, Mr. Spade. To what have you been up, if you'll pardon the expression? And has that girl regained her facilities? I uh, wouldn't know, but her uh, faculties are as good as ever, if you'll pardon the expression. Mr. Spade, sometimes I think you're a regular philanthropist. Don't you mean philanderer? How much money did you make out of that case? Well, I uh, broke even, anyway. That's what I mean. You're a philanthropist. Well, you know best, Bernadine. By the way, was that man really murdered with the bus saw, or was that just publicity? He really was, Bernadine. Why? There just happened to be one lying around. Oh, I don't mean that. Why was he killed? For the wheel of life. Oh. You're not going to ask what that is? Some curio, no doubt. Listen, Bernadine, the wheel of life is, uh... Oh, well. I suppose I don't have to tell you to stay where you are. Just sit quietly with your book in your hand, and I'll be right down to dictate my report on the wheel of life caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Come on, mister, give the gals a break. Treat them to a look-see at a really handsome head of hair, neat, well-groomed hair, the way yours is going to look when you spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Famous Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. So how about it, men? Why hold off any longer when now's the time to get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic? Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I went down to St. James Infirmary to see my baby there. 
Ready, Bernadine, little flower? I'm way ahead of you. Keep it clean. No more than three erasures per page. Okie dokie. Oak. I mean doke. I mean date. Oh, I'd love to. July 11, 1948. To uh, Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco police. Subject, the uh, Wheel of Life Caper. Now, don't go away, Brian. I don't know why these things always have to happen to me. Under private detectives in the San Francisco Classified Directory, they're listed somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 agencies, several with large display ads. But somehow she managed to find me. It's all so strange, Mr. Spade. I hardly know where to begin. Well, the beginning is always a pretty good place to start, Miss O'Farrell. Uh, yes, the beginning. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. Even the buildings along the street seemed to be leaning at a crazy angle. And then I realized I was traveling down a hill. I looked wildly around for something to help me get my bearings, and there was a street sign, O'Farrell, stuck in my mind, so I... Gave it to your secretary when she asked for my name. Uh-huh. And uh, what's your real name? I don't know. I don't know who I am, where I came from, or where I'm going. Mr. Spade, I'm so frightened. Uh, now, wait a minute. A lot of people suffer from uh, temporary loss of memory. Uh, most of them recover. But amnesia is a sickness, and I am not a doctor. Oh. And you won't even try to help me? Well, I can give you the name of a good head doctor right here in the building. There's also uh, missing persons. Oh, but I'm not a missing person. I'm right here. Yeah, I mean, where you aren't, somebody might be missing you, Nespa. But the police! Oh, I'd rather not. I, I might be wanted for some crime. How do I know? You sure you want to find out? Oh, yes, I do. I do. It's terrible not knowing. But I want to find out for myself. Can't you understand that? What do you think I can do for you? You might save my life. From what? I'll try to tell you exactly how it happened. First, I looked at my watch. It was three minutes past ten. The cable car stopped at the corner and a man got on... I couldn't remember ever having seen him before, but then I couldn't remember anything. He sat down beside me, and he caught hold of my arm. I tried to pull away. Well, you can see the marks where he... Yeah. Well, who was he? He acted as if I were... I think I know what you mean. Did you uh, find out who he was? No, no, I was too frightened to speak. What did he say? He sort of growled it out of the side of his mouth, but it sounded as if he said, Lathrop wants to see you. Mm -hmm. You remember anybody named Lathrop? I can't remember anything before three minutes past ten this morning. Well, let's go on with since then. The guy grabs you, said somebody named Lathrop wanted to see you, and then what? I, I went into a panic. I managed to jerk away from him, and I jumped off the moving car, and then I looked in the classified section, and I found you. Why me? Well, I don't know. The name, I guess. A spade to dig up my past. Please, Miss O'Farrell. <laughs> Do you think I'm very silly? No, I think you're very beautiful. I wish you could remember whether you're married or not. Oh, no. Well, at least I have no wedding ring. Uh, what have you got? I mean, besides what's visible. Well, I couldn't find much of anything. I went over my clothing. There don't seem to be any, seem to be any marks of any kind. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you got any money? Well, a little over $300. Let's have it. The purse, too. All right. Uh-huh. Lipstick, aspirin, bobby pins, Kleenex. Uh, nothing here. They couldn't have been bought in any drugstore. Powder. <coughs> hey, what kind of powder is this? Uh, then there was this in my coat pocket. A match folder. Sailor's Rest Bar, Hotel Calcutta, 1100 Embarcadero. Little number written inside. 120. What's that, a room number? I don't know. My purse, you have to destroy it. Here's $10 of your own money. Buy a new one. Wow. Did you find something? Coin, Chinese bit. Good luck piece, probably sewn in by whoever made it, maybe in China. That uh, ring any bells? Mm, no. No, I'm afraid not. Shoe. What? Your right shoe. Let's see it. Take it off. Uh, you aren't going to tear it up the way you did the purse, are you? Uh, dust. Plaster dust. Is that a clue? I don't know, is it? I'm not a detective. Well, you are in this case, baby. If it doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't mean anything. Well, it doesn't. That's everything. What am I going to do? Well, let me see. First, we better give you a name. Oh, Farrell's all right. You look like, uh, well, uh, Lana would do, but, no, well, that's in use. Uh, how about, uh, Poppy for forgetfulness? Poppy O'Farrell. <laughs> that's a funny name. Oh, you think so? Huh? Uh, I think I like it. You do? I think I like you, too. <laughs> I liked her, too. There may have been blanks in her brain, but the 
rest of a figure. In the elevator, I started adding it up. And by the time we reached the street floor, it came to quite a tidy sum. Where are we going, Sam? Far, I hope. But uh, first, we're going to find you a place to stay. Oh, yes, we must be practical. No use overdoing it, huh? Oh, no, Sam, I didn't mean... <gasps> Wait. What's the matter? You remember something? That man, the one who followed me this morning, he's standing right out there waiting. The one in the straw hat leaning against the newsstand? Yes. Where are you going, Sam? You stay here. I just remembered something I hoped I could forget. Hello, Shuggy. What brings you back to town? Do I know you? That doesn't matter. I know you. The name you were using when you blew this town was Shuggy Bellows. You wouldn't take the risk of showing your face here again unless the caper was worth it. You've got a big nose. Keep it clean. You've been tailing that girl all day. Why? Damn what damn? Who's Lathrop? I don't remember. Okay, I'll give you a chance to think it over. Hey, officer! You dirty hey, shamash yelling cop. No, 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 you don't. Come here. Here, no, what's going on here? Break it up. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Spade. Is this fella giving you trouble now? Yeah, what kind of a beat are you pounding here, Clancy? Letting a cheap grifter like this walk around with an arm pit full of gun? Or are they handing out permits to characters like these this day? Uh, these well, days? now, uh, how about that, son? Uh, have you a permit now? And a goop, copper. Oh, so one of them clever lads he is. Well, come along, me bucko, before I lose me temper and give you your lumps now. Stop okay, I'm coming. That's better now. Uh, much obliged, Mr. Spade. I'll pay you for this, Thomas. And a goop to you, too. I was sure he would, but I was also sure that I wouldn't have to worry about him for the rest of the night. I checked Poppy O'Farrell in at the Belvedere, locked her in her room, and told Tiny Stover, the house dick, to keep an eye on her. When I left him, he was, and uh, he seemed to be enjoying his work. Then I headed for the Embarcadero. I found the Hotel Calcutta, but I couldn't find the lobby. There wasn't any. It had been squeezed out by the sailor's rest bar. So I tried the bosun-type bartender. Howdy, mate. You you got business aboard? Yeah, where do I find the purser? He went ashore. All the officers went ashore except the janitor. He's passed out in his bunk. Oh, how about the passengers? Uh, You're in the thick of them right now. They spend most of their time and their money right here. Uh, Which one belongs to 120? You a dick... Yeah, but I got ten bucks. Well, what I can tell you ain't worth it, but thanks anyway. He stayed in this cabin. I only saw him at once. That's when he went ashore. I says to the deck steward, that's room clerk to you, who's a general. He says, name of Coralenko. I noticed him because he was a real creep, see? Six foot four, a solid brass. His head stuck up in the air, and he didn't move nothing from his stern to his shoulders. A real Frankenstein. Hey, do I keep a ten? Yeah. Do I get a look at his room? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Who's stopping you? So I went. Nobody stopped me until I opened the door to 120. Then I stopped myself. It was an inside room with one small window and an air shaft. But it looked as if a flurry of snow had blown in. The floor and the rest of the flat surfaces were sprinkled with a fine, dirty white powder. It wasn't snow, it was dust. Plaster dust. Like the stuff I'd found in Poppy's handbag and on her shoes. I shook the place down, not expecting to find anything. I didn't until I opened the wardrobe. It was the body of a well-dressed ship surgeon, but his uniform was rumpled, torn, and bloodstained. From the look of him, his throat had been cut. I wondered if Poppy would be able to jog her memory that far back. When I found the murder weapon, I hoped she couldn't. I really did. It was not a knife. It was not even a razor. It was an electric buzzsaw. That tore it. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. 
What's more, non-alcoholic wild root cream oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use wild root cream oil too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the Wheel of Life caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Times being what they are, I could use a little publicity. And so could you, Lieutenant Dundee, what with the elections coming up and you with no promotion all these years. This one time, I got it instead of you and wished I hadn't. The morning papers called it the buzzsaw murder and went on shamelessly from there. Horror killing related by private eyes. Stan Slade, ex-Pinkerton man, mum on Mystery Woman. Elderly sleuth, dodges photographers, denies hotel visit, was in bed with Apple and Good Book, says Peeper. There wasn't a word of truth in it, mainly because nobody could get at the facts. I wasted most of the day down at headquarters trying to find out what name Shuggy Bellows had been booked under. Then I dropped in at the Belvedere. Poppy had checked out. I decided to go back to my office and drink poison. I hardly got the desk drawer open when a sobering influence walked in. It was a Mr. Six Feet Four of solid brass. The Frankenstein who had been described to me by the bartender as the occupant of room 120. Excuse me. I am Korlenko. Please, I shall sit down. I am so heavy. Make yourself at home. Oh. Mr. Swade. Uh, Swade. Uh, uh, excuse me. I am so heavy. I, I am Korlenko. So you told me. I am really Spade myself. So... Why are she hiding from me? Who? That girl, Miss Paget. Her, I am paying one month in advance, $300 American. Me, she have dessert. I am not rich, only moderately wealthy. But you understand, it's not a question from Modius alone. That ship's doctor, he was most kind to me. He cared to me even after I arrived. Now he are dead for his pains, his dirty trick. Yeah, 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 I know how you feel. Now, if you'll uh, take it a little easy, I think we'll get farther. You say this girl's name is uh, Paget, and she traveled with you. Uh, from Macau, da. Uh, where she is the Florence Nightingale for Portuguese hospitals, forcing me to employ her, all others being Chinese nuns. That figures. You were uh, sick? No, only I am so heavy, they are breaking my back in traffic accident, a uh, rickshaw collusion. You're uh, wearing a plastic cast? Yes, like a turtle. I am close with my neck sticking out. Look, see? Now it is better as before. The ship's doctor trimmed the rough edges with buzz saw. Buzz, 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 I can walk. But it's like suit from armor, for which I alive. Look. I looked again where he opened his shirt front, exposing the gray-white shell of plaster that surrounded his trunk from collarbone to hips. In a six-inch circle over the left side of his chest, I counted four bullet gouges. I dug one of the slugs out and examined it. It was 32 caliber. The plastic cast, which was molded to the shape of his body, was no more than an inch thick. I didn't see how it had stopped the slugs, but it had. About then, the parts of Korolenko that were not held rigid in the cast began to tremble violently. Why are they doing this? Why? To a virtually helpless man. Why, Mr. Spade? Why? 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 Uh, where did you have that cast put on? Don't I said Macau? The Portuguese hospital there? The same. They are hanging me up with the neck and plastering me. Comes great pain, they put me to sleep from anesthetic. I, I are waking up in ambulance arriving at shipboard. Why you wish I should tell you my operation? More important things we should be discussing. Uh, I think so, too. I think Miss Paget and her friends had something they wanted to smuggle out of Macau and into San Francisco, and you're it. Oh, excuse me. I, I am not comprehensible. Look, I mean, while you were out with the anesthetic, they uh, planted the goods, whatever they are, in or under your cast. Oh, oh, that is why I am so heavy. The wheel, the wheel. The what? The wheel. Look, I show you. He hauled a manila envelope out of his overcoat pocket and waved it in my face. I took it over to my desk and fished out the contents. It was a set of X-ray films. 
three of his spine showing the fractures, four of the skull, three I couldn't figure out, and one of his rib cage, only something new had been added. In silhouette, it looked like the wheel off of a child's wagon. What is it, this wheel? What to do? What to do? Six months, I must remain in this trades jacket. If I remove it, I die. If I keep it on, it, they kill me to get their smuggled. Well, you look to me like the luckiest man alive. That wheel or whatever it is saved your life by stopping four slugs. But still, I shall die. How shall I die? When shall I die? Your best advices, please. Korolenko, I think you'd better die right now. Excuse me? It's the only safe place for you. The morgue. I called my friend Maxie the morgue man, gave him pitch number 137596. He agreed to play along. An hour later, I stood on the curb, head bowed, hat in hand, as the morgue wagon drove away into the gathering mist. Stay facing the way, uh... What do you want, Shuggy? I want to blast this gun straight through you, and I will if you give me any excuse at all. You sound like you mean that, Shuggy. You're getting smart, Shamus. Now get going. Where to? Mr. Lathrop wants to see you. Shuggy, dear boy, you've not failed me this time. This will be the fabled Mr. Spade, eh? Come in, come in, come in. Ah, sit down, Mr. Spade. We'll talk. Tell your guns to get that pistol out of my ribs. Oh, yes, indeed, Sugar. You mustn't overdo it. And get him out of here. I'm tired and nervous, and my price goes up a thousand bucks every minute he's in this room. When I get to ten thousand, I kill him. Then the price jumps to a hundred to take care of me on a murder rap. I should ought to plug you downstairs. Come, come, Sugar. Don't be ungracious. You wait in the other room now. Okay, it's your party. I get mine later. <laughs> oh, dear. His bite's much worse than his bark, Mr. Spade. Don't start boring me so early in the evening. I came here to talk about the wheel. Oh, so you know about the wheel. I do better than that. I've got it. That may well be, but uh, do you know what to do with it? I got two possibilities. I can turn it over to the cops and you with it, or I can sit on it until it hatches. <laughs> A quaint conceit, sir. Round and round the little wheel goes, and where it shall stop, nobody knows. That's where you're wrong. It stops right here. So you better start placing your bets. Yeah, just what do you mean by that, sir? There's part of it. What is it? It's one of the slugs your guns will throw at Korolenko. I got three more just like it that I dug out of him before he was carried to the morgue. Well, huh. an advantage, I'll admit. But uh, hardly worth your while to take advantage of. Don't be too sure of that. Just uh, how much do you know about the wheel? So far, it's been worth two human lives to you at the risk of your own. That tells me all I need to know. Oh, no, not quite. Men have been killed in holdups for a few paltry sovereigns, but the wheel oh, is a horse of another color. Let's not change wheel horses in midstream, Mr. Lathrop. <laughs> yes. You must understand that the wheel has no absolute finitive value. Uh, monetarily speaking, the British Museum might pay close on to 5,000 pounds, hot as it is for the privilege of returning it. <laughs> Occidentals aren't the puka saibs that they once were in the Orient. The theft of the wheel, if countenanced by the Western powers, would have most grave consequences. Most grave. Uh, are you attending, sir? Wake me up when you get to the point. Ah, well, the point, sir, is this. That little wheel, that little wheel of gold, is the wheel of life, which the Buddha himself is said to have received into his hands from paradise. Now... Given such a relic, a few old Buddhist monks can set up a shrine which even in the most miserable surroundings can attract enough pilgrims to outgross Radio City, Madison Square Garden, and Miami Beach in season. To say nothing of Hialeah. Uh, yes, quite. In short, we propose to act as booking agents for the wheel on a royalty basis with a percentage of the house. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring it to San Francisco? But good God, sir. Were we to bargain in the Orient, we should be hacked to pieces in our beds. I'll settle for a lump sum and let you do the bargaining. Uh, and uh, your price, sir? We can talk money later. First, I've got to give the cops somebody for the doctor's murder and for Korolenko. Uh-huh. Well, that ought not to be too difficult. Uh, when may I expect delivery? I'll check on it. I went out to the St. James Infirmary. <laughs> City Mark. Maxie, Sam Spade. Yes, Sammy. Uh, deal's okay. Send it up. The address is... Sam, Sam, wait. Yeah? Sam, you ain't here no more. 
What happened? Somebody claimed him. A girl. Eh, said she's his daughter. What did he do? Went on playing dead like you told him to. Maxie, where did she send him? Uh, Avalon Mortuary, corner of Lynch and Haight. Okay, uh, uh, by the way... Uh, yeah, Sammy? Uh, Maxie, put some clean sheets in that morgue wagon, size 16. I may be your next passenger. At the Avalon Mortuary, the night watchman let me in. He said Mr. Korolenko's daughter had brought an overnight bag and was keeping a vigil by his beer in slumber room number seven. I approached on tiptoe. Just as I reached the door, I heard the most terrible sound I've ever heard. It was a buzzsaw biting into plaster. How deep, I didn't like to think. I did the first thing that popped into my head. I grabbed up a lamp from a console, smashed the bulb, and plunged it into a vase of flowers. As luck would have it, slumber room number seven was on the same fuse box. As luck would not have it, I was facing a desperate woman in the dark. I hugged the carpet while she emptied her gun. I hoped she didn't have a spare. I forgot about the buzzsaw. The room lighted up momentarily from the lights inside my head, and I staggered back against the wall. I waited for her to get her bearings again. There was no hope of me getting mine. Then I heard a big, hollow thud. The whole room shook and the lights went on. Poppy O'Farrell and or Paget lay on the floor under the stony weight of Coralenko plus 60 pounds of plaster. Get up! Get up! You're crushing me! I can't. I'm so heavy. You, uh, you comfortable there, Coralenko? Comfortable in such situation? Do you ask the turtle? Are he comfortable? Is Faker on bed of nails? Is equally here as elsewhere. Yeah, okay, okay. Just just hold her there until I get a statement. And he did. Item, statement by the aforesaid. It was like waking out of a nightmare you can't remember. Everything seemed out of proportion. That was her story, and I had to admire the way she stuck to it. But if you keep trying, I'm sure she'll get back enough of her memory to confess that she planted the Wheel of Life in Korolenko's turtle shell when she decided to double-cross Shuggy and Lathrop. They never tumbled to her hiding place. They were gunning for Korolenko because they thought Poppy was working with him, which was true in a way, but not the way that they thought. That's why they tortured the doctor in an effort to learn Kay's whereabouts. I understand your boys have picked up the rest of the trio, and they can tell you everything except why I conceived the brilliant idea of having Korolenko play dead. Between you and me, uh, amnesia's a handy little gadget to have around, Dundee. I'm trying to draw a few strategic blanks myself. Period. End of report. Pardon me, Mr. Spade. Yes. There are just a few little coincidentals that I do not find entirely reprehensible. Such, uh, such as? Well, I don't want to appear lucid or anything of that type. Believe but... me, you doesn't. I mean, don't it? Oh, you say the sweetest thing. Mm. Uh, but it's about the wheel. Oh, yes, the wheel. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You type that up. I've got to call in about that now. <laughs> Tonight, when you're making out your must-do list for tomorrow, why not include a reminder to get Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair? Honestly, men, you'll be delighted with the neat, natural way Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair, the way it relieves that annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Just try it and see if I'm not giving you a good steer. Make a note right now to call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Uh, Did you assert in the lowdown on the Wheel of Life? I certainly didn't. No, we won't know about that for six months. (laughs) Because definitively, I mean definitely, that plaster cast has to stay on them. Doctor's orders, you know. I won't be here six months from now. You can say that again. But I won't be here six months from now. Stop repeating yourself. But you just said you can say that again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just as distinctly as if I was sitting here. Uh-huh. That's what I like about you, Bernadine. A, a woman of distinction. That's what you are. Well, if you want to take me dancing, why don't you just say so? Bernadine. It's leap year, and I always say discrimination is the better part of value. You are absolutely corrupt. Well, I'm glad I'm right about something. Good night, Mr. Spade. Good night, and I'll say if it kills me, sweetheart. The 
The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tolman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. If you're thinking of volunteering for the U.S. Army or Air Force, here's a word of reassurance. As an Army and Air Force man, you'll become a skilled professional in a specialized field. The training you get will always be useful, not only in military, but in civilian life as well. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Bernadine. Anything wrong? You sound almost human. It's not Bernadine, Sam. It's me, Effie. F. But I'll tell Bernadine about your compliment. How are things? Well, uh, I've made out as best I could. I don't want to... Don't want you to think that I begrudged you a vacation. After all, you have worked hard. You, uh, did deserve it. Sam Spade, is that all you have to say to me? I'm not putting the blame on you. After all, it is a state law, so I can hardly accuse you of letting me down at a time when I needed you most. Well, you might at least ask me if I had a good time. I'm sorry if your conscience bothered you. Oh, well, it didn't. I had a divine time, and I met all sorts of interesting people, mostly men. You don't say. What else? Well, it was this desert ranch, you know, with a lot of, uh, buttes around. You, uh, mentioned those. No, Sam, no, no, no. They're the result of erosion. Those outdoor types, they go to pieces. Sam, are you pulling my leg? Not over the phone, Effie, but stay where you are. I'll be right down to look at your snapshots. And when you have the time, I'll dictate my report on the missing news hawk caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Wild Root Cream Oil. That's the famous name to remember, men, next time you buy hair tonic. And look what Wild Root Cream Oil does for you. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Yes, men, Wild Root Cream Oil is your shortcut to really handsome hair. So be smart. First chance you get, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. of Canab on Virgin River. Canab, the Pearl of the West. Uh Uh-huh. And did I mention the buttes? Oh, well, they're very interesting. The uh, result of erosion. Yes. And it's authentic, too. Faye Hamlin's ranch. You uh, mean a working ranch? Yes. You see, that way you get into the spirit. Mm -hmm. My job was to feed the chickens. And that's how I met him. (sighs) One of the buttes? Oh, Sam, he's a very cultured gentleman. Culture smulcher. What's he do for a living? He, He cures stammering. You don't say. 
What's his name? Charlie Shank. Charlie Shank? He's the founder of the Shank Institute of Arc- Ar- Articulative Correction, which Ar- I should learn. Articulative Correction. Where is this institute? Oh, I have the address here. Um, General Delivery, Butte, Montana. Mm-hmm. You're sure you didn't help him break parole, Abby? Oh, no, oh, no, no. We just went on long walks together. Where to? Oh, different points of interest. Like, uh, like Wolf Canyon. Figures? Uh-huh. He invited me on this camping ship, a trip. Honorable, of course. Mm. But I couldn't go on account of my sunburn. Oh, oh. an awful, awful. Oh, I still got it, you see. Mm. And then, then he went back to Butte. He had to leave in such a hurry, he couldn't even say goodbye. Well. It was a pity, too, because an old friend he hadn't seen in years came looking for him just a few minutes later. With a warrant? No. No, he was an attendant in a nearby hospital. Mental? Oh, yes. Very intelligent. <coughs> he read me some of his poetry. Maybe you've heard it. Um, a loaf of bread, a jug of wine, and thou. Hey, wait a minute. Isn't that the ruby out of Omer Cayenne? That was written by a guy named Fitzgerald. Well, of course. That's his pen name. Quite a penman. Yes, but he's paid his debt to society. And the other time it was a bad beef. Oh, He told me all about it. He cried on my shoulder afterwards. Sweetheart, when you make a mistake, it's a beaut. Sam, nothing happened. Well, I'm glad he cured you of stammering, anyhow. Ready? Oh, yeah. I've got a brand new notebook. Work, you know. Life goes on. I've got a brand new notebook, Sam. I'll just turn over a new leaf. Not a bad idea, dear. (laughs) Uh, date, uh, July 18 to Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, uh, mm, try that again. Mr. Alex M. Youngblood, P.O., Box 317, San Francisco, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Dear Mr. Youngblood, I need a vacation myself. You need Charlie Shank. <sighs> you sound tired, Sam. Fortunately, until I met you, my only experience with any of the men and women who make your newspaper run had been with one of your corner newsboys who shortchanged me two times within as many days. I have not read your rag since. But your name looked imposing, and so did the $300 check upon which you had written it. Per your instructions, promptly at 4 p.m. on the 15th inst, I munched through the litter of your city room toward a door marked A.M. Youngblood, publisher, managing editor, and city editor. I wondered if you were ambitious, frugal, or three men. I did not know that you had good taste until I saw the trim, 20-ish, and toothsome secretary in your outer office. Hello. You're new here, aren't you? Uh, well, I'm not exactly here. I'm just here to see Mr. Youngblood. Oh. The name is Spade. Samuel Spade? Sam, except for my most intimate friends. (laughs) Well, my advice to you, Sam, is to beat a hasty retreat. He's in a foul mood. Oh? Uh, Why? Is he blind or older than he feels? I refer, of course, to your spectacular charm, Miss... uh, If I may call you, miss. Please, this is neither the time nor the place. My name is Phyllis Watson, and my phone number is in the directory, if you're really interested. I could be. Thank you. And if a man answers, tell him you're my French teacher. (laughs) We. You better go in now. If you're late to an appointment with him, you're through. Uh, Do you have any more words of wisdom? No, but I hope you can do something to improve his state of mind. He's been awful lately. Good luck, Sam. Uh, Thank you, Phyllis Watson. Come in, come in. Now, one minute past four. You must be Mr. Spade. That's right. You're almost late. Sit down, Spade. Cigar? Uh, no, thanks. Well, don't expect me to offer a drink. You aren't a drinker, I hope. You don't listen to the radio, do you? Well, you'll not drink in this office. Nothing here but a cooler filled with water from a clean, gurgling, laughing mountain stream. You sound like a reformed drunk, Mr. Youngblood. What's that? Well, it was a good many years ago. If you don't mind, I'll just paste up the weather report for my morning edition before we talk. Oh, you do that too, huh? Yes, obviously. And with good reasons. I remind myself that I was once a copy boy, and I find it a splendid way to, uh, at least once each day, to lower myself to the level of the working man. There we are. Very hot in Phoenix, I see. Mm-hmm. Uh, just what do you want a detective for, Mr. Youngblood? I was coming to that, Mr. Spade. Sorry. Now, uh... <clears throat> Well, first let me warn you that your assignment is a highly confidential one. They all are. In this case, a man's life may be at stake. Mm-hmm. The situation, my newspaper, at my order and under my guidance, has launched a campaign against crime. 
not aimed at the petty criminal, but at the easy living leeches at the controls of the rackets, the hoods in bankers' clothing, the mansion house parasites who direct the pickpockets, the second story men, the housebreakers, who gamble away yeah, half a million uh, dollars a year easy. and uh, pay uh, income tax. Yeah, yeah, don't go to prison. Uh, yes, I and, understand, I understand. Uh, you're after the boys on the safer side of the fences. Uh, uh, nicely put, Spade. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, the long and short of it is this. The author of the expose series, Ray McCulley, my top crime reporter, has been missing for two days. I want you to find him. What makes you think he's still alive? Good heavens, Spade. Why must you suggest that he isn't? Because if I were a mansion-housed parasite in danger of being unhoused by a newshawk, I'd see said newshawk standing in a cement block in the bottom of the bay. I will accept that only when no stone has been left unturned. Every straw and every haystack has been searched. Every... Uh, nook and cranny? Uh, yes. Sounds as though you need at least one police force, Mr. Youngblood. Now, why don't no, you just... No, uh... no, no, no. Impossible. We've already had a brush with the police over the expose. I'll not be dictated to at this stage of the game. I started this investigation, and I'll finish it alone. Well, it's a pretty big order, Mr. Youngblood, but uh, times are tough. I'll see what I can do. Good. I hereby turn over to you all the resources and power of this, my newspaper. When one of my reporters is in trouble or danger, sir, I will spend every penny of my fortune, if necessary, to deliver aid and succor to his side. <laughs> You then gave me Ray McCulley's expose stories to date. I saw why you, his family and friends, and his creditors could have been worried about him. They were hot. One followed a stolen car from the time of the heist through the alteration of the body color, tire brands, license number, motor serial number, to the time it was shoved onto a used car lot. They named names all the way through. And another did the same to the firm of Otter, Badger, and Mole, furriers, and alleged manufacturers of coats from clouted pelts. Ray McCulley had dropped out of sight right after that story had been published. So I left your office hoping that I'd reach the address of Otter, Badger, and Moe before closing time. I did. The plushy showroom was occupied by a dozen attractive fur-bearing models, female, but wax. The live models, male, were wearing padded shoulders, pointed shoes, and coats tailored for underarm artillery. They would have looked more natural at Madame Tassard's waxworks, Bertram the burglar section. Hey, oh, hey, what'll that be? Something for a little woman? Uh, where do I find Mr. Otter? Are you the law? Uh, Leo sent me. He's in his office. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't crowd me. You say you want to see the boss? On business. Stop nudging me with a rod. In there, hey, move. Okay, okay. Hey, your uh, boss. Yes, Woody? Here's uh, Joe here to see you. Leo sent him. Well, nudge him in, Woody. No nudging, Woody. Well, well, well. So Leo's sending a man to see me. I wonder why. If you'll uh, comb this character here out of my hair, I'll try and tell you. Sit down, Woody. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You're new in town. Uh, yeah, that's why Leo sent me. A local muckraker named Ray McCulley interviewed you. He also interviewed Leo, but it didn't get printed yet. Uh, Leo wants to find him. So do I. How can I help? Well, uh, he walked out of here, went to his hotel, wrote the story, and mailed it in. That's the last anybody's seen of him. Uh, Leo was just sort of hoping that you'd already taken care of him. Not yet. That's all I wanted to know. Thanks. Just a moment. Yeah? Leo sending you out alone? Why not? That's a tough boy, that McCulley. He's got plenty of protection. That's what you need. What kind of protection? Go along with him, Woody. Who, me? You're Woody, aren't you? Now, look, uh, look, Mr. Otter. I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth, but the way I see it, this is a... A lone wolf type caper. Hey, what's the matter, hey? You think I'm too good for you? Well, Woody, I wouldn't say that. Good, it's settled then. Take care of him, Woody, and don't mix it up with any of Leo's boys. If he's out to get that rat McCulley, he's our friend. I was beginning to wonder who Leo was. I'd grabbed the name off a calendar on the wall, Leo's van and storage. I didn't know whether he was the Leo Mr. Otter didn't like, and I hoped I wouldn't find out. The best way I could think to keep from finding out was to shake Woody. On the way uptown, I walked them past four police stations. Crossing Market Street, I pushed them straight into the arms of a traffic cop who begged his pardon and let me off with a warning. At the Blue Bottle Bar and Grill, I gave Joe, the bartender, the Mickey Finn sign, but Woody liked it. He ordered another. Then he said he knew a place on Columbus where the drinks were even better. It was called Leo's Place. I wondered if that meant anything. Hey, oh, hey. Uh, who, me, huh? I want your drink. Don't you like this joint? 
Yeah, sure, it's fine. Uh, we're not getting anywhere, though. You really take your work serious. Me, when I go gun for somebody, I go where I'm least likely to succeed. You live long. Yeah. Uh, Woody, what do you know about this guy, uh, McCulley? You hear the puss. He says he's a rat. Yeah, but he said he's got plenty of protection. Who's furnishing it? Well, you see, there's a... Boy, oh, boy. Look at what just walk in. I looked. What I saw was not disappointing. She was wearing a skin-tight black satin with a plunging neckline and a new look only in places where it didn't matter. But she still looked enough like your secretary, Phyllis Watson, to be out of place in Leo's place. She didn't stay there long. She made a beeline through the kitchen to the rear exit. I made a beeline right after her. Woody was breathing down my neck as I started up the rickety outside stairway at the back of the building. I uh, stopped the landing and turned around to face him. See you later, Woody. I didn't wait to see if he made it all the way to the bottom of the stairs. I was more interested in what was going on at the top. A door had opened and Phyllis stepped inside. The man who let her in looked like Ray McCulley. Who are you? Well, the name is Spade. I don't know that name. Your boss hired me to find you. Private Dick. Yeah. Can I uh, talk to you for a minute? Sure. Put your hands behind your neck and walk up slow. Okay. All right. Go inside. Well, what's the matter? You're not acting glad to see me. This is the guy, fellas? Yes. Alex hired him this afternoon. There, you see. Now, uh, what do you want me to tell Youngblood? You're not going to tell anybody anything. Oh. It caught me right behind the ear. The last thing I saw was that plunging neckline as Phyllis rushed forward. I didn't know whether she was rushing to my rescue or to get in a few licks of her own. Five seconds later, I didn't care. As the design of the linoleum slammed up at me, I had just time to wonder why, of all the people who were looking for Ray McCulley, I had to find him. Then I was out, boing, maced for my pains. <laughs> The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now, back to the missing Newshawk caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I was lying on the floor in a room with nothing in it but a sink, an army cot, a square of dirty linoleum, and a body. I staggered to my feet, ran some cold water over my head, and took a closer look. It was Ray McCulley. He was a very dead, crusading reporter. He'd been stabbed clean through with a long-bladed kitchen knife. It set on the handle, property of Leo's place. I went through his pockets. and his wallet, a press card, a police card, union card, and ten genuine, crisp, new thousand-dollar bills. That gave me a line on the killer. He was crazy. So was I. I left it on him, too. Folded up in his vest pocket, I found two newspaper clippings, one from the Chronicle and one from your paper, both weather reports for the same date. It was very hot in Phoenix, according to both papers. But according to your weather report, the temperature in Needles, California, was 135 degrees. That needled me. So did the slip of paper I found on his shoe. The number nine and a date had been stamped on it with a rubber stamp. The date was the same as that of the weather reports. I turned it over. It said Ruthie's booth, Manson Bowling Alley. Down the 
Don't tell me. Let me guess. You're the cigar type. Corona's a panatelli. Uh, thanks. I'm just shopping. Oh. Uh, I got a nice line of notions. So have I. Uh, no, I mean the dolls, the Hollywood dolls. You know, for the bed, only a dollar plus tax. Very reasonable. Say, what's on your mind? Uh, Leo sent me. Oh. Are you going to collect the slips hereafter? Well, uh, not tonight. You see, I'm uh, sort of a troubleshooter. Leo's uh, checking up on some of the numbers that didn't come out right. Listen, I'll tell him to his face. I don't want any part of those wrong numbers. They're scary. Nuts. Who bought this one? Let me see. Oh, last Thursday. Oh, number nine. How can I forget? He put $500. And honest, if he's been around once, he's been around 100 times to see if it paid off. Did it? What's his name? Mr. Spinelli. He buys a slip every day. And if you ask me, he's learned his system. Because he's been winning, you know. Dimes and then a dollar and then $5. And then when he come in with 500 on number nine, utterly dropped dead. Did it win? Where does he live? <gasps> it did. Wait, I'll look on the sheet. Hey, somebody else was in just this afternoon. Give me that address. Hurry up, will well, you? Well, it's right around the corner on Manson, 810. Say, maybe that's his system, 8 and 1. Don't that add up to 9? Hey, what's the matter? Where are you going in such a rush? <laughs> Please, come back later. Tomorrow... Next week. Are you Mrs. Spinelli? Yes, please. I had so much trouble. Is your husband home? Oh, my poor man. They take him away. He is dead. Oh, I'm sorry. How did it happen? Who are you? I'm a detective. Maybe I can help you. May I come in? I... All right. Come on. It took quite a while to gain her confidence, and after that it took still quite a while to piece together the grief-stricken grumble of words that poured out of her. When I got it down in the form of a statement, I asked her to read it over. Item, statement by Mrs. Arturo Spinelli. All the time he played those numbers. I told him they're just a bunch of gangsters. They don't let you win. Then he met this man, Macaulay, a writer for the newspaper. My husband says this man shows him how to win. He wins and wins. Then he goes to bank and takes out all our savings. I begged for him not to do it. But no, no, he was greedy. And this Macaulay poisoned his mind. Sure, he won. He brought the money home in his hand. Ten thousand dollars. I don't want it. I'm scared. I took it while he was sleeping with wine and gave it to the men. I tell him all I want is the 500. He tried to tell me we do good. We help catch the big gangsters. I say we don't want to do so good we get murdered in our bed. So he says, okay. But if I change mine, here is address. I don't change my mind. Because already my husband, he is dead. Has home. Stand. No, I don't change my mind. She signed it, and I left her alone with her grief. I wasn't working for you anymore, Mr. Youngblood. You hired me to find your reporter, and I had. And I wished I hadn't. The rest of it I did for myself. You weren't in your office when I got there, but Phyllis was. I found her behind the city desk in the act of dropping tomorrow morning's weather report into the slot. I grabbed it out of her hand. What? Oh, it's you. Where's your boss? At home, I guess. We'll talk in his office. Come on. Sam, uh, I can explain how I have. You're going to be... explain plenty before I'm finished with you. Sit down. Oh, you... I don't have to be so rough. What's the matter with you? Plenty. I'm stupid. I was stupid to take this job, and I was stupid to play it cagey with you. I should have beaten the story out of you before the trouble started. It's a little late in the day now, but not too late to send you up for McCulley's murder. Oh, you're insane. Ray McCulley was... I'm the only one who ever tried to help and you. And I'm the only one who can place you in that room, not ten minutes before the murder. I told you I can explain Stop why... trying to save your own skin. Spinelli was only one of a half million poor dumb yucks that lose their nickels and dimes and dollars every day in the policy racket. Only he had the bad luck to win. 
There won't be any more lucky dead people like him if I have to make a patsy out of you to stop it. It won't stop it. Nothing will. Ray talked big and brave like you. Now he's dead. Yeah, with 10,000 bucks dirty money in his wallet. I won't let you say things like that. Ray was an honest reporter, too honest. He thought young blood meant what he said about that cleanup campaign. Yeah, he did. He wanted to run this town by himself, clean up his competition. When Ray started collecting material on the numbers racket, he still thought young blood was on the level. But that was before he stumbled onto the thing about the weather reports. Yeah, yeah, that was a new one. The old Dutch Schultz mob used to add up the stock market quotations. If they cheated, they knew their customers weren't good enough at arithmetic to prove it. But who knows how hot it is in Phoenix unless they live there. I don't know what you're talking about. Listen, that's how the number game works, sweetheart. The suckers pick a number from one to ten, see? The operators tally up the slips, and the least popular for that day has to win. The weather report doesn't have to pass through the copy desk, and with young blood pasting it up with a few strategic corrections, it was easy to make their winners look as if they were on the level. Oh. But of course, you had no way of knowing that. You only watched them do it day after day. You know, I couldn't understand why he did those things. It, it seemed silly falsifying a weather report, but it didn't seem as if it could do any harm. What did you meet McCulley for? To get your cut of the ten grand Spinelli was killed for? How dare you? I went there to warn him about Who you. Who killed him? I don't know. You're lying. All right, I'm lying. But I can prove that Ray was on the level. I've got the proof right here. The whole story he wrote on the numbers racket, even naming Youngblood as the head of it, his own publisher. I went there to get it. I was going to take it to another newspaper. Why didn't you? I can't tell you that. You don't have to. Mrs. Spinelli was confused, grief crazed. She had to put the blame on somebody, and when she did, she got her revenge the only way she thought she could. She may have been right about that, but she killed the wrong man. Why didn't you tell me you knew who killed Ray? I wanted to give you a chance to tell me yourself. I'm glad you didn't. And that, Mr. Youngblood, is the crop. I'm sure you appreciate the fact that I gave the double scoop to your paper. Like uh, Mrs. Spinelli, I have my own ideas of vengeance. Besides, it may up your circulation a little, and you can certainly use a little extra money for your defense. Uh, by the way, who's Leo? Uh, period, end of report. But Sam... Yes, Evie? I thought Mrs. Spinelli killed Ray McCulley. The vacation helped. You were absolutely correct. Mrs. Spinelli killed Mr. McCulley, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, why did she kill her husband? I was wrong. The vacation didn't help. You mean she didn't? She killed McCulley to avenge the murder of her husband. You mean Mr. McCulley killed Mr. Spinelli? Effie, stop. I'll go mad. Oh, you need a vacation, Sam. Look, type that up. The clatter of the keys may stimulate you to further cerebral activity. I beg your pardon, Sam? Brain work. Now, shoot. Oh, brain work. Oh, well, you know best. Tonight, men, or first thing tomorrow, get Wild Root Cream Oil and see what wonders it does for your hair. Notice how easy it is to apply. Notice what a neat, natural job it does of grooming your hair. Notice, too, how effectively Wild Root Cream Oil relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. No getting around it. Once you try it, you'll never be without it. So tonight, or first thing tomorrow, call at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Get the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men... Who put good grooming first? Well, here it is, Sam. And you were absolutely right. The typing cleared my mind. It's all clear now except for one thing. Well, let's clear that up right away. Why did Mrs. Spinelli kill her husband? She did not kill her husband. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant, why did Mr. McCulley kill Mr. Spinelli? Kelly did not kill Spinelli. Who's Kelly? McCulley. McCulley's real name was Kelly? Now, let's start all over again. Disregard everything we said up until now. Make your mind a complete blank. All right, Sam. In the first place, McCulley did not kill Spinelli. That's what I said. It was his wife, wasn't it? Now, wasn't it, Sam? Oh, stop teasing me. Sam, why do you look at me like that? Effie, Mr. Spinelli was killed by one of the policy racket hoods to get back the ten grand he won on the numbers game. Then how did the money get into Kelly's pocket? McCulley's. Why do you insist on using his alias, Sam? Effie, Effie that was a tip of the song. I, I mean, look, Mrs. Spinelli took it to him because she was afraid her husband might be killed then for it. Then why didn't they take the money when they killed him? Because Mrs. Spinelli had already taken it. Then she did kill him. Go home, Effie. All right, Sam. I'm sorry I'm so irritable to you, but I, I thought it... Well, it's been so long since oh, I've no, been here, you know, Sam. Angel, and I... Angel, you're just tired. Vacations have a habit of doing that to you. After a week or two in the office, you'll be all rested up again. I'll take it you easy. You act as though you thought my mind were affected. Come here. Oh, Come Sam, here. now don't. My sunburn. Yeah. Oh, it hurts. Mm. 
It's nice to have you back. You look good, too. All tanned and healthy. You're roof. It's great. I think my nose is peeling. Well, don't pick at it. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again. The choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. This is Mad Scientific Detective number 137596. Sam, no matter what anyone says, I'll stand by you. You're nothing of the sort. Not scientific? Of course not. You're two-fisted. Well, thanks, Effie. And that ain't all, Effie. I was actually mistaken for a convolutional melancholiac. Oh, Sam, are you all right now? Wrong diagnosis, Angel. It turned out to be melancholia catatonica. Oh, you poor darling. What is that? Well, it's a thing where you lie motionless and silent with fixed eyes and indifference to surroundings. Unquote. Sam, what happened to you? What hospital are you in? Can I bring you anything? No, Effie, I am now at large. Pull down the blinds, check the corridors for men in little white coats, and set a bottle in the window if the coast is clear. Oh. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the mad scientist caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Nobody has to tell you that a neat personal appearance can have a lot to do with helping you get ahead on the job. Now, the first step to a good appearance is well-groomed hair. And I mean hair that's groomed with Wild Root Cream Oil. Wild Root Cream Oil always grooms the hair neatly and naturally. It relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. Yes, men, to look your best at all times, spruce up with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Come in, Sam. The coast is clear. Where are you? Why is it so dark in here? Oh, I had to put the lights out. The blind stuck. I couldn't get it down. The heat's off, Effie. Let there be light. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. Now, let me look at you. Don't look at me like that and stop whispering. Oh, Sam. Did you get me all upset like that just for a joke? It's no joke, sweetheart. You really sick? Yeah, just sick of some of the types I made in this business. Oh, that. Uh, date, uh, July 25, 1948. To Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police, from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the mad scientist caper. I 
I worry so. Uh, dear Dundee, he uh, looked like a mad scientist, and that's exactly what he was. His eyes had a wild gleam in them, his hair was a wild tangle, and he was wearing a wild assortment of clothing that looked as if they'd been slept in in shifts. He leaned across the desk at me and said, They have stolen my secret formula. They have? Gee, that's too bad. Oh, you think I'm crazy? I don't know yet, I just met you. My name is Raymond Fox. Did that mean anything to you? Raymond Fox, uh, yeah, I think it does, but I don't quite remember what. I invented the helioscope. Helioscope. No, that wasn't it. I also synthesized hydroxylamide photocraniton. That was it. Yes, but unfortunately, production costs were prohibitive. Uh huh. But you didn't let that discourage you. Oh no, 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 indeed. You see, after a brief illness, I was back in my laboratory, perfecting my greatest contribution to science. What may prove to be the greatest contribution of science to humanity. I call it penetron. Penetron. That is what they have stolen. The secret formula for penetron. Penetron. Huh? Now. uh... What exactly is penetron, Mr. Fox, and who are they? Uh, well, penetron is a plastic with a molecular structure which repels atomic radiation more efficiently than lead, yet weighs less than aluminium. Oh, that. Do you realize the significance of this? Well, uh... And imagine, imagine a motor no larger than a cigar box with a power potential that even I don't believe, but they do. Who's they? Grierson Enterprises. Now, how do I know this? When I applied to the patent office to protect my discovery, I received this letter. Here, come on, read it for yourself. Uh, Commissioner of Patents, Washington, D.C. Uh, dear Mr. Fox, your application for patent on formula designated under the trade name Penetron is hereby rejected. Uh-huh. You see. Both yeah. formula and trade name, together with descriptive material identical to yours, have been registered by Mr. Albert Grierson, Grierson Enterprises, San Francisco. Oh, hmm. Very truly yours, George Sherman, Acting Deputy Assistant Commissioner. There, there, there. You, you see? Uh, yes. You don't need a detective, Mr. Fox. What you need is a good patent lawyer. Lawyer? <laughs> I have one. A legal ball of fire named Roscoe Manning. You know this scoundrel? Yeah, he's got an okay reputation. And I am paying for it. $3,000 in retainers. And now he tells me he can do nothing. Insufficient evidence, he says. What is this outfit, Grierson Enterprises? Yeah, a snare and a delusion with, with rented furniture, unscientific ventilation, and dirty work at the switchboard. Mm-hmm. How did they get hold of your formula? Well, it must have been while I was ill. They came and took it away. Out of your laboratory? Oh, well, what does it matter where? I've got to start someplace. Start with a man. I promise you he's a crook. If he steals from me, he's stolen from others. If we can prove that, then I have a case. Well, I can't promise you anything, Mr. Fox, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, uh, will $100 be enough for your retainer? Too much. 25 now on the balance if I can do anything for you. I doubted if I could even earn the 25 but if he wanted to gamble, it was okay with me. The officers of Greer's and Enterprises were pretty much as he described them, a beautiful front, especially at the switchboard. Gerson Enterprises, good afternoon. No, Mr. Gerson's out of town. No, I don't know when to expect it. I'll be right with you. That's good news. Gerson Enterprises? No, he is not. No, I do not, and he doesn't want to talk to you in any case, Mr. Manning. Oh, if it would just stop. Can't you shut it off? I might as well. Nobody seems to believe me anyway. You aren't looking for him, too, I hope. Oh, please, just tell me you're selling magazines or collecting salvage or just anything. My card. Oh, detective. Mr. Grierson hasn't done anything, has he? That's what I want to find out. My client says he swiped his secret formula. Oh, not that maniac. You don't look the type. You know he's mad, don't you? Maybe yes, maybe no. Personally, I'm crazy about money. Mad money, pin money, or dirty money. Uh, Your employer didn't happen to leave any lying around, did he? No, but he has a charge account at a bar downstairs in the building, and it's nearly 5 o'clock. Could you cross-examine me there? I thanked her as gallantly as I could under the circumstances. She said, wait here, I won't be a minute. And while she was gone, I made a quick frisk of the office. The file cabinet was empty. Grierson's desk contained nothing but two unsharpened pencils, tobacco crumbs, a rubber band, some rusty paper clips, an old gas bill, a glass ampule, broken, labeled sodium denadrine for intravenous injection, and a business card from one Roscoe Manning, attorney at law. I stuck the card in my pocket, went back to the switchboard, and in less time than it takes to tell, I was calling her Lois, and she was calling me Sam over cocktails for two. And that's all I know about it. 
I didn't think anything about his taking his correspondence out of the files. He often took work home with him. Mm hmm When was the last time you saw him? Oh, it's been nearly six weeks. You haven't heard from him in all that time? Mm. He was with Mr. Fox just before he left. They had a terrible quarrel. But then Mr. Grayson managed to get him calmed down, and they left the office together. And that's the last time you saw Grayson? Huh? Yes, and it's all very strange. What did that maniac tell you? That Grayson swiped his invention. Do you believe that? I didn't even believe in the invention. Now I'm beginning to think it was worth stealing. Oh, Mr. Grayson wouldn't... He's a brilliant man, you know. Uh, what else has he invented? Well, I don't know. He always had a lot of projects, but... Of course, he never took me into his confidence. Just exactly what is your job? Oh, it's quite simple, really. I just tell people he's an in. Yeah. Look, uh, sweetheart, you really mean to tell me it never occurred to you that there might be something slightly fishy about Grayson Enterprises? I know. Why should it? Because there's a smell of red herring up there. It's in the air. You mean Mr. Grayson's a crook? Well, what does that make me? Worry that out on his time. Drink up. She looked as if she were telling the truth. Though with women, especially blue-eyed women, that doesn't always mean anything. If she had anything more to tell, she obviously wasn't ready yet to tell it. I asked her to come up and listen to my Herb Jeffries records. She said my apartment needed a woman's touch. I handed her a broom. She hit me on the head with it and left. And so to bed. Up the times and phoned my client. He wasn't in. Then I phoned a guy I know who sometimes knows about things and asked him what sodium denadrine was. He said it was a sedative and or truth serum, a mental-type drug. I wondered what Grierson had been using it for during office hours. I also wondered what else he'd been spending money for. I phoned another guy who knows about other things, and he called me back with the name of Grierson's bank, Golden Gate Trust. An hour later, to my surprise, I actually had something to go on. Because in the past six weeks, checks totaling 50,000 bucks had been deposited to Grierson's account, all drawn on the Citrus Exchange Bank of San Anselmo, and all bearing the signature of one Carl Birdwell, M.D. He wasn't hard to find. It was a big place on the outskirts, and the sign on the gate said, Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the Mentally Deranged. Dr. Birdwell's cottage was one of five without bars on the window. He was spraying his roses. Ah! Yo, that's the hysterectomy of Dr. Kobler's. How are those convulsions? Uh, Coordination all right? I uh, can't complain. Got the use of your fingers back? Good. Pick up those shears. I want all those ragged edges cut off the hedges. Well, why don't you uh, hire a gardener out of those uh, checks to Greers and use up all your ready cash? Eh? Uh, I thought you were the hysterectomy. Good Lord, you're that convolutional melancholiac. You're not allowed out on the grounds. God! God! Now, yes. wait a minute, doctor. Matter. This one acting up. Take him back. I sent for the sister deck to me. This is the wrong man. You're huh? crazy. Come, Come on. Let go of me. I'm not a patient here. I'm a detective. Yeah, and I'm I'm Sherlock Holmes. Come on, now back to the violent war. Come on, lay off. I got an office in San Francisco. I can prove it. One three seven five nine six. Okay, Doctor Watson. But come on, come on. And in more time than it takes to tell, due to the guard's jujitsu, I was disrobed, straight-jacketed, and rolled into a wet sheet. A full-fledged inmate of the Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the Mentally Deranged, which is exactly where I belong for having taken Mr. Fox's 25 bucks. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic wild root cream oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for wild root cream oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use wild root cream oil too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs>
And now, back to the Mad Scientist Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I have been shot, stabbed, slashed, pistol whipped, and sapped into unconsciousness. But until you have spent a night rolled up in a wet sheet, Dundee, you don't know what punishment is. You feel hot and cold at the same time, too miserable to sleep, too exhausted to stay awake. And after four hours of it, you just give up and join the crazies pushing up the daisies. There's only one thing I can say in favor of the Mary F. Hotchkiss Hospital for the mentally deranged. They get the patients up early. By 6.30 in the a.m., I had been rolled out of the sheet. By quarter of seven, I had thawed out enough to be taken out of the straitjacket by an orderly. I was glad to be out of it because it was very heavy, and that gave me an idea. I picked it up and swung it. In less time than it takes to tell, I was in the orderly's uniform, out of the violent wing, and shuffling up the walk through Dr. Birdwell's rose garden and through his cottage door. Good morning, Dr. Birdwell. Good, uh, good Lord, who let you in here? What do you want? I was trying to tell you yesterday when I was so rudely interrupted. Hey? Oh, yes, the detective. Did you say Grierson sent you? I didn't say that. I'm afraid you'll have to be absolutely specific or I can't help you. All right. My client is an inventor who claims that Mr. Grierson stole a formula from him, got a patent on it, and stands to profit to the tune of about a million bucks. The last two items check. I don't know whether Grierson's a crook or not. He's into you for 50,000 bucks, so you might know. Uh, this inventor, pale eyes, contracted pupils, big mop of hair. That's a fair description. Fox. Raymond Fox. He's a patient, escaped from this hospital. That man, Mr. Spade, is a homicidal maniac. If you jog your memory, you may recall the case. Sacramento, 1935. Sacramento. Wait a minute. Chemistry professor, lab explosion? That's the case. Two of his colleagues, whom he irrationally suspected of stealing the formula for the explosive he used to blow them up. Are you sure they didn't? The man was adjudged hopelessly insane. He must be returned to us. He may murder Grierson, he may murder you. But he will commit a murder if he remains at large. Perhaps more than one murder. You must help us, Spade. Like you, Doctor, I can't help unless you're absolutely specific about a couple of things. Your connection with Grierson, for instance. I invested in Grierson's firm. Uh-huh. How did Fox meet Grierson? He was allowed a certain degree of freedom here during his rational periods. I, I guess that he went through my papers or overheard one of my conversations with Mr. Grierson. Mm-hmm. Did you know he retained a lawyer? Hmm? Manning, smart patent lawyer. You must think Fox has a case. Oh, surely not. Grierson thinks so, too. You've talked to Grierson? No, but I've examined his bank statements. The bank allowed that? I told him I was Grierson's attorney. The point is, Grierson is broke. Why? Because he's paid out every penny you gave him to the order of Roscoe Manning, attorney at law. And you know what I think, doctor? Yes? I think Raymond Fox is crazy like a fox. <laughs> I had the same idea about Dr. Birdwell, but I didn't say so. I didn't feel up to spending another night in a wet sheet. I also didn't feel up to the interview that was awaiting me outside the gates. A limousine, only a little longer than a hearse, was standing at the curb. A round pink head with a gray Hamburg on it bobbed out at me from the driver's seat and said, Mr. Spade? Yeah? Roscoe Manning, how'd you do? About 49,975 bucks less than you've done in the caper so far. <laughs> the law is a lucrative profession, my boy. <laughs> uh, get in. I'll drive you back to town. No charge? Uh, I'll even give you some free advice, sans retainer. <laughs> well, sir, <laughs> you are an elusive chap. I've had the devil's own time catching up with you. How did you? I won't ask why. Well, I am not without resources. Now, uh, as to our mutual client, Mr. Fox, uh, obviously you've learned a good deal about him. Dr. Birdwell says he's cuckoo, and it's only a toss-up which one of us he's going to blow up first. Well, just about what you'd expect from a medical man. If you'd listen to as much conflicting medical testimony in court as I have, you'd take them all with a grain of salt. Or should I say, soda mint. Or uh, sodium denadrine? That's a mysterious remark. I was just trying it on for size. It didn't fit. Mm -hmm. Well, sir... Here is my proposition. As to Fox's sanity, it's of no importance. He has money, and I think he has a case. We can always get a doctor to say he's back in his right mind. Where do I fit into your scheme? You just keep looking for Grierson. And uh, watch that secretary of his. I don't trust her. 
Anything else? Oh, I, I almost forgot. Here's $500, and here's your ticket to Chicago. <laughs> I don't know why, but somehow I got the impression that Mr. Manning was trying to get rid of me. He should have used that ticket to Chicago himself. We stopped at Sausalito for breakfast, and the condemned man ate a hearty meal. We drove the last mile through the marina district and pulled up in front of his house. Well, sir, have a nice trip. Or uh, take the car, Mr. Spade. I'll pick it up at the depot. Uh, goodbye. It's been charming. Goodbye. He backed across the sidewalk, waving, and I waved back. Then he went up three steps, put a key in his door, and opened it. It didn't do much damage to the house, but all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Roscoe Manning back together again. I got out of the car and just made it up the steps when it happened again. I hated the look, but I did. Where the limousine had been parked with me in it was a smoking heap of scrap metal. I then headed for the nearest phone booth and pausing only to inspect it for mines and booby traps, dialed the number of Greer's and Enterprises. Greer's and Enterprises. Lois, Sam Spade. Sam, darling, thank you for the present. What present? I haven't had a chance to open it yet, but I think I can guess what it is. A traveling clock. You mean a package arrived and it ticks? Oh, darling, don't be such a tease. Now, Lois, listen. Oh. Throw it out the window. No, don't do that. Pedestrians, innocent bystanders. Uh, have you got a metal wastebasket there? I think so, yes. Well, fill it up with water and throw the package into it. And ruin my lovely clock? It is not a lovely clock. It's a lovely booby trap. Oh, go on. I'm You're... serious. Manning just got one of them, and what's left of him is on the way to the morgue. Oh, I think I'm going to faint. Lois! Lois! Wake up! Pour some water on yourself. Hello, hello! <laughs> Let me through here. Come on, let me through. Lois. Lois. Oh, you're okay. Glad of that. All right, she's all right now, you people. Come on, get out of here. She's all right. Come on, get up. You're not hurt. What happened? It exploded in the water. At least you had sense enough to do what I told you to. Oh, this was a new dress. Now look at it. It looks fine here. Put this coat around you. I don't think that was a very funny joke, Sam. Neither do I. Now, uh, try and forget your clothes for a minute. And try and answer a few questions for me. There isn't much time. Sam, what is it? I want you to be very sure of this, Lois. Try and remember accurately. How many people has grass and seen since he opened this office? Well, not very many. It was hardly ever in. That's strange. Now that I think of it, I can only remember two. Mr. Yeah. Manning and that mad scientist man, Mr. Fox. Yeah, did you hear any of the conversation between Grierson and Fox? Uh, he just screamed at Mr. Grierson about how his invention had been stolen from him. Then it sounded as if they scuffled, and all of a sudden, Mr. Fox calmed down. Mm -hmm. When they came out, his eyes looked funny, as if he'd been hypnotized. Yeah. Uh, what does uh, Grierson look like? Oh, he must have been quite handsome at one time. He's sort of like Gregory Peck with a mustache, only fatter and balder and older. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it exactly like that, but I can see what you mean. But you've never seen him. Don't make book on it, but I think I have. I made three phone calls. One to a crime reporter I don't like very well, giving him a false story on the death of Lois, Grierson's secretary. Another to my client, the mad scientist, alias Raymond Fox, and one to Dr. Birdwell. Then I went to my apartment and waited. My client arrived five minutes before the doctor. When Birdwell came in, my client said, Aha! That's he! He stole my secret formula! Now, now, Raymond, you're getting confused again. No! I'm the doctor, don't you remember? Th th that's not true. Your name is Grierson. Oh, he's much worse. He's identification. Now, you must try to remember, Raymond. Nobody's going to hurt you. <laughs> But you'll be much sicker if you don't remember. But I do remember. I remember everything. Do you remember setting the bombs at Manning's house and the one you sent to Mr. Grierson's office? No, 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 no. Grierson isn't dead. You're Grierson. No, Grierson isn't dead. Only that poor girl. No, no, no. She didn't steal my formula. It, it was you. Oh, you're trying to mix me up. I'm trying to help you. Now, roll up your sleeve. I'll give you something to quiet no. your nerves and we'll go back to the hospital. Put it away, doctor. You've helped them enough. Huh? Now, look here. This man is my patient. He needs medical attention. I won't argue with you, but I think he'd better get it from some other doctor. Right now, he's making more sense than you are. Ha. Just ha. keep on the way you're going, Spade, and I'll have you back in that wet sheet. I did it once, and I can do it again. Sit down. 
You got delusions of grandeur. <laughs> Stop shaking, Raymond. I said you're making more sense than he is, and I can prove it. <laughs> you think you're very astute, don't you? No, I'm stupid, but I'm lucky. I should have tumbled the whole caper when I found that you'd invested 50,000 smackers in Grierson Enterprises. When I found out that Raymond was an escaped patient, I should have tumbled to what that Denadrine vial was doing in Grierson's desk. I should have known then that you and Grierson were one and the same person. Ha, <laughs> I, I, I told when you. When I discovered that you'd paid Manning all that shakedown money, I should have known you were planning to knock him off and everybody else who could identify you. But it didn't work out that way. I got out of the car before it blew up. Dumb luck. And you can identify me as Grierson? I don't have to. <laughs> oh, God. Surely you're not counting on Raymond's sanity to that extent. He can't even remember that I was his doctor. Can you, Raymond? You're trying to mix me up. Did you, you stole my formula. I didn't kill them, did I, Mr. Spade? Now, lie down on the couch and relax, Raymond. Don't worry about a thing. <laughs> well, Doctor, what now? You relax, too. Okay, Lois, come on in. What? Lois! Why, Mr. Grierson, have you been sick? How dare you? How dare you ruin all my plans like this? You stupid girl! Oh, oh, oh. Right. Okay, that's enough. Come on, get back there. Get back. Sorry, sweetheart. I didn't mean to let him get that close to you. What were you trying to do? It was an experiment, just to see what would happen. It did. So that's the way your scientific dictators work. For a hard-boiled chap, you have the vaguest way of doing things I ever heard of. Well, uh, plans are all right sometimes, Doctor, and sometimes just stirring things up is all right if you're tough enough to survive and keep your eyes open so you see what you want when it comes to the top or something. A uh, spade, Dundee. I'm at home. I've uh, got two homicidal characters here, one sane and one insane. Now, if you can tell the difference, I'll let you give the story to the papers. And that, Lieutenant D, is the crop. You uh, picked the wrong one. Figures. It's as simple as this. Raymond Fox was the loony... But Birdwell, alias Grierson, conceived and executed the whole scheme, including the explosions. Don't worry about Fox. He's now back at the hospital working on a new secret formula. I don't know what it is, but it might be an anti-truth serum serum, because that's how Birdwell got the Penetron formula, by using truth serum on the mad scientist to make him talk. Any way you figure it, he's crazy like a fox. His enemies are all dead or on their way, and he's as snug as a rug in a bug house. Period. End of Looney Tune. Well, of all... Well, just imagine. Well, it takes all sorts to make a world, I guess. Well, I guess you never spoke a truer word, Effie, but don't forget, a stitch in time saves nine. Don't feel too badly about it, Sam. Better late than never. You took the words right out of the horse's mouth, but it's later than you think, Angel. Type that up, Angel, and while you're at it, see if you can think up a way to teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> Say, mister, if you haven't tried Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, why not get it tonight or first thing tomorrow? You'll be glad you did, for Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally without giving it that plastered-down look. Wild Root Cream Oil also relieves annoying dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. Simply step up to your drug or toilet goods counter and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil in the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. And I've been thinking over what you said. Which? About teaching an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. You're only as old as you feel, Sam. Then send in the application for my old age pension. Oh, Sam, I won't let you talk that way now. You're just tired and nervous and run down. Yeah, backaches, stay up nights, sour racket. You're just feeling sorry for that Mr. Fox. I wouldn't worry about him. As you pointed out, he's safer where he is for all concerns. Mm -hmm. And after all, necessity is the mother of invention. What's that got to do with anything? Well, he's an inventor, isn't he? Oh, that. You see? All's well that ends well. Good night, Sam. Good night, Pollyanna. Pollyanna? Oh, she's the glad girl. Oh, no, Sam, that's Shakespeare, that old... You know best. All ashore that's going ashore. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. 
Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get, get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, how did it go? It was the end, Effie, but the end. Oh, Sam, not another one of those society things. Depends on what you mean by society. Well, you know, Sam, cafe society. Cocktails for two, hands across the table, make it another old-fashioned flurry. Let's not lose our head, Effie. Uh, nothing but double martinis, very dry, with two olives, sweetheart. Two olives? Mm -hmm. Oh, Sam, isn't that overdoing it? It was all overdone, sweetheart. That's what cracked it. Now, stay right where you are. I'll be right down to mix up my report on the dry martini caper. Get it? Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. August is always a great vacation month. And for those of you planning to take your vacation soon, let me suggest that when you're packing, be sure you include a bottle and a handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. For no matter where you go, you can always depend on Wild Root Cream Oil to groom your hair neatly and naturally, relieve dryness, and remove loose dandruff. Yes, you can take it with you on your vacation, and you should. Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Wise as an owl, sober as a judge, F. Oh. Well, the way you talked on the phone, I thought you'd drown the shamrock, kiss mm -hmm. the black betty, splice the main brace, decorated the mahogany, made a Dutch bargain, or, in a word, gone to give a Chinaman a music lesson. Effie, I wish you'd spend more time with Harper's Bazaar while I'm gone and less with the thesaurus of slang. Ah. Uh, Didn't know I could say that. Are you sober? Well, I've been riding the choo-choo, drinking Adam's ale. And if you don't believe it, just ask me to walk a chalk. Okay, heelsy toesy, arms akimbo, eyes glazed. Yes, Sam. Now oh, then, uh, tip of the forefinger to the tip of the nose. Oh, oh, Sam, it makes me dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie? Dizzy go. Oh, Sam. Exactly. And uh, you are not sewn up, shagged, shellacked, shickered, stuccoed, tap shackled, stiffo, or real crazy. Well, you know best, Sam. Good. Now try this one. Yes, Fred. Uh, sitting posture, limbs cruciform. Cheesecake style. Oh, Sam. That's it. Now place the notebook. Uh-uh, just a little higher. Good. Yeah. Now apply the tip of the pencil to the top of the fool's cap and proceed viz. Viz. Date. August 1st, 1948. To Mrs. Netta Martini, 1000 Marina Boulevard, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Dear Netta. The first I knew of the caper was day before yesterday morning when I saw your husband's picture in the paper. It was one of those lovingly retouched executive-type photographs of a man in his late 40s or early 50s 
graying at the temples and wearing an embalmed man of distinction look. The story was headlined, Corporation Head Waylaid by Mysterious Assailant. Chauffeur foils would-be kidnappers at offices of Martini Trading Company. The item under it wasn't as thrilling as the headline. It sounded as if he'd been knocked down for his wallet and the attempted kidnapping had been dreamed up by a bored city news reporter. I tossed it into the wastebasket along with my morning mail and went back to the police gazette. On page three, the phone rang. You need garage, Harry speaking. Mr. Spade. One moment, who's calling? Gordon Martini. Not uh, Gordon Martini, the corporation head waylaid by mysterious assailant. Chairman of the board and there's nothing mysterious about it. Then what are you doing on this phone? I can't talk on the phone. Where are you? In a hospital? I left that pest house this morning. I'm at my residence, 1000 Marina Boulevard. Mm -hmm. It will take you exactly 20 minutes by cab. You will meet me in front of the building and we'll have our conference in my car en route to the office. Where's your office? Downtown Post Street. Oh, why don't I meet you there? I'm a busy man. have a full calendar. I'm already late due to all that hospital red tape. But I can fit you into my schedule if you'll hurry. Now look alive, man. Well, it's a little early in the morning, but I'm trying hard. Good. What will you want for a retainer? I'll let you know if I decide to take the job. Fair enough. 20 minutes. I'll expect you. I uh, should have looked more alive. It took me two minutes to get onto the street, one minute to flag down a cab, and 18 minutes to reach your address letter, a total of 21 minutes. As my taxi drew up to the curb in front of the canopied entrance to the corner apartment house at 1000 Marina, I saw your husband pacing indignantly up and down in front of the entrance, pausing only to glare at the outsized chronometer on his left wrist. His gray Hamburg was perched atop an outsized turban of gauze bandage that decorated his head. Ah, are you spade? You're exactly one minute and uh, 22 seconds late. Hours are made of minutes, minutes are made of seconds. And killing this seemingly negligible interval of time, you have wounded an hour. Oh, I have. Well, I'm sorry. The uh, traffic's pretty heavy out here this hour of the morning, you know. And you should have started a minute and 22 seconds earlier. I'm sorry there was a bore on the telephone kept talking about how valuable his time was. Yeah, well, don't apologize. Only waste more time. Now, here's your check, $100. My car's just around the corner. I paid that chauffeur a large salary. We mustn't keep him waiting. In the meantime, you may as well start earning your fee. I've been earning it for the past uh, 22 minutes and 22 seconds. Wait. Uh-huh. I suspected as much. Do you drive a car? Yeah, you mean uh, one man drives all that? Uh, I see him, that rascally chauffeur of mine. Sleep in the back seat. All right, come out of there, you. Hey, hey, watch! Oh. I was behind him and a little to the right. The shock of the rapid-fire 30-caliber slugs lifted him off his feet and knocked him against me. I went down under his 300 pounds of dead weight. By the time I rolled him off of me and got up, the gunman had jumped out of the limousine and into a gray sedan that was double parked alongside. In the welter of traffic on the boulevard, I didn't dare risk throwing a shot after him, but I did get the first three numbers of the license plate before it buried itself in the heavy stream of AM commuters. That's when the air changed from exhaust fumes to something out of a Persian garden. I turned and looked for the first time into your Nile green eyes, Netta, and saw you twisting a handkerchief in your pale hands I might have loved beside the Shalimar, but on Marina Boulevard, they looked like hysterics dead ahead. Who, who did it? You saw him. Don't lie to me. Why don't they come with hey, the ambulance? Why are all those people standing around there staring at me? Make them go Calm away. Down. Make them go away. Take I can't it. stand it. No, stop it, will you? That's better. Now, come on over here. Who are you, his wife? Yes, and it was all my fault. This is the end. I called Ernie out the window and asked him to come upstairs. I, I wanted him to return some lingerie. They sent the wrong color, Pete. Yeah, yeah, who's Ernie? He's our chauffeur. I was looking for the exchange slip when we heard the shots. Is he dead this time? Yeah, don't go to pieces. Poor Gordon, he had so many enemies. He didn't drink well, you know. People dropped us like flies. Well, they certainly dropped your husband. Are you a policeman? No, but I'll do until the real thing comes along, which is right now. If I were you, lady, I'd uh, go back upstairs and relax. They'll get to you soon enough. Yes, I suppose you're right. Poor Gordon, he looks so natural stretched out on the pavement. Yeah. I, I keep thinking he'll get up and stagger on into the elevator. He didn't drink at all well. Go on, will you? All right, I'm going. Oh, Ernie, where did you go? Down at the garage. I, I heard a car drive in. Poor Mr. Martini, it, it's all my fault. No, Ernie, it's mine. If I only hadn't mislaid that exchange slip. What? You know, when I called you out the window to come and get that package. Oh, oh, that. What do we got here? Who's the witness? Me. Oh, Spade. Lost another client, huh? Not quite. I hadn't cashed the check yet. Well, they got him anyway. All right, clear a space in there. Let him through with that stretcher. All right. All right. Step over here out of the crowd, Sam. I want to get that statement. Hey. Yeah. Okay, Gary, take it down. Got a pencil? Yeah, and I want it back. Let's have it. 
This guy is Gordon Martini. Mm-hmm. He headed up a local firm, the Martini Trading Company. Yeah. Last night he was working late at his office. Got boinged. All right. Phoned me this morning. Didn't know why. Thought maybe he wanted a bodyguard. Anyway, he needed one. Mm-hmm. Gunman was uh, crouched in the back seat of the limousine, shoved the carbine out when Martini opened the door. Carbine, huh? Didn't get a good look at him. You can see why, the way it's closed in. No side windows. Yeah. Foreign car, isn't it? Stop drooling. You can't afford one. You getting all this? What about the getaway? Martini fell on top of me. I saw the getaway car on the back of his head. Yeah. The car was a gray sedan. Mm-hmm. The back of his head was a standard make, too. Only got the first three digits of license plate, uh, 5D9. 5D9. Anything else? Yeah, give me back my pencil. The homicide boys want some help. They know my fee. Mr. Spade. This is Martini. Why aren't you and Ernie upstairs getting your alibis shaped up? Oh, please, I, I can't face the questions just yet. Would it be legal if I just avoided them till I can collect myself? I don't know about legal, but it might be smart. Where can we talk? What do you suggest? Well, there's a little cocktail lounge up on Lombard where Ernie and I all... Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's just around the corner. Very handy. Let's go. Against my mother's advice, I should have listened. But, well, that's why I married Mr. Martini. Well, uh, that brings us up to 1943, and it's only uh, quarter of 12. You're just like him. Always holding a stopwatch over my head. Always? Well, he drank, you know. You told me that. But it's much more important than you think. He often fell down and bumped his head. You mean that mysterious assailant that waylaid him last night in his office was a double martini? Two pitchers full before dinner. Two? Ernie had to carry him up to his office. Well, what did he go up there for? Oh, he had an appointment with the vice president of the firm, Mr. Nesbitt. Something had come up and he wanted Gordon to sign some papers. I don't know what. It wasn't the first time. I waited outside in the car. After Ernie had taken him upstairs, he came back to the car and we talked. Uh Uh-huh. Ernie has alibis upstairs, downstairs, and all around the house. Well, then when the others came out and Gordon didn't, Ernie went upstairs to see why. Others? Mr. Nesbitt and who else? Mary Callahan. Secretary? No, she's an attorney. And if you think everything was legal between those two, well... (laughs) But after all, who am I to call the kettle black? Now, what are you trying to tell me? That she got him drunk so they could make him sign some papers? That he got himself drunk so he couldn't write his name? Or that he just got drunk and fell down? Between you and me, I think she pushed him down a flight of stairs. In his condition, he'd never remember. Why are you putting a finger on the Callahan dame? Well, what would you think? She was the last one out of the building. Why didn't you want to tell all this to the police? Well, I didn't want to talk about his drinking. Things were bad enough already. That would have been the end. Well, that's as good an answer as any. What do you want me to do for you? Prove that she did it and Ernie didn't. I'll let you take care of Ernie. Oh, no. I don't want to alibi him unless I have to. He might get the wrong idea. You mean I've got the wrong idea? He might think it meant I still care for him, and I don't. I can't stand him anymore. The way he chews those toothpicks. (coughs) And besides, if his alibi is too good, I might have trouble about that carbine in the back seat of my car. Pardon me, it sounded as if you said you might have trouble about a car being in the back seat of your car. That's what I said. Where is your car? In the garage. But somebody had it out this morning. They, they scraped the fender coming back in and they ran into the wall. They must have been in an awful hurry. Tell me, this car of yours, it wouldn't be a, a gray sedan? Yes. License number? Oh, wait a minute. It's on my key ring. Uh, here, 5D9... That's enough. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I, I couldn't get up the nerve. After I heard you tell that policeman the gun that killed Gordon was a carbine and the gray sedan and all that, well, it's the end. I hoped you were right, but I didn't think so. When I went to look at the gray sedan in your garage, I knew you were wrong, dead wrong. It was the getaway car, all right, and the carbine, as you know, was proven later to be the one that killed your husband. But Ernie had turned into a very poor suspect indeed. He was hugging the carpet between the front and rear seats, and when I nudged him, he didn't move. He'd been shot at closer range than Gordon Martini, and the killer had used only one slug. It was planted in the base of his brain, which made him not only a very poor suspect, but a very dead one. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. 
Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. And now back to the dry martini caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Sorry, Mr. Nesbitt is in conference. I'll see that he gets your message. Well, what can I do for you? I, uh, would like to see Miss Callahan. Miss Callahan is in conference with Mr. Nesbitt. Good. I would like to see them both. But I have orders not to disturb them. You do not have to. I will. Just a minute. You can't go breaking in like that. Yes, and I'll tell you something else. He won't ever get away with it. Why, everyone in this town knows about your underworld connection. Why, you doddering old fool, when I get through with you, if you don't go to the gas chamber for Gordon Martini's murder, you wish you Chow. had. If I go to the gas chamber, it'll be for killing you, not Gordon. Oh, you said it. Oh, why didn't I have witnesses here? <clears throat> Miss Callahan? Oh. Did you hear that? Uh, you weren't talking loud enough. I didn't hear a thing. Well, come on in here, and I'll tell you a thing or two. Uh, close that door. Now, sit down. Thanks. I listen better on my feet. Oh, so you're the detective Netta Martini employed, eh? Uh, what's she paying you? That'll depend on how much I have to do for her. Well, I'll tell you how much you'll have to do for her. You'll have to make a case against me, and that's not going to be easy. Uh, why do you think she's out to get you? Why, indeed. <laughs> For years, this moth-eaten mouthpiece, this parboiled Porsche, you... has been victimizing poor Gordon, taking advantage of his weakness for drink. Oh, you... Now that she's liquidated him, she appears with 55% of the common stock. <laughs> Motive enough, eh? Why, well, uh... you fraudulent old fool! I simply bought up his debts and threw an attachment on those stocks. Unethical, but perfectly legal. Uh, look, But uh... you're not even a proper thief. You're nothing but a bumbling old embezzler. Now listen here. You had here. to tell because he was going to call in the auditors look over those books of yours. The dean of double entry, Mr. Spade. Look, look, will you save this for the courtroom? I'm saying. Now, you've convinced me. You're both crooked. I'll see that you both go up for something. That's a promise. Oh, Mr. Spade, I gave you credit for better sense. Do you know that this Medusa of the magistrate's court, this harpy of the Hall of Justice, what? tricked him into changing the beneficiary of his insurance the very night she pushed him down the stairs? And you were all in favor of it when you thought you held the controlling interest in the company. Answer that. You uh, see, Mr. Spade, he can't answer that. Oh. Good, good. I'm glad one of you is temporarily lost for words. Now, I only want to know one thing, and I want a straight answer, and if either one of you starts off on another speech, I'm going to push you into the nearest cloakroom and lock you in together. Why, you wouldn't dare. Try me, sweetheart. <coughs> well, uh, what do you want to know about this Amazon ambulance chaser, this trilby of the traffic course? Uh, 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 uh. Watch it. Well, what do you want to know? About Martini's insurance policy. Now, you say he changed the beneficiary. Please answer in ten words or less. Who was the beneficiary, and who is the beneficiary now? I'll have to answer that question in two parts. The beneficiary was his wife. He changed it to the Martini Trading Company, a corporation of the state of California. Thank you, and goodbye, Mary Callahan. And that netta took the heat off of you for the time being, which made things tough for me. Because Callahan and Nesbitt were so horrible, I never wanted to see them again, even to testify against them in court. I was sure of one thing. None of you had pulled the trigger of that carbine. There'd been a hired killer behind it, and the way he operated, taking crazy chances in broad daylight in a crowded street, told me an important thing about him. That night, I made the rounds of the joints. At a plant called the Bing Room, I found a bouncer who'd tossed out a customer that run up a bill and tried to pay it with a thousand dollar check. He sent me to the Atlas Hotel. The Atlas Hotel is off of 3rd Street down near the railroad yards. Not even a flea bag. The fleas sickened and died a long time ago. They couldn't take it. And from the look of the guests sprawled out in the mission furniture of the lobby, they wouldn't be able to much longer. 
A half-dead room clerk came back to the land of the living long enough to mutter a room number and wave me feebly toward a flight of crummy stairs. Yeah, what do you want? You, uh, Hack Hartman? Hey, you got anything for me, huh? Yeah, I got news for you. Get back in the room. I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on in. Drop the shiv. Yeah, I'll drop it. I'll fix you. I'll cut you good. I'll cut you. I'll cut you. <laughs> I'm glad you did that. You'll make it easy for me. Now, get over there. <laughs> Leave me alone. Leave me alone, huh? I'm not feeling so good. You can feel a lot worse. Who hired you to put the burn on Martini? You don't get nothing out of me. Who gave you that check? Oh, leave me alone. I got all night, Hack, and I feel better than you do. Now, what did you do with that check? I'll shake it if your teeth come out with it. Come on. All right, all right. Stop it, stop it. I don't feel so good. Okay. Where? Pocket. My shirt. Don't reach. I'll get it. It was a company check, which is what I'd expected. It was for $1,000 drawn on the Golden Gate Trust and Loan. But I wasn't expecting to find the signature on the bottom line. It was signed in a bold, firm hand, Gordon Martini. Who was the penman on this? He wrote it himself, right in front of me. What was it supposed to be for? I, he, he wanted I should knock off his brother. You get mixed up? Well, he's dead, ain't he? That's what I mean. Gordon Martini's dead. Ah, the papers got it wrong. That was his brother, his twin brother. And that other guy, that chauffeur, kept hanging around the garage so I couldn't get out. I had to, I had to burn him, too. You know what I, you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm making sense. Now get out of here. I, I'm, I'm getting steamed. Don't let it worry you. I got a nice, cool place all picked out for you. After I turned Hack over to the cops, I did what checking I could on my own at that time of night. As nearly as I could learn, Gordon Martini could never have had a brother, twin or otherwise. He was a first child, his mother died in childbirth, and his father died one month later. So I went back to the offices of the Martini Trading Company, glass-keyed my way in, and made a quick frisk of it. There I learned that the signature on the check was indeed Gordon's, but that he had closed out his account at that bank the day he wrote it. I thought about that on the way out to your apartment. I've been calling and calling, trying to reach you. I've been so worried. It's the end. This time, you might be right. Fix me a drink. Well, there's nothing in the house but those prepared martinis Gordon used to drink. Is that all right? No, but fix me one anyway. Never mind the ice. It's not morning yet, but I hate myself already. Why don't you just relax and let me get it for you? I'll relax. You get the martinis. What happened? What'd you think of Mary Callahan? Isn't she the end? <laughs> She's cute. You're all cute. All of me? I put ice in anyway. It's nasty without. It's nasty anyway. <laughs> I hope it doesn't make you fall down the way it did poor Gordon. Thanks. What? Well, what's the matter? Too dry? You open this bottle fresh? Why, yes. What's the matter? Where are they? The rest of the bottles. Oh, yeah. More of the same. Is this all your husband ever drank? Yes, gallons of it. It's a special brand. He even took it with him to bars and people's houses. He'd sit and drink them right out of the bottle like a little child. Then he'd be falling down drunk, of course. And that's how we lost so many friends. They dropped us like, like... Like flies. Yeah, it was the end. Who are you phoning? City morgue. Uh, Maxie, Sam Spade. Sammy, what can I do on you? On, uh, Martini, Maxie. Uh, they got around to the autopsy yet? Yeah, they rushed him through. Got the report handy? Right in front of me. Funny thing, Sam. The doc said they should have saved themselves the trouble. He'd have been dead in a week or two without no help. What from? Brain tumor. Malignant, it says here. Any alcohol in him? None from drinking, Sammy. Uh, what about the head wounds? Accidental fall due to periodic fainting spells. Part of his condition. Thanks, Maxie. Well, what is it, Sam? Were the martinis poisoned? No, sweetheart. The martinis were colored water. Why, they couldn't. Well, what made him get so drunk? He didn't. He was sick. But, Sam, who killed him? Killed himself. But he couldn't have. He hired a gunman to do it. He planned his own murder. But that... What? Well, well, why didn't he leave a note or something? He could have ruined us all. Come here, sweetheart. Put your little hat on Uncle Sam's shoulder. Why, Sam... That's, uh, uh, just what he wanted you to do. He wanted to ruin you. He let Mary Callahan fleece him out of his interest in the company. He let Nesbitt juggle the books. He let you go your way with Ernie. 
You let all three of you fix yourselves up with as nice a set of motives for murder as a jury could ask oh, for. Oh, couldn't have. The real joker was the check he used to pay off the man he hired to kill him. It bounced. It also proved he'd planned his own murder. But he still has his revenge. Because the insurance that would have kept the corporation from going broke won't be paid off on account of a self-liquidating cause. Oh, Sam, darling, what's going to become of us all? Well, uh, Callahan and Nesbitt will probably sue each other to death. You might have to go to work and earn a living. Well, I have $500. I might invest it in something. You already have. Here's my bill. But, Sam, you didn't help me. What? This is the end. No, it isn't, sweetheart. This is the beginning. Come here. Period. Uh, end of the end. Well, you ask me. You helped us. Now, F. Well, that just goes to show you. Show what, F? Man's ingratitude to man. Hmm? But what did Mr. Martini have against you? Why, uh, nothing, sweetheart. He, uh, just needed a smart operator like, uh, well, no, Johnny Madero was on vacation. Sam. Hmm? Have you cashed that check Mr. Martini gave you? Well, uh, not yet. Oh, I, uh... Sam, any bartender would know better than to take a check from a man who, who drinks that much? F, you haven't been paying attention. He didn't drink. He didn't. I was able to establish that later on. Well, you haven't been listening. Well, at the time, Sam, for all anybody knew, he was a hopeless drunk. He was, Sam. Oh, you're so wonderful and trusting. But I do wish that you'd understand this. He was a hopeless drunk. For the last time, Effie, he didn't really drink. I'll just type this up, Sam, while you call the bank. I'll do that. <laughs> A final reminder, friends, whether you're going on a long vacation trip or just a weekend to the beach, be sure you've got a bottle and tube of Wild Root Cream Oil tucked away in your suitcase. Do this, and you'll find it's easy and quick to spruce up again after stepping out of the water or off the tennis court. For no matter where or when you use it, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. So at home and away from home, Help yourself to handsome hair with Wild Root Cream Oil. And next time you have a chance, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. I hope it was worth the price of the paper and carbon. You made carbon copies of that? An unimportant report like that? Oh. It bounced? Well, the estate isn't settled yet. Is... Oh, Sam, you're so wonderful and trusting. Effie, I am not wonderful and trusting. I am a hard-boiled private eye. I know. Just a pity there's no money in it. And I'm also two-fisted. Sam. Hmm? Have you ever thought of ceramics? Of what? Ceramics. It takes virtually no capital. All you need is a small furnace and some clay. And if you don't have any talent, you can, you can just make ashtrays. Thanks, I already have one. Oh, flower pots are... You can pot them on a wheel. And you can pot your hat on and wheel on out of here and also take your furnace and clay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you when you're so gay and carefree. I am not gay and carefree. I you am You are a, a hard-boiled private eye. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night and sue me for your back salvy sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spear's absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. 
you'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep on all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Say moi, sweetheart. Oh, Sam, how did it go? Well, it uh, wasn't exactly a ten-in-one outfit. Uh, more of a mud show, dog and pony type, you know, rag front. Sam, what are you talking about? Hmm? And by the way, where were you last night? I uh, missed the last bus in from the cow palace, so I had to do a star pitch. Connie talk after. Oh, if you think I'm going to ask what a star pitch is, you're mistaken. What were you doing at the cow palace? Oh, just bulling around. Oh. Sam? Yes? Um, Sam? Yes? Sam, You ask too many questions. Sweetheart, in the patois of the carnival, I'll be right down to pitch my spiel, spiel my pitch, and make with the canvas on the bluebeard caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, Join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Say, Mom, if the summer winds are making Junior's hair drier and mussier than it should be, why not borrow a little of Dad's Wild Root Cream Oil and restore that sweet, angelic look? You'll find Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic comes in handy for every member of the family. It grooms the hair so neatly and naturally relieves that summer dryness, and removes loose dandruff, too. Better check on your supply right now. If it's running low, then tonight or tomorrow, first thing, get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Ready, Effie? Yes, Sam. By the way, what is a star pitch? Hmm? Oh, your clothes. You look as if you'd slept on the ground. <clears throat> That's what it is. Uh, date, August 8, 1948, to Detective Lieutenant Dundee, homicide detail, San Francisco Police. From Samuel Spade, license number 127596. Subject, the uh, Bluebeard Caper. I uh, will not offer as an extenuating circumstance the fact that business is bad all over. But it is true that I had been sitting in my office for four hours and the phone had not rung once. This one didn't phone. From the looks of him, he didn't have the required nickel. But the hangover he was wearing under his eyes had cost someone a pretty penny, so I figured his credit might be good somewhere. Uh, Mr. Spade? Yeah? Oh, my head. Here, try this. Oh. You want it mixed? Oh, uh, no, no, no soda. I couldn't stand the noise. Where'd you wake up? In these same clothes. Figures. Uh, it, it all started at my sister's engagement party. Uh, mint juleps. Mm. They must have been full of flukum. Flukum. Uh, you don't happen to have an ice bag. It's customary for my clients to bring their own. Oh. Well, now here's a spiel. Uh, did I tell you my name? The name you gave my secretary was Ned Towers. You want to stick with that? Uh, yeah, Ned. Uh, Ned Towers, yeah. Uh, it, it's about my sister. She's... Um, her name? Uh, Sylvia. Sylvia Towers. Uh, Sylvia Towers, yeah. Uh, but it's not about her, really. It, it's about that bluebird. I, I mean, bluebird she's marrying. Uh, Jefferson Davis Calhoun. What about him? Oh, that, that marriage has got to be stopped. I found out that his name's not Calhoun at all, th that he's been married three times under three different names, and that all his wives died mysteriously, and, and that he collected their insurance, and now he's talked my sister into insuring herself for 100,000 bucks in his favor. When did you learn all this? In a barber shop yesterday. Oh. I, I went in to get a manicure, and I picked up this old detective magazine. Here's his picture. Uh, look at it. <laughs> I had heard of the case. In his heyday, the papers had called him the Mint Julep Romeo. 
and any name he happened to be using at the time had Colonel in front of it. None of his three wives had survived the honeymoon. Wife number one, an aviatrix, bailed out at 10,000 feet over Mount Hood along with her husband. His parachute opened, hers didn't. They found the body the following spring. Wife number two, a snake dancer, died of snake bite when she squared off with a full fang diamond back instead of her usual non-poisonous partner. The cause of death was never officially proven because the body was embalmed by mistake, it said there, before the coroner arrived. And finally, number three, a professional stunt woman disappeared over Niagara Falls in a beer keg instead of her specially designed barrel and was never seen again. Well, Mr. Spain? Yeah, but are you uh, sure your sister's fiancé, this uh, Calhoun, is the same guy? Well, here's a picture of them together. Their engagement photograph. What do you think? Hmm. Brunette? My sister? Redhead. Uh, that's him on our left. Redhead? Well, uh, Mr. Towers, are we going to sit idly by and see another poor girl go to her death? How much money you got? About a hundred dollars. I'll take fifty now. You are going to help. How much does she already know? I tried to tell her. She's beautiful. She wouldn't even listen. I thought she might listen to you. I pray she will, Ned. I pray she will. There were two aspects of the case that I wanted to look over more closely. A, Sylvia's red hair, and B, the red splotches on my client's face. I had a hunch she might be suffering from more than a hangover. So I dropped him at the address of a medical friend of mine who specializes in poisons. He said the tests would take most of the afternoon, so I decided to find out who was Sylvia, what was she, was she as kind as she was fair. Such a face as Yes? Yes? I beg your pardon? Miss Towers? Yes, I'm Sylvia Towers. Are you the florist? You're expecting maybe a detective? Come in. Thanks, I will. Well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't expecting a florist or anyone else. But I'm glad to see you. I really am. Huh? Sit down here. I was just relaxing. Oh, no, over here. Oh. Well, why not? There. Isn't this more cozy? Yeah. Take your hat off. Oh. You'll have me believing you really are a detective. What do I look like? Well, I'll have to mull it over. Now, don't tell me. Let me dream. Look, Sylvia, uh, Miss uh, Powers, I mean. Oh, uh, Sylvia, I like the way you dress. Nice and casual. Oh, you do? But, you know, you really should wear a handkerchief. Hey, hey. <laughs> you ticklish. Well, look, if you want to frisk me, get it over with. It's your apartment. you got a right to. Well, isn't this way nice? Isn't sure, it? it's fine. It's just that, uh, well, you know, I just didn't expect. I uh, just didn't expect. Well, what do you want, a butterfly act? No, it's just that my feelings have hurt you. Haven't asked me who I am or what I'm doing here or anything. Oh, I don't care. I like you. Is this how you got engaged to Calhoun? No, he was selling some phony stock certificates, so I bought a few. They were phony, so you bought a few. Figured. He'd had bad luck with marriage. It was the only way I could force the issue. You're forcing him into marrying you? Darling, don't be so critical. I did it very nicely. I'm sure you did, but Why? Oh, I don't know. He's so, so courtly. A real southern gentleman. How real? Uh, hand me that cushion, darling. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, no, here, behind my head. Oh. Uh-huh. Oh, that's better. Oh, don't go away. Why do you want to be number four on the Bluebeard Parade? Oh, do you really think he did kill them? Oh, that's one of two theories. He either did or he didn't. Oh, I love your hair. <clears throat> so nice, bristly. Does this bother you? Yeah, but don't stop. Uh, now, uh, wait a minute. Look, I've uh, I got my client to think about, and I'm, I'm trying to think about it. Darling. I didn't want to take this assignment, but he really seemed to be worried about you. Oh, now, who on earth would be worried about me? I'm a little worried about you myself, and I'm not even distantly related to you. Well, don't say that yet. This marriage may not last long. Don't you say that. Oh, I know his marital life has been full of tragedy. But I'm not superstitious. I think I may change his luck. Okay, Sylvia, okay, it's your life. I told your brother I'd talk to you, and I have. My brother? Yeah, Ned. I think maybe your boyfriend tried to poison him last night. 
Oh, no. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, Jeff, you're just in time. Well, my dear, we will discuss this further in private. I have only this to say at the present time. In the South, it is not customary for a lady to receive a gentleman alone just prior to her marriage to another gentleman. But, Jeff... I know your motives were pure and innocent. Customs differ, that's all. I am Colonel Calhoun at your service, sir. I'll uh, call you when I need you. I'm afraid I must ask you to remain. Sylvia? Oh, Jeff, I meant to tell you. It was just a flirtation. Yeah, that's I didn't all. think it... You mean well, she didn't think. he made certain proposals? Well, what well, did I do? What could she do? He said there were things in your past, Jeff. Yeah, that's what I said. Things that... Oh, well, there, there, my dear. It was blackmail. That's all it was. I did it for you, Jeff. Go to your she chambers, you. Sylvia. I will deal with this adventurer. If this were the South, there would be better ways. But never fear. Where there's a Calhoun there, too, you will find Southern chivalry. Please. No, Jeff. Phone the police. Sylvia, I must insist that you do as I say. Very well, Jeff. You know best. Yeah. Well, sir, how about you and me putting our heads together over little old mint julep, huh? Thanks, <laughs> I'm not thirsty. Uh, what's the pitch, Colonel? How come your girlfriend yelled, hey, Rube, just now? What is your asking price, sir? What's your bid? Uh, 5000 now, 5000 after she's buried, 20000 after the insurance people pays off. No dice. Caper's worth a hundred grand. Fifty for me, fifty for you. That is out of the question, sir. Okay, from here I go to the cop. Uh, now, son, let's not be hasty about this. It will require a slight change of plan, but uh, I reckon I can swing it. All right, fifty-fifty. When are you going to knock her off? You want her to fly the coop? Is there another way out of here? Well, not that I know of, but uh, she's crafty. She's crafty. Well, come on, let's get it over. Yes, you're right. Maybe now or never. That's right. Sylvia? Hey, wait a minute. Huh? Come here. What is it? How are you going to do it? Well, hit her with this and then out the window. Let me see, then. Gee, that's got quite a heft to it. Where'd you get this sap? Souvenir of Niagara Falls. Know where you're going to get it? Why, you Yankee! The souvenir of Niagara Falls was deadlier than I thought. The blow spun him around like a top, and he went down on the other side of the room, taking the bar and the mint julep ingredients along with him. I headed for the room Sylvia disappeared into. But she had already disappeared out of it. I looked in the closets, the bathroom, under the bed, tapped the walls for secret panels, and then forced myself to look out the only possible exit, the open window. Ten stories sheer drop to the street. Two stories sheer unclimbable masonry to the roof. Now, get this, Dundee. No other exit, no horizontal ledges, drain pipes, niches, cornices, not even a helicopter landing. I asked myself, who is Sylvia? What is she? The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead, socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for trading children's hair. <laughs> Now, back to the Bluebeard Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. There was no use wasting any time trying to figure out how Sylvia had done whatever she had done to escape from that escape-proof room. There was nothing of interest in it but a diving helmet, deep-sea type, and the current issue of Billboard, a magazine which records the movements of show people. Under uh, carnivals and tent shows, an item was circled. 
Colonel Carlisle's Carl <laughs> Colossal Carnival and Tent Show, which was currently playing San Francisco out by the Cow Palace. That reminded me of the Colonel in the next room. I went in to hit him again, but somehow his not being there didn't surprise me a bit. What I found on the roof did surprise me a little. It was a rope and grappling hook, human fly type, which fitted with the circusy aspect the caper was beginning to take on. But I'd never have taken Sylvia for a stunt woman. I uh, did a neat, uh, deep knee bend to get into condition for what lay ahead, slid down the banister to the top floor, somersaulted into an elevator, and rode it down to the lobby, no hands. Pausing only to acknowledge the applause of the scrub woman, I skated on over to the phone booth. Sylvia's hands like the night. Yeah, uh, Dr. Mandel's office. Bernie, Sam Spade. Oh, say, I I'm glad you called, Sam. That uh, patient you brought in here, uh, Ned Towers? Yeah, what about him? Well, your hunch was right. There was enough poison in him to kill him twice. Uh -huh. And that ain't all. He dead? Mm, no. Then what's all? Well, his stomach had enough foreign objects in it to keep all the newspapers in town in Monday morning feature stories for the rest of the year. What type foreign objects? Oh, uh, glassware, spoons, hunting knives. Well, nothing valuable. Where'd you send him? Oh, he, he wasn't a hospital case, Sam. Enough poison to kill him twice, glassware, spoons, hunting knives, and not a hospital case, huh? The poison, he's uh, developed an immunity. The other stuff, uh, it's harmless. Harmless, huh? Do you want me to send you the complete report? Uh, no, no, forget it, Bernie. You've given me enough. Thanks. From then on, Dundee, it was uh, mostly entertainment. I uh, headed for the carnival grounds outside the town, and uh, Colonel Carlyle's Carlossal Carnival and tent show unfolded before my very eyes just west of the Cow Palace. Congratulations are brought to you in the interest of artistic endeavor. Mademoiselle Mahala, the favorite dancing girl of the Sultan of Zanzibar, brought direct from the perfume gardens of the Mystic Orient. Every muscle of a gorgeous body shakes. And now, now, ladies and gentlemen, in the interest of science and the furtherance of national defense, one of the medical miracles of the 20th century. A ladies and gentlemen, a man with the iron stomach and the asbestos esophagus, Professor Elator. Professor, if you please, sir, give the folks a sample of your control over the fiery element. I will light the torch and hand the to the professor. And now, Professor, if you will kindly... The coach dancer left me cold, but the uh, fire-eating professor looked hot. It was none other than my client, the man who called himself Ned Towers. I moved as close to the platform as I could without setting fire to myself and caught his eye. When he caught mine, it singed my eyelashes. Hey, scramble, I got my act to do. I can't talk to nobody. Where's the colonel? Hey, there ain't any colonel, just for the banner tack. Where's your sister? I ain't got no sister. Then who is Sylvia? Hey, do me a favor, Shamus. Keep the 50 and forget the whole pitch. Now be it, huh? Oh, I want to see the show. Okay, you paid for your duck. Stare your eyes out if you want to. Okay, but just start squawking. They're drifting away. And, and, ladies and gentlemen, that was only a sample. Only a sample. Why, he eats the stone and throws the beach away. And he uses powdered poison on his soft boy legs. Now tell me, if you will, is there a doctor in the crowd? I uh, drifted on down the midway. There was uh, Buna Buna, Nature Boy, Gilda and Hilda, the Siamese twins. There was Shorty, the fat man, and Fatty, the short man, a bearded lady and several natural freaks of nature. At the very end, there was a big canvas enclosure. The act was called the Three Death-Defying Darlings. From the noise inside, I judged that to be an understatement. <laughs> I bought a ticket and got inside just in time to see a trim, energetic blonde in tailored coveralls crawl out of the twisted wreckage of the car. She'd just driven point blank into a concrete wall at an advertised speed of 80 miles an hour. She took a bow, tripped lightly out of the ring, and a brunette about the same size and shape, but wearing a costume consisting mainly of three live rattlesnakes, passed her coming in. I swear she did. I also swear that she danced so well I didn't even notice the snakes after I got used to them. Before the lead snake had taken its final bow and wriggled out of sight, a redhead in green coveralls appeared at the top of a 60-foot tower. She climbed into a barrel and some stupid fool pushed her off. <laughs> 
tank she landed in was no more than three feet across and couldn't have had more than a foot of water in it. But she emerged from the splinters with her face wet and some of the greasy carnival-type makeup washed off. The red-headed branch of the death-defying darlings was, you guessed it, that miraculous escape artist, the one and only Sylvia. I was anxious to meet the rest of the act, so I vaulted over the canvas to their trailer dressing room. There was a sinister buzzing sound at my ankles as I entered. I jumped out of the way just in time to miss getting bitten by one of the brunette's dancing partners, the Diamondback. Sylvia looked at me pityingly, grabbed it expertly just behind the head, and shoved it down into its basket. Damn! You should have known better than to come in here unannounced. Strangers make Salome terribly nervous. Then we're even. How did you know I was here? I didn't. I was looking for my client. Then you are working for Ned. Who else? Well, when I heard you bargaining with Jeff, I didn't know what to think. Before that, I'd been so sure. Look, sweetheart, I haven't been sure of anything in this caper from the start, least of all you. No matter how sure I get, I still won't believe it. Look at me, Sam. Touch me. I'm only flesh and blood. Yeah, well, anyhow, uh... How did you uh, meet yourself coming on with the snakes when you went out in the coveralls? Oh, zippers. I was wearing the snakes underneath all the time. Snakes? Uh, doesn't the auto crash make them nervous? Oh, no. They're used to it. Mother trained them. That was after father... Never mind your family. Let's talk about you. All three of you. Well, after mother and father... Well, the act was a threesome, you see, and they wouldn't keep me on as a single. Yeah. So Jeff Calhoun worked out a routine so only one of me would be on at one time. That figures. How often do you uh, come out of it alive? You mustn't say things like that, even in joking. I'm terribly out of condition. I haven't had a real workout since... Since you went over Niagara Falls on that beer keg? And by the way, how did you manage that? It's simple. Relaxation. Secret of everything. I could teach you that, Sam, darling. Mm -hmm. Jeff could never learn it. How long do you think we'd get away with it, sweetheart? Aren't you taking rather a lot for granted? Maybe not enough. So far as I know, you've only been killed and resurrected three times. Darling, if it frightens you, I promise I'll never do it again. How did you drop 10,000 feet without a parachute? Oh, that Mount Hood stunt? Hmm. I crash-landed the plane, set fire to it. There were witnesses. Something dropped. Oh, nothing but a weighted flight suit. Whose body was that they found? There are always bodies when the snow melts. By the time they get to them, they could be anybody. Oh, that's a relief. Well, what about that other body? Which other one, darling? When you were embalmed after the snake bite. Oh, oh. Well, Jeff just claimed somebody from the morgue that nobody else wanted. Don't be so critical, darling. We didn't hurt anybody. Better not try to tell that to those insurance companies. Well, they should be happy. Jeff says it helps them with their taxes. Does it make you happy? Dying and being dug up every year or so? Well, it's better than doing it every night. But I couldn't go back to Jeff. He lost his nerve after Ned found out. You see, Ned's the only one left who knew me in the old days. If I were dead, he couldn't prove anything. Jeff really meant to kill me this time. What was Ned after? Blackmail? Oh, no. He wanted me back with the show. He hired you to frighten Jeff into letting me go. After all, I am the best threesome in the business. Well, uh, uh, anyway, in the stunt field. Did you see my review on Billboard? I saw for myself. You know something? I was thinking... With all you know about crime... Don't say it. But, darling, it's so easy. And we could have a honeymoon every time I, I came back and we got married again. Thanks for the offer, but if I get married, I want my wife to stay alive every night. But I wouldn't really be dead. Only legally for the insurance. Only legally, Sam. Come here. Sam, darling. Look, uh, <laughs> sweetheart, let's not relax. You're not safe. Not as long as that insurance policy's floating around with Jeff's name on it as beneficiary. He'd never think of looking for me here. Well, the same. You better take that policy into town in the morning and make some changes. Where is it? Oh, it's in my safe. You got a safe here in this trailer? Well, it's just a secret safe. I only call it a safe. But it is safe. Oh, uh, yeah, I thought I'd find you here. But I hardly expected to see Mr. Spade. You don't surprise me a bit, Bluebeard. Hello, Jeff. Sit down and stop waving that revolver. What do you want? That policy. I heard every word you two have been saying. Not that that piece of paper means anything. You won't even be around when the bank's open. But having the original policy in my hand will save a lot of delay, red tape. Of course, Jeff. Where is it? What? Oh, what's the use? It's in the basket, right by the side of your chair. Wait a minute. Don't move, Spade. If you do, I'll bless you. Listen to me. Don't so raise that lid. So this is your safe. Still a child, aren't you, Sylvia? Don't do it, Calhoun. Don't do it. <laughs> And that lieutenant dear took the lid right off of the caper. 
Due to my Boy Scout training, my split-second timing, and the fact that Salome's fang missed an artery by a thirtieth of an inch, I understand uh, Calhoun will live long enough, which, as far as I'm concerned, is any length of time you care to name. About Sylvia, I uh, really don't know how to advise you there, but if you're uh, planning on charging her with attempted homicide, you'll find that there are three Darling sisters listed as U.S. citizens and residents of California. It might be hard to figure out which one of her to indict. Period. Uh, end of Nightmare Alley, Bluebeard Division. Any uh, questions, F? Oh, just one, Sam. A grammatical error, but I'll correct it. And just whom do you think you are to be correcting my grammar? Who, Sam? Nominative case. Nominal. Nominative, Sam. The most frequently used cases in English are nominative, accusative, and possessive. Mm. Now, I'm referring to your sentence which reads, it might be hard to figure out which one of her to indict. Yeah. Of course, you meant them, since they're three darling sisters. Her uh, being singular. Indeed, her was singular, Effie. Oh, Sam, you made a joke. That's yeah, a very small one. Now, uh, type that up and leave my grammar as is. It's colorful. Oh, very well, Sam. I'll just fix the syntax as I go along. Syntax? In California? <laughs> Say, are you looking for a hair tonic that will groom your hair neatly and naturally? Then you're looking for Wild Root Cream Oil. Want a hair tonic that relieves annoying dryness? Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Like a hair tonic that removes loose, ugly dandruff? The answer again is Wild Root Cream Oil, the famous hair tonic that gives you the big advantages men consider most important. Step up to your drug or toilet goods counter first chance you get and ask for Wild Root Cream Oil in the big economy bottle and the handy new tube that's easy to pack when you travel. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. She was only one girl, so I left it to her and made the correction back farther. Back where, Twinkle Toes? The sentence just prior. Hmm? Twinkle Toes. Hmm. You know, where you said three darling sisters, I changed it to one. That's impossible. It takes two to make a sister. That is not funny, Sam. Who's laughing? It's no laughing matter, Sam. After all, that Sylvia, the darling sister, whatever she... And I don't care if she can go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Let's get it right, a beer keg. In fact, the only funny thing is you being taken in. After all, snake charmers of that type are a dime a dozen. Oh, here's 20 cents. Phone up that place. What place? Where you get the red-headed snake charmers, 12 to 10 cents. Dime a dozen, Sam. It's a figment of speech. Mm, you can say that again, sweetheart. Pretending to be three people, all with different hair, and wearing snakes under a coverall. Oh, Effie. No normal girl would do that, Sam. Hmm, I don't know. Women do all kinds of work. Uh, oh, Sam. Why can't I be an adventurous like some girls are? I wouldn't trade you for 30 cents worth of snake charmers. Oh, Sam. That's the nicest thing you ever said to Well, me. next to the nicest. Good night, Sam. Good night, Salome. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Loreen Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep on all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
the adventures of Sam Spade, detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Detective agency. It's only me from over the sea. Oh, Sam, how was it at the beach? Same as always, uh, uh, foggy. Did you go in? Well, I was up to my neck from the first rumble. If you mean, did I go in the water? I did. Was it cold? I didn't notice. I was too busy landing a corpse. Oh, oh Sam, what a coincidence. Hmm? I was just reading my new library book. Yeah. And it's all about a body in the water, pushed over a cliff. Mm-hmm. And there's a strangest girl in it with a, with a strange mother. Biggest. And she drinks, the girl, and runs away with a chauffeur. That rich people. They can't do that. They're stealing my material. Oh, no, Sam, no. It's by Owen Fitzstephen. He's very well thought of. Mother always understands his plot. Not tonight, she won't. Stay where you are, Angel. I'll be right down to dictate my report on the critical author caper. Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. You know as well as I do, fellas, your hair is one of the first things any gal notices. So it's really important to keep your hair spruced up right all the time. The answer? Why, of course. Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. I have a hunch, fellas, she'll help herself to another look if you're using Wild Root. Get Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic in bottles or the handy new tube. It's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. Later in this program, we'll have an important announcement. Listen for it. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. I'm looking over oh. the phone. Oh, Sam. Yeah, come on in. Let's get this over. Oh, can you wait till I finish this chapter? Hmm? It's a page to go. The detective had just found this girl in a sordid rooming house. Mm -hmm. He had this fight with her boyfriend and boinged him. Boinged him? And now butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. But I don't trust her. What's the name of the book? Morgue Fruit. Morgue Fruit. His last was a spindly stiff. Mm -hmm. That was about this neurotic nurse who was in love with her employer. Effie, how long have you been reading this kind of trash? What's not trash, Sam? Oh, he really makes his characters live. Mm. And I love his detective. He's real hard-boiled like in in Dashiell Hammett. Dashiell Hammett? (laughs) Mark your place and come in. All right, sir. (laughs) Oh, dear, dear. Uh, Ready? Yes, Sam. Oh, I can hardly wait. Ah, That's the way I like you, eager. To finish the chapter, I mean. Please. I wonder what she's up to. She's guilty, of course. Of course, but what of? You can read it when I'm finished. Oh, my goodness, we've got a report to get out, and here we are chattering about books. <laughs> date, August? I will give the date. Yes, Sam. Uh, date? Fill it in. To uh, Missing Persons Bureau, San Francisco Police. Attention, Sergeant Schwartz from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, Gabriel Leggett. Dear Dave, I uh, should have handed it over to you at the start, but you know me, I'm greedy. I cashed the check she'd sent me as a retainer without consulting my better judgment. Gave the money to Effie to pay bills without batting an eye. Borrowed a dime car fare from the corner newsboy without collateral. And arrived in front of the Leggett Mansion on Knob Hill without the foggiest notion of what I had been retained for. I'm Gertrude Leggett, Mr. Spade. It's about my stepdaughter, Gabrielle. She's been missing since the funeral. Uh, whose funeral was that, Mrs. Leggett? My husband, Gabrielle's father. That was nearly three weeks ago. She came to me afterwards and said she was going down to Quesada to our country place for a few days. That she wanted to be alone with her grief. But I discovered that she never arrived at Quesada. Do I make myself clear, Mr. Spade? Yeah, except for one thing. Why do you want her back? First, she may do something to disgrace me. She'll undoubtedly try her best to do so. Secondly, unless I get her signature to some papers, in accordance with her father's will, I can't go on living in this house. Furthermore... That's okay. You've convinced me. 
Now, when she left, what did she take with her? Just one piece of light luggage and her liquor case, of course. She drinks, you know. That's well, not my place to disapprove. I merely thought it might help you to know. Well, we could case all the bars in town, but it'd take a lot of time and a lot of money, besides them on the wagon. Well, you might talk to Eric, my chauffeur. He drove her to the station, or says he did. Where do I find him? Let's see. Ten o'clock. He'll be loitering down the hall somewhere in the neighborhood of the linen closet, helping the upstairs maid fold the sheets. Uh, I'd knock first if I were you and avoid embarrassment. Thanks for the tip. Oh, uh, mind if I have a look at your stepdaughter's room? Eric will give you the key. I'm not allowed one. Figures. <laughs> oh, Eric. Oh, oh lady. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, sir. Thank you for your kind assistance, Mr. Collins. It's okay, Myrtle. Anytime. And... <clears throat> yes, sir. You Eric? Collinson. Uh, what can I do for you? I'd uh, like the key to Miss Gabrielle's room. You the law? Why? You expecting some? Uh, the old lady's been threatening the yell cop. She decided to whisper instead. Oh, private dick. You catch on fast, lover boy. Okay, I'll uh, let you in her room. Come on. Mrs. Leggett says you drove Gabrielle to the station. She says that, does she? Isn't that what you told her? Uh, I'm not telling you what I told anyone. Search yourself. After you. Mm -mm. What's eating you? Nothing at all. Just want some privacy. Oh, now, wait a minute. I'm responsible. Go help Myrtle. Give me those keys. Oh, listen. You keep it. Hello. Hey, let me in. Go have your license. Her room was, shall we say, untidy. The mirrored dressing table was chipped around the edges, and Rain's held a skelter across it between two polo pony bookends was a mess of books. Three odd volumes of the Harvard five-foot shelf a horse breeder's gazette, and a bunch of detective novels. I picked one up and opened it to the title page. It was called Morgue Fruit, and it was by Owen Fitzstephen, author of The Corpulent Cadaver, The Spindly Stiff, and The Kiss-Off. It was autographed to the author's great and good friend, the late Edgar Leggett. The signature looked familiar, but it didn't look like a lead. Neither did anything else in the room. I started to unlock the door with the key on the ring I grabbed away from Eric, and the light caught the smooth side of a Christopher medal. It was engraved for Eric Forever Gabby. When uh, Forever Eric went off duty that night, he went across town. The trail ended at a crummy, broken-down rooming house out in the film room. He let himself in with a key and climbed the stairs. I waited until he was out of sight. In uh, more time than it takes to tell, the door cracked open and a nose that could only belong to a landlady raised it out at me. She was uh, gumming a sensen. What do you want? They uh, get settled in all right? They ain't nobody settling in on me. <clears throat> Never touch me. You got me wrong, Mom. I uh, meant the newlyweds. Did they uh, raise the rent money all right? Oh, them. Raise it and spend it. She's a Dick Smither. Dick Smither. Socks it up all day and throws a dead soldier out the window. <laughs> and they call it a honeymoon. Who are you? Uh, I'm her uh, ex-husband, darling. I uh, came to pay her the back alimony I owe. Well, give it to me. I'll see she gets... Oh, no, you don't. No, no, don't you come pushing in here. Quiet. It's after hours. <laughs> don't allow callers in here after 10 o'clock. House rule. Shut up. Well, I don't... What's their room number? Now, give it to me or I'll shake it out of you, <laughs> darling. 212. 212. And if it weren't for these new uppers, I'd let you try it. Oh, is that what those are? Uh, thank you, Grand Duchess Marie. Smart Alec. No wonder you can't hang on to a woman. You're so right. You drove her to drink. I did not. Alimony's so good for you, young whippersnapper. Who is it? Western Union. All right, let me... Hey, I told you to stay away. Now beat it. Uh, look, Eric, I don't want any trouble, but I'm coming in. Over my dead body. Eric? Get back in the room, Gabby. Now, look, I, I won't let you hurt her, so... Now, so look, help... Collinson, don't, no, don't no, make no, me don't, do it. I don't wise. want to. Okay, I'm sorry. Eric, Eric. What have you done to me? Nothing a bucket of cold water can't cure. Sit down, I want to talk to you. Who are you? Sam Spade. I'm a private detective. Your stepmother hired me to find you. Oh? You know why she wants to find me? Do you? She wants to kill me. She killed my father, now she'll kill me. Can you prove that? My father never had a day's illness in his life. She could drink three quarts of brandy in any evening. 
Do you believe a man like that could die of heart failure? Frankly, I could. Now she's starting the same kind of talk about me. She wants to railroad me to the insane asylum. Do I seem crazy to you? No. A little nervous, maybe. This idea you have about your father's death. Talk some more, will you? All right. I'll tell you the whole thing. But I gotta have a drink first. Hey, I can't get the top off. Give me a hand, will you? Sure. Uh, you need a corkscrew for this one. Yeah, I think there's one down there in the cupboard. I don't see one. Back in the corner. A little farther. There. No, there's nothing. Hey! I dreamed I was a character in a detective story. The title of the story was Morgue Fruit, and the author, a man named Fitz Stephen, was trying to figure out a way to turn me into a red herring before knocking off his number one suspect. I tried to tell him it's against the rules to make a detective a red herring, but he said it was a new kind of murder yarn, and it didn't matter anyway because there wasn't even a victim. That's what he thought. Makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Now, here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. And here's the announcement we promised you. Now you can get Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, in a generous new 25-cent size on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. Now, back to the critical author caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. When I uh, came to, it had came the dawn, and I was still a character in a detective story, and I felt more like a red herring than I had in my dream. I had dragged myself across my own trail and wound up no place. My quarry had fled, leaving nothing behind but empty bottles with fingerprints on them. I lifted the few and hustled over to the Bureau of Identification. Half an hour later, I got the report. They were mine, all mine. I wondered what a detective novelist would make of that. I decided to find out. I had met Owen Fitzstevens several years back in uh, Seattle when I was digging dirt on a chain of fake mediums. He was plowing the same field for literary material, and we pooled forces. I got more out of the combination than he did since he knew the spook racket inside out. I cleaned up my job in a couple of weeks and we parted friends. His San Francisco apartment was on the sixth floor of the St. Mark. He was standing at its door holding out a lean hand to greet me when I got there. Well, you're looking fit, Sam. Little red in the face. That's the red herring I ate last night. How's the uh, literary grip go? Uh, You haven't been reading me? No, where'd you get that funny idea? Oh, there was something in your tone, as in the voice of one who has bought an author for a couple of dollars. (laughs) I suppose you're still hounding the unfortunate evildoer. Yeah, that's how I happened to look you up. Uh, You autographed a book for Edgar Leggett. Oh, yes, yes. Morg fruit. Distressingly prophetic. Uh, What do you know about that family? Oh, what have they been up to now? How well you know the girl, uh, Gabrielle? Well, quite well, since she's a duplicate of her father. She has brains, but there's something black in her. Something she doesn't want to think about but can't forget. She's a neurotic who keeps her body sensitive and ready. I don't know what for. While she drugs her mind with drink and lunatic notions. Uh Yet she's cold and she's sane. 
I had something I wanted to forget, I'd anesthetize my mind directly, leave my body stay strong and ready. I uh, hope you don't think any of this stuff means anything to me. Oh, yes. I remember you now. You were always like that. Tell me what's up while I try to find one-syllable words for you. You uh, know the fellow that drives for him? Uh, Eric? Mm-hmm. Well, he was released from Folsom in Leggett's custody when he was 18 years old. Murdered his father. Nice kid. What about him? Uh, Mrs. Leggett hired me to find Gabrielle. I found her with Eric in a rooming house out in the Fillmore. She begged me to save her from her stepmother's murderous schemes, and then she knocked me cold. Mm, well, that's trivial. Dull. I've been thinking of the Leggett family in terms of Dumas, and you bring me a piece of Jim Crackery out of O'Henry. <laughs> if I were writing this, Gabrielle would kill her stepmother, or dupe Eric into doing it for her. Or no, that won't do. Not sufficient motive. Murder has to have a motive, you know. Why? She's uh, insane, isn't she? I wonder. Are you saying that carelessly, or do you really think she's off? Well, hmm? I don't know. She's uh, got a kind of a wild look about her. Her eyes shift from green to brown and back without ever settling on one color. Uh, how much have you turned up on her in your uh, snooping around, Owen? Are you who make your living snooping, sneering at my curiosity about people... And my attempts to satisfy him? No, we're mm. different, Owen. I do mine with the object of putting people in jail, and I get paid for it, though not as much as I should. Mm. But I do mine with the object of putting people in books, and I get paid for it, though not as much as I should. Yeah, but what good does that do? Well, what good does putting them in jail do? Well, it relieves congestion. You put enough people in jail, and cities wouldn't have any traffic yeah. problems, in this part. Hmm? Well, then all you have to do is to wait till one of them kills the other and put the survivor in jail. It's simple. Yeah, but who's going to kill who? Perhaps they both have plans, both Gabrielle and her stepmother. Looks as if you'd have to guard both of them. I think I'll settle for my client. As far as Gabrielle's concerned, her husband ought to be able to watch out for her. I, her what? Husband. She and Eric got married. Oh. <laughs> well, now there you are. You didn't tell me anything about that. Lord knows how much else there is you haven't told me. Uh, pardon me. Don't go away. Telegram, sign here. Oh, thank you. There you are. Thank you, sir. Now, I wonder what... Uh, good Lord, this is positively corny. Listen to this, Fade. I appeal to you as a friend of my dead husband. Come immediately, Sunset Hotel, Quesada. Trouble, danger. Do not communicate. Gabriel must not know. Signed, Gertrude Leggett. Spade. Yeah? Did you have this wire sent to me as a prank? I was just going to ask you if you sent it to yourself as a prank. Hmm. I have it. Hmm? The key to the whole thing. It's a red herring. <laughs> I didn't think that Stephen would be able to hold out very long against his professional curiosity, and I didn't imagine he thought I would. I caught the next bus for Quesada. Quesada is a one-hotel town pasted on the rocky side of a young mountain that slopes into the Pacific Ocean some 80 miles from San Francisco. I got there at 11-something that night, stepped down from the bus and crossed the street to the Sunset Hotel. All right, all right, keep your shirt on. Uh, Mrs. Leggett registered here? What's your name? Owen Fitzstephen. Oh, she left a message for you, said uh, for you to wait right here and don't leave till she gets back. Yeah, she say where she was going? Oh, it's probably over visiting with her daughter and new son-in-law, new over to the cove. How do you get there? Well, you'll never be able to find it at night uh, unless you, you went all the way around by the East Road. Yeah, Not yeah. then, I'm sure, unless you knew the country. Well, how do you it's get good. there in the daytime? Well, uh, you go down this street, you take the fork on the ocean side uh, and follow that up along the cliff. It's easily enough found in the daytime, but you you never 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 in the world you, you yeah be able okay to find okay right. heard you, you the first time. So I waited until morning. Stupid me! I found the road out to the point that had never really been a road. The side of the ledge became steeper and steeper until the path was simply a narrow shelf on the face of the cliff. The cliff that sheared off 150 feet or more to ravel out into the ocean. A breeze from the general direction of China was pushing fog over the top of the cliff, making a noisy lather of seawater at the bottom. Rounding a corner where the cliff was steepest, I chucked my cigarette over the edge and watched it spin downwards. And that's when I saw it. I had to go waist deep into the Pacific to lift the body. 
I got my hands under the armpits, found solid ground for my fate, and dragged it up beyond the high tide mark. It was Gertrude Leggett. Somebody came staggering down the beach to meet us. She dead? Yeah, Gabrielle, she's dead. Oh, oh the witch is dead. <laughs> hey, take me back to town, will you? Buy me a drink, huh? Sit down there. Sit down. <laughs> What's the big idea? Don't you know I'm sick? Somehow I don't think you're that sick. I think you could make some sense. Sense? That's a laugh. You don't know me. I've never been able to think clearly the way other people do. No matter what I try to think about, there's a fog that tries to get between me and it. You understand how horrible I can become going through life like Nuts. that? Nobody thinks clearly, no matter what they pretend. Thinking's a dizzy business. A matter of catching as many of those foggy glimpses as you can and fitting them together the best you can. The trouble with you is you've been enjoying your misery. You've been so busy trying to prove that you're nuts, it's a wonder you haven't really driven yourself nuts. How do you know I haven't? Because you're too anxious to admit it. All right, I'm sane if you want it that way. I'm just evil. There's something black inside me. What was that again? Something black. Everybody knows that about my family. My father, too. Who told you that? I always knew it. They say my real mother killed herself. But I know better. I know how to open the drawer where she keeps the gun. Every day, Gertrude lies on Mother's bed. And we play killing the witch. Yeah. And she comes in in the night and bends over my crib. And she's changed herself. So she looks like Mother instead of the witch. But I know better. And I hold up the gun with both hands. It's very hard to pull with both hands. It's very hard to pull the trigger. But I must do it or the witch will eat me up. And then there's a big noise. And red all over. And I can't get out. I can't get out. Listen to me. You were beginning to make some sense. Now, don't run away from it. Gertrude was lying on your mother's bed. That's your stepmother? Yeah. She, she was my nurse. She married father. Not so I... fast. How old were you when your mother died? Four. Four and a half. Did your father know about the game with the gun? No, I don't think so. Did anybody? Gertrude said I must never tell anyone. Because they'd send me away. And I never did. Not till I grew up. I was with Owen Fitzstephen. Yeah. I had a lot to drink. I told him. After that, he began seeing Gertrude. And finally, my father died. But it didn't do her any good. Because Owen really loved me. Now, watch it. Now, let's get this straight. You'll have to straighten it out again later on with a doctor to help you. This is to help me. When you were a little child, Gertrude taught you that killing the, that killing the witch game to use you as a murder weapon against your mother... Then she filled you full of ideas of guilt and fear so you'd keep quiet about it. When you told the story to Owen, he blackmailed your stepmother into knocking off your father. That made you feel responsible for his death, too, so you ran away. Now Gertrude's dead. I killed her, too. You might, but I doubt it. Now, uh, try and remember. Was Owen up here tonight? I thought I heard his voice. But I hear voices sometimes. I'm hearing it again. Listen, do you hear anything? I didn't hear anything but the wind and the beat of the surf at first. But when I did hear the voice, I sent Gabby for a doctor before I investigated. He was pretty badly mangled in the rocks. He'd fallen nearly as far as he'd pushed Gertrude, but was still alive. I made him as comfortable as I could, and finally he opened his eyes. Hello, Sam. You messed yourself up good. Yeah. No more rocks for me. Not unless you make Alcatraz. You know, I had half an idea when you came to see me in San Francisco that you were secretly nursing some exceptional, idiotic theory. Thanks, Owen, but I never had any theory. The whole thing dropped into my lap. Now, don't be too sure of that. Understand at present, I admit nothing. 
Later on, if I'm forced to, the very number of my crimes will be to my advantage. On the theory that nobody but a lunatic could have committed so many. Oh, well, there's not so many, only Gertrude, your co-author of the murder of the late Edgar Leggett. Oh, nonsense. Crimes and crimes dating from the cradle. Even literature shall help me. Not your own books. Why not? Didn't the critics agree that the spindly stiff bore all the marks of authorial degeneracy? Evidence, son, to save my sweet neck. And I shall wave my mangled body at them. A ruin whose crimes and high heaven have surely brought sufficient punishment upon it. Yeah, you'll probably make a go of it. Legally, you're entitled to beat the jump if ever anybody was. You... Illegally? You mean insane? Tell me the truth, Sam. Am I? I think that's what they'll say. But that spoils everything. It's no fun if I'm really cracked. No fun at all. Gary, it had a report. Just goes to show, doesn't it? Oh, well, there you go again, Effie. I mean, if anything like that happened in real life, you wouldn't believe it. You mean if anything like that happened in fiction? Oh, no. The author is never the guilty party. Well, this author was. But that's not fair. The author is never supposed to be guilty You're of... You're right. Any... You're right, Effie. He shouldn't be even a suspect. Maybe a red herring, but... Type that up, Effie. Oh, all right, Sam. Anything else, Sam? Yeah, phone the drugstore and order some red herring. I mean, some aspirin. <laughs> More and more folks are turning to famous Wild Root Cream Oil every day. Wild Root Cream Oil gives you all you ever dreamed of in a hair tonic. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally the way you like it, the way other people like it. What's more, Wild Root Cream Oil relieves dryness and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So join the millions with handsome hair. Tonight, or first thing tomorrow, ask at your drug or toilet goods counter for Wild Root Cream Oil. Also, ask your barber for a professional application. If you've never tried it before, get the generous new 25-cent bottle just introduced. It's Wild Root Cream Oil's Get Acquainted size, and once you've made the acquaintance of Wild Root Cream Oil, you'll find you've made a lifelong friend. Come on in, Twinkle Toes. Well, here it is, Sam. And I like it even better than morgue fruit. You did. I mean, it's not so realistic. <laughs> I like a romantic-type story myself. You Lots do. Of, of atmosphere and psychology and those. Oh, you've got to have those. You really should be a writer, Sam. <laughs> you think so? Of course, detective stories don't pay much. Oh, that's true. But if you write enough of them, <laughs> and look at all the material you've got. No good. Never do for fiction. But, Sam, there's already that radio series, The Adventures of You-Know-Who, Sunday Nights. That's what I mean. I don't make a penny out of it. Well, it's your own fault. Sam, I don't want to seem critical, but... If you played your cards right, you could have owned a piece of that show. What? And follow Blondie? Go home, Effie. I think I will, Sam. Just curl up with a good book. All right. I wonder who killed who. Well, when you find out, don't let me know. Oh, you know you can't wait. No, I can't. <laughs> good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Duff. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dow. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin, with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right on. Away. 
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. The non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. That is the correct answer. You have just won $104 million, six deep freeze units, a stable of polo ponies with matching saddle soap, a terry cloth robe with chocolate bars pre-melted into the pockets, and a full-size, real, honest-to-goodness dreadnought, such as is used by Uncle Sam's Navy. Oh, I'm sorry you'll have to call back. I'm expecting to be taking dictation from my employer very shortly. Oh, I am sorry. Your time is up. And Edna St. Vincent Markowitz, who sent in the question, gets bumped off in front of the studio audience gathered in the Dredgewood Room here in Columbia Square. Next night, don't answer your phone, stupid. Oh, Sam. Let's have no coaching, please. Oh, well, did you find the cop? Was it murder? Was it really worth, um... Well, you know, priceless and like that, and was it fun? Yes, 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 and no. And finally, are you kidding? Well, then why was it called a vapio cop? It's a very old Greek expression, which is what I'll be wearing as I sit in your lap dictating my report on the vapio cup caper. <laughs> Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talents to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Remember the Romeo of yesteryear? Hair parted in the middle, all plastered down? Man, what a difference today. Today, all a guy has to do to impress a gal is use Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. If you're still using old-fashioned hair tonics, or none at all, then for her sake, spruce up today with Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. In bottles or the handy new tube, it's again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in the adventures of Sam Spade. Date, uh, August 22nd, 1948, to uh, Jethro Chiswick, Esquire. Oh, spelling, Sam. Uh, E-S-Q-U... No, Sam, I meant the name. This, um, Chisro Jethwick. I did not say Chisro Jethwick. I said Jethro Chithwick. I mean, Chithro... Uh, look, we'll check it later. Oh, Sam, it might... I have an uncle in Berkeley named Smithwick. Leave your family out of this, Eph. But he's only by marriage, Sam. It's quite a common name. Name three people named Chiswick. No, Smithwick, Sam. Now, let's see, there's Uncle George and Aunt Amelia by a previous marriage. Then there's my cousin Rupert on the Christie side. When you have finished ruminating amongst the foliage of your family tree, Miss Perrine. Well, I only mentioned it in connection right, with that name we'll that you thought you... all over again. Tear out that page. Yes, Your Highness? No, no, please. No need to curtsy. Uh, to uh, Jethro Chiswick. No comment, please. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. <clears throat> What's that? Nothing, Sam, nothing. Wrote. Subject, the Vafio Cupcaper. Dear Commodore, that's the way I like you. Meek. I had always considered myself fairly well-versed in the subject of cups, but if anybody had told me there was such a thing as a Vafio Cup, they could have knocked me over with one, which they did. Mr. Spade? Yeah? I'm Chester A. Brody. I talked with your secretary on the phone. Do you follow? Oh, uh, yes, Mr. Brody. Sit down. Rest your package. Thank you. I prefer to hold it for the time being. My card, sir. Theophilus and Brody, importers and exporters, mm-hmm. Mr. Theophilus is my partner, Dimitri Theophilus. You follow? I follow. It was Mr. Theophilus who brought the Vafio Cup into the firm. I furnished the cash capital. Vafio Cup, I do not follow. 
Yes, indeed. The only one of these treasures to fall into private hands. One of the fabulous Fafio cups. Those exquisite and cunningly wrought examples of the art of the ancient Grecian goldsmith. Excavated by the great Schliemann from a beehive tomb in Sparta. Hmm, beehive. Mycenaean age. Just west of the Lion Gate. Oh, the Lion Gate. Uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Brody. Are you trying to tell me that this cup is very valuable? Priceless. And that you have finally managed to find a buyer? Do you follow? And that you want me to deliver that package containing your priceless cup in return with your customer's cash? Accurately put. I presume you're bonded. Uncork me and see for yourself. <laughs> you are a droll fellow, to be sure. I had a light breakfast, drolls and coffee. Now, uh, what is this uh, Vafio cup? I will show it to you. You are about to see a treasure but few eyes have looked upon in our time, Mr. Spade. The Vafio cup. Handle it carefully. It's fragile. You could crush it in your hand like so much tinfoil. Yet this golden relic of a golden age has come down through the centuries miraculously unscathed. Note the delicately wrought lines of the bas-relief, the exquisite draperies on the figure of the caryatid, the anguish on the face of the fallen hunter, the sheer brute force of the wild boar charging to the kill. Holding this golden cup in your hands, you encompass 3,000 years. Do you comprehend why there's no question of insurance here? Frankly, I don't. My dear man, an item such as this is worth only as much as a collector will pay for it. This particular collector has offered $200,000. It might never be offered again. You follow? I follow. Very well. Here's your fee, $100. I follow. And here is the address of my client in Los Angeles, Commodore Jethro Chiswick. Oh, now, wait a minute. You will take the noon train. Any questions? Yeah, why can't I go on a plane? Because I've placed an item in this afternoon's papers to the effect that the treasure is to be transported by plane. If I were a Garniff and I read that item, I'd uh, take the train. That would be your first thought. Then you would think they're saying they're taking the plane to make me think they're taking the train. Therefore, you would take the plane after all. Oh, would you? If you were really clever, you might say they're taking the plane to make one think it's the train, so I'll take the plane after all, and therefore... Never can... mind. By this time, he's decided on the bus. The train is perfectly safe. You follow? The package was light in the drawing room and the train was comfortable. Seemed like an easy way to earn a hundred bucks. I knew it wouldn't last. Never does. I was prepared for the knock on the door and I got ready for the inevitable small dark man who plays the Peter Lorre part, but this one fooled me. He was a tall, thin actor with sandy hair. Okay, Shamus, hand over the package. You won't be no trouble. Sure, there it is on the seat. Take it. Huh? It's okay. You got me covered. I won't make any move. Hey, what are you trying to pull? It's a stick-up, isn't it? Hey, maybe I got the wrong apart. No, that's it. The cup's in there. Unwrap it and see for yourself. Oh, no, you don't. I ain't picking up no booby traps. Oh, you're yellow, huh? <laughs> I know that one, too. Now, don't cut no ice with me. Suit yourself. Game of gin? Hey, you're nuts. I'm getting out of here. Hey, wait a minute, pal. I'll buy you a drink. I don't drink. Lunch? In a go. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Spade, I agree. Clarence is a very comical fellow. So are you. I took the liberty of stepping into your forecastle whilst you had your bit of railway in the after companion way with my mate, dear Clarence. You mind? Uh, not at all. Well, sir, I'm afraid you're going to mind a great deal. Oh! And that's how I met you, Commodore. I was so busy sizing up the 45 in your right hand that I didn't even notice when you left whipped out of your coat pocket with one of the largest saps I have ever felt. The next time I saw light, you were gone, the Vafio Cup was gone, and the train was pulling into San Jose. I got off, rode back to San Francisco with a truckload of chickens, and headed straight for my client's apartment. got here quick. Yeah. Come in. Thanks. <clears throat> well? Well, what? Look, uh, we can't both play this dead pen. We'll stay no place. It's in the back room. What is? The body. You're from the police, aren't you? I'm a private dick. How dare you? Hey, what was that for? For spying on me. You and all the other cheap gumshoes my husband hires. You're a Mrs. Brody? I'm Enid Theophilus. Didn't to meet... Did my husband hire you? My name is Sam Spade. I was hired by one Chester A. Brody, your husband's business partner. 
Well, Sam, I hope he paid you in advance, because he's the body. Chester A. Brody was just barely identifiable. Somebody had worked hard trying to persuade him to say or do something he either couldn't or wouldn't do. The only interesting clue was in the wastebasket. At first, I thought it was a flattened beer can. But it was the Vafio cup, or a facsimile thereof. Well, how do you like it, Sam? I don't. He was my client. I wasn't hired to protect him. I didn't like him, but he was my client. How would you like me for a client? I'll give you the name of a lawyer, sister. My name is Enid. Enid? Now, let's see what I can squeeze out of you before the cops do. Brody was your husband's business partner, and you're, uh... You don't have to be subtle. He was mad about me. I'm... I'm all broken up about his death. So is he. That wasn't funny. That time I deserved it. You don't like me, do you? Can't you get it through that steel-jacketed brain of yours that you're in bad trouble, that there's a dead man in the next room beaten to death and you're not supposed to be here? Oh, I was supposed to be here. We were going to elope as soon as you brought back the money from that uh, Greek thing. Yeah, what about that Greek thing? It was an antique. It was called the Vafio Cup. Yes, I know about that. Yes, well, my husband dug it up in Greece and smuggled it into the country. Yeah? It was all he had, but it was such an important piece that he was able to persuade Chet, um, the late Chester Brody, that is, to let him in as a full partner. Then what? Well, they quarreled. My husband made some bad investments, and Chet wanted to sell the cup to save the firm. Dimitri refused. I didn't think it was fair, so I got the keys to his safety deposit box where the cup was, and Chet arranged to sell it to the Commodore. Did, uh, did you get the money from the Commodore? All I got from the Commodore was lumps. He stole the cup? Roger. You've got to get it back. I've got it. Where? Here, take a look. <gasps> it's ruined. Where did you find it? In a trash basket where it belongs. Dimitri did it. He must have suspected something and substituted a fake. That's it. He knows where the real one is. Somebody thought that your boyfriend knew. The one that killed him? That's the way it looks. And maybe that's the way it was meant to look. You know, somebody might get the idea that you palmed the genuine when you got it out of that safety deposit box. If I did, it was legal, and don't you forget it. A wife can't steal from her husband. Legally, they're one person you can't steal from yourself. That's the law. I was wrong. You don't need a lawyer. Will you help me? I may hurt you, and it'll cost you anyway. I know what's good for me. Money. Find that cup. I know what's good for me, too. So I uh, took her hundred bucks, advised her to go home, and made for my own humble lodging. They were not only humble, they were crowded. The man was small, but the gun was enormous. I said, uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. Here's important news on good grooming. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. Remember, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil contains lanolin. It grooms the hair naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose, ugly dandruff. So if you want your hair to be more attractive than ever before, Get the generous new 25-cent size of Wild Root Cream Oil, America's leading hair tonic, on sale at all drug and toilet goods counters. It's also available in larger economy bottles and the handy new tube. Get Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, and mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs> And now, back to the Vafio Cup Caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. He didn't answer me, so I said it again. 
Uh, don't bother to introduce yourself. Your name is Dimitri Theopolis, and you want this package that I'm carrying. Of that be a sword. You obtained this from my dear wife. And how did you find my darling? Not at the city pond, surprisingly enough. Oh, you know my dear wife. How soon you know my darling so well, more than I, her husband. <laughs> is it possible? I don't know, is it? I don't know either. I employ a detective. Not this one. I have need. My poor partner, Mr. Brody. You are interested. If you are interesting about who killed your partner, that's one thing. But if you want somebody to dig out your family secrets, that is nothing. With me, you are, shall we say, no place. But why don't I got the right to know? There'll be no trouble, no scandal, no divorcement suing. Of that be assured. Even poor Chester is dead, so he's what one calls ancient history. While he lived, I knew nothing. I was blind. After he died, I see certain things. Yeah, well, uh, do you see that maybe your wife had a hand in Brody's death? What then? Well, if it so happens that you cannot separate my darling from that, uh, do you follow? Not quite. Ah. I'm not an old man. Oh, but my that. dear wife is but two and twenty, and a truly lovely person. Oh, she's all right. Uh, would it not be the part of husbandly wisdom to have, uh, shall I say, uh, a hold over her? If she's guilty, you won't need it. Good. <laughs> Please, I cannot hold the gun and handle my wallet at the same time. Please. Uh, no, thanks. You keep the gun, I'll take the wallet. Oh, you trust me. You will work for me. Yeah, I'll work for anybody. <laughs> Here, I... Uh, Left your cab. Back. Oh, assuredly, you are so very kind. Oh, I'm not so Now kind. the package, yes? No. The, then I don't hesitate to suit you. Now, wait a minute. Yes? This is the fake. You sure you want this? Assuredly, yes. A man has already been killed for it. Your life's a high price to pay for a fake, though fancy, tin cup. You still think that's the price? Brother, I know it. Then you know I will kill you for it. Okay, if it means that much to you, and I guess it does, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, please remain where you are. If you follow me, I will surely suit you. From my front window, I watched them come out downstairs and start across the street. Then it happened. I saw the gun flash as it fired, and Theophilus slumped to the pavement. The package slid away from him into the gutter. I beat it down to him. He'd taken all three pellets in the midsection from close range. His pulse fluttered once or twice and then stopped. When I went to look for the package, it wasn't there. I called homicide and waited until they took him away. When I told Lieutenant Dundee what I had in mind, he congratulated me on my brilliant scheme and told me to go ahead with it. That was his mistake. I even talked him out of assigning any of these harness men to watch my building for the next couple of hours. That was my mistake. I went upstairs, opened the bottle, and waited for your knock on my door, Commodore. Hello, sir. A man would almost think you expected us. Keep a better eye on him, Clarence. Don't let him get to lured. Aye, aye, sir. Welcome aboard. No time for scuttlebutt, Mr. Spade. We are bound for Bulilong Bali on the Macarthur Maru, sailing at dawn. I want that cup. The true, the genuine, the Baffio cup. No more deceptions, no more trickery. You will hand it over without further delay. Sure. Be glad to. Oh, no, not like that. You will tell Clarence where it is stowed, and Clarence will fetch it above decks. Why, you old barnacle. Theophilus never had his mitts on a genuine Vafio cup. Bilge water, sir. When Theophilus landed in San Francisco, he didn't have a farthing. Now he owes half a million dollars. If he hadn't got the genuine cup, how could he have borrowed all that money? Because a bunch of morons like you believed he had it. Blast my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believed what you're saying. Look, uh, Commodore, you're interested in high finance. Now, how did Ivor Kruger make his millions? Why, matches. He was the match king, sir. Uh, matches had nothing to do with it, Commodore. He uh, started out with 15 million bucks worth of phony government bonds that he printed himself. Follow? They weren't even good counterfeits, but he was smart enough not to try and cash them. He just kept them in a safety deposit box and borrowed money. Theophilus uh, used his phony Vafio cup the same way. Blast my binnacles, man. You sound as though you believe what you're saying. That has a familiar ring to it. I do. And I'll tell you why. 
He knew that that was the fake in the package when he held me up for it. He was willing to risk his own life to get it out of circulation. Dash my timbers. Old Theophilus has left us without a shot in the locker. He steered us onto the shoals. We're on our beam ends. Hey, turn him off, Commodore. You're pumping bilge flush. We better haul our wind. Yes, indeed. I'm afraid it's getting rather warm in San Francisco. Bull along, Beckhams. You won't make it past the potato patch. What? The cops are going to want some answers about a couple of stiffs you left behind in San Francisco. I'm glad you reminded me. Shall I plug him? No, no. We are taking him with us. Oh, uh, that's what you think. Uh, take it easy, uh, mate. Uh, this uh, ain't going to hurt a bit. Uh, yeah. A reek of chloroform filled the room and a fist pounded into my belly. It knocked my wind out, and at the same time, my nose collided with something wet and cold. I swung out but didn't connect. Before I could swing again, the room blurred and the ceiling light floated down to meet me. Then the lights went out altogether. At first, I couldn't figure it. It uh, sounded like what a doctor hears through a stethoscope or maybe an earthquake or maybe ship engines, which it turned out to be. When the lights came on again, I was lying on a bunk in a stateroom. I staggered across to the wash basin and splashed water in my face. Hello, you. Oh, Enid, as I hardly live and breathe. It could get worse. Yeah, where are we? Oh, not very far out. Not past the Farallon. Uh, good, I'm a stowaway and they'll put me off with the pilot. Oh, no, you're not. Your passage is paid. Mine? It is, huh? It is. Do you know who you are? Who am I? Chester Brody. Then I'm dead. They'll bury me at sea. Roger. Who are you? I'm your widow. What's the score, widow? Chester and I booked passage on this ship a week ago. It was part of the plan. Chester and the Commodore worked it all out. Yeah, the cup was to have been stolen from me on the train. Yes, but when the Commodore discovered it was a fake, everything fell to pieces. Yeah, he thought Chester was double-crossing him. Hmm? They forced Chet to talk. He told them Dimitri still had the genuine Vafio cup and had hired you for the double-cross. Maybe he really believed it. Anyway, they killed Dimitri. Yeah. Well, there's nothing on them yet. But uh, you're a material witness, sweetheart, to at least one of the killings. That's extraditable. When that dawns on them, they'll uh, scuttle you, too. It's already dawned on them. I'm, I'm desperate. Yes, I notice. For you, you're practically hysterical. We have to face facts. Yeah, well, give me a couple to face right now. Where are the Commodore and Clarence? Up on the bridge. Good. All you have to do is walk straight up to the captain. He'll put him under arrest. Well, that might be a good idea, darling. Only... Only what? Only the Commodore is the captain. That tore it. Your uh, salty talk had fooled me, Commodore. I never dreamed that you were really an old sea dog, and I do mean dog. But two can play at that game. From my own intimate knowledge of Sea Story magazines, I realized that all hands would be turned to in the cargo gear, and the crew quarters would be therefore empty. In more time than it takes to tell, Enid and I had fitted ourselves out in dungarees, jumpers, and watch caps and turned to with them. You two, look alive. Stow that preventer. Oh, me? You uh, may recall, Commodore, you may recall me as the man who ran for a fire extinguisher when the bosun yelled, Stow the preventer. But experience is the best teacher, and by the time we hove to to put the pilot over the side, things were in such a state of confusion that you had retreated to your cabin with a quadruple ration of grog. Seizing that moment, I threw Enid over the side, yelled, Man overboard! And jumped in after him. Once safely aboard the pilot schooner, we revealed our true identity, and a merry laugh was enjoyed by all. It uh, dropped us at the foot of Margaret, and we waved warm farewells to our erstwhile rescuers, then to the snug haven of my office in a friendly cup, if you'll pardon the expression, in the grateful warmth of a gas radiator. Hmm. Unhealthy. <sighs> Who, me? Gas fumes. Mm. Why don't you move into a building with steam heat? I, I like this building. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been here for a long time. You don't make much money, do you? You don't have to rub it in. It's a living. <laughs> you happy? Mm, sure I am, I guess. Well, I guess it's all right, then. <clears throat> you know, sweetheart, uh, yeah. there's uh, 
something missing in you. Oh, what? Well, I don't know. Well, then how do you know? Forget it. Well, I guess I'll go. Do you, uh, do you mind if I don't see you to the door? Why should I? What? <laughs> hey, you are human. Yeah, they're wet. Go ahead, sweetheart. Try all you want. It's been tough. You shouldn't have kept it bottled up this long. No, it, it, it's not what you think. Well, what is it? It's you. You're so nice. I'm nice? Yeah, but you're no place. You never will be. And neither will I. <laughs> And that Commodore is the cargo. It was nice seeing you again down at the hall. They uh, tell me you and Clarence are both trying to turn state's evidence. But according to the late bulletins, Clarence was leading by a neck in the stretch. Get it? The DA was afraid the jury might not understand your salty talk. Period. End of sea chanty. Oh, Sam. Yes, what, what, what? Oh, Sam. Hmm? Well, I just can't. I, well, why I can't, can't you? Are, are you feeling okay, F? Oh, Sam. Hmm? You betrayed your trust. You. Effie, speak oh. to me. What is it? What is it? I betrayed my trust. What? What? Well, those criminals were on that boat. Yes. And you. You jumped overboard. You feel that I was recalcitrant? Is that it? That my actions were not true blue, clear cut? Is that it? Oh, I'll just go type this up, and I'm sure you can explain. I hope you can. I hope. Sour racket. <laughs> Question, what's the easiest and best way there is to give your hair that well-groomed look? Answer, Wild Root Cream Oil. Yes, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil with soothing lanolin gives you the advantages considered most important in a hair tonic. It grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, removes loose, ugly dandruff. Call at your drug or toilet goods counter tonight or first thing tomorrow for Wild Root Cream Oil. If you've never tried it before, get the generous new 25-cent bottle just introduced. Also, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Oh, here it is, Sam. I hope the spelling is all right. I was so upset. You hate me, then? Oh, no. No. I suppose it's foolish going along thinking that your ideal doesn't have feet of clay. Oh, Sam, I, I, I just can't. I just can't imagine. Don't you think? Don't you think I can explain that? Oh, yes, I'm sure you can explain. But you did. You deserted your post and jumped overboard like a sinking rat. That's right. Oh, but Sam, that's so unlike you. It was just by chance they were apprehended. By chance, you say? Who do you think it was that got himself shot out of a torpedo tube in that submarine? You, Sam? No, you think I'm crazy? <laughs> I did something few radio detectives ever do, sweetheart. I called the Harbor Patrol single-handed using only one nickel and had them picked up. Oh, Sam, I wish I'd been there. Well, it was just a small phone booth. Besides, if you'd been there, it would have been out of order or something. Oh, Sam, you came through after all. Aren't you ashamed that you ever doubted me? Yes, I am. I'm a fool. There, there, there. I forgive you. Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> The Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd. Musical direction is by Lud Gluskin with score composed by Rene Garrigan. Join us again next Sunday when author Dashiell Hammett and producer William Spear join forces for another adventure with Sam Spade. Brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with soothing lanolin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil.
cream oil. Charlie, start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie, keeping all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get wild root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.